who is actually not with us here in presence because she caught COVID, I think, if I'm not mistaken, but she is there. Very good. Is very much in charge of this. Uh, all the best for your health. Uh, and great that you can make it nevertheless. And now I have uh, spent enough time uh, already for the, to take it away from the first speaker. The first speaker is Mariana Baccio. If I, Mariana, the floor is yours. The rules are the same as yesterday. 25 minutes for the presenter, 15 minutes for each discussant, 15 minutes for general discussion, including uh, the responses by the authors. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, while we wait for the slides, uh, well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to present our work, uh, which was co-authored by me and my colleague uh, Ginevra Marandola, who currently works at the Ministry of Economics and Finance in Italy. While this work was uh, prepared at the Joint Research Center at the European Commission, where we have a competence center on behavioral insights. So this is a behavioral take uh, into pay transparency. And, uh, well... We're still waiting for the slides to come up. So I also say that the opinions on these presentations are those of the authors and not those of the European Commission. So we are done with all the introductory remarks. Okay, and it's up, okay. So, well, let me tell you why we did this work. Uh, in early March, uh, the Eurostat has published the most recent statistics about the gender pay gap in Europe. And as you can see, we have quite a nice rift there, uh, which on average in the EU27, there is a gender pay gap of still 13%, but we have countries such as Luxembourg at uh, 0 0.7 and Latvia at 22.3%. As you might be aware, in the past 40 years, there was a convergence and a reduction on the gender pay gap. But what we have seen is that the unexplained gap portion of the gender pay gap has increased relative to the explained gap, right? So there is still uh, a persistence in the gender pay gap, and policymakers have to um, you know, try and address this gender pay gap persistence. The European Commission has tried to do so uh, coming up in early 2020. One, uh, with a directive proposal. The directive proposal had two aims mainly. First of all is to introduce transparency pay system with information on uh, differences in pay gender for same work or for work of equal value. This principle is a funding principle which is included in the treaty of the functioning of the European Union. So it's really important for the European Commission to bring forward as well this kind of initiatives. And the other part of this directive was to introduce better access to justice victims of pay discrimination. What's the rationale behind it? Well, it's simply about uh, eliminating uh, asymmetric information that favors pay discrimination. The assumption is that full information leads to less discrimination, so it acts upstream at the company level, uh, but it also acts downstream at the employee's level, raising awareness and giving them an opportunity to fill that gap in information that is currently um, happening. Well, we also know that uh, pay transparency, besides having these positive effects of reducing and elim eliminating asymmetric information, has also uh, some drawbacks. And the empirical evidence that we have in the literature is quite clear about the impact on effort levels, on labor supply, job satisfaction, and peer relations. So, look, uh, we have said at the very beginning that our approach is a behavioral approach. So we wanted to understand better uh, what are the effects of pay transparency from a behavioral stance, because they deserve further attention. We know that pay transparency can act on a number of behavioral mechanisms, and we wanted to know more about it. Of course, there is a lot in the literature of the literature behavioral and experimental, experimental as well on relative wages, and we can expect some effects from what has been done in the past. We know, for example, that workers receiving a lower uh, wage compared to their peers reduce their effort levels, they supply less time, and they quit more often as well. 
However, there is a mixed evidence for those who receive high wages. So this mixed evidence means that there are positive effects and negative effects in terms of effort, for example. And last but not least, we also know there are uh, strong and uh, ingrained gender differences in reaction. So we know that women are less likely to retaliate. Um, and also this very much depends on who they have to retaliate against. Um, so there is this aspect as well that we should consider, but not only, there is another important factor that relates to self-evaluation. Self-evaluation, we know that women use less often to describe themselves adjectives such as proficient and effective, but we also know that they evaluate themselves less favorably than men of equal performance. So as you can see, there is a lot going on from a behavioral perspective when we talk about pay transparency. So knowing where we come from, from a policy perspective and uh, the vision that the European Commission had, knowing how asymmetric information should work in this context, and also knowing how many behavioral mechanisms are at play here. We wanted to go into uh, trying to understand it better with what we call a working definition of pay transparency. This working definition of pay transparency tried to keep the very basic elements of uh, the directive of pay transparency as the European Commission wanted to uh, include it. And this um, working definition for us had basically two elements. First of all, disclosing average wages by gender for same work, which is that principle that we've seen earlier in the slides, but also something about managerial role distribution by gender. So these two elements are both an horizontal comparison and a vertical comparison kind of mechanisms. This allows us to measure two things. First of all, the overall effect in the company when introducing pay transparency, but also the individual effect of introducing pay transparency that depends very much on relative wage and position. So are you lower than the average? Are you higher than the average or are you average? And when we talk about effect, what we wanted to measure were the effects on performance, so how well a person does in their job the extra effort they provide in their job, so given that they reach a minimum, are they willing to do more, go in the extra mile, give more to the productivity of the firm, but also uh, formal requests for compensations. And these are the ways that people are allowed to respond to unfair pay. In a nutshell, pay transparency we've seen that has not any significant effect on average productivity. We've also seen that it decreases employees' willingness to provide extra effort. It also does not affect the number of requests for compensation, so it does not affect the number of actions uh, towards fixing unfair pay. But we've also seen something very interesting, that men and women show larger reaction to own gender comparison, so women comparing themselves to women and men comparing themselves to men rather than across genders. And when it comes to managerial positions, uh, we see that males strongly react to women's majority's presence. Okay, this is just in a nutshell what we found. And I'm gonna walk you through what we did and how we did it. First of all, our methodology, it's that of an incentivized, so performance-based online experiment. Why did we do an experiment and not, uh, well, anything else? For two reasons. Well, first of, us, uh, first of all, for us it was very important to pin down these behavioral mechanisms that were at play rather than quantifying outcomes. So we wanted to understand what was happening with these mechanisms of behavioral uh, into the pay transparency. And then the other thing was that this was one of the many exercises that were done in a larger Exante impact assessment uh, dedicated to uh, this proposal for directive on pay transparency. So ours is just a piece of the puzzles, of the puzzle, and we wanted to understand the mechanisms behind it rather than quantifying really the outcomes. Why did we do it online? Uh, well, first of all, we did it uh, in the winter of uh, 2020, 2021, so there was not much room to do uh, you know, anything on the lab or a randomized control trial because of the COVID. And then uh, we could reach large numbers and uh, reach also different countries. 
We are also very aware that uh, um, online experiments have drawbacks in terms of quality, but we put in place a number of quality assurance checks uh, that uh, guarantee the quality of our observations. Okay, now I'll take you step by step into uh, the design of our experiment. So little by little, I'm gonna explain what we did. First of all, there was uh, two experiments that we did, one on employers and one on employees. The company was made by one employer and 18 employees. In this paper, we focus on the uh, results of employees, but just so that you know, there was an employer. The employees work for their employer, and they had to um, you know, work in order to receive uh, a wage in exchange. Employees in uh, the experiment, first of all, undertook a screening test, which was meant to measure their performance potential. In the second step, they received information on their role and wages plus some information on the roles and wages in their company, and this is where transparency came into play. After receiving this information, they decided whether to ask or not for compensation based on the principle of equal pay for work of equal value. After deciding whether or not to request for compensation, they performed their main task, their job. And while they were performing the main task, they had to decide whether or not to provide extra effort uh, to ensure more revenues for their employer. But let me take you a step further into our design. Um, in the screening test, people were classified into groups. Into group A, if they performed over a certain threshold, and so this was a signal of high performance potential in their main task. Or in group B, if they were lower potentials, okay? Now, the employer was given this information together with the gender of employees and they could decide whether or not to use this information to allocate their employees into two roles, role of clerk or role of manager. The same information was also used to allocate wages, and as you can see, for the clerks, there was either a low wage or a high wage. Then both uh, clerks and managers had to reach a minimum threshold, and then they could decide to work more, and when they worked more, there was a return for the employer. Okay. There was no returns for the employees when they work more than the minimum necessary to receive their wage. And the last element, as you can see there in the bottom line, is that uh, only clerks had the right to request for compensation. And this was granted under specific circumstances that proved unfair treatment. And this kind of action was, uh, had an uncertain outcome and was a risky action. Let me take you a step further into the design so you try and understand better what we did. The information available to employees in the control treatments and our baseline treatment uh, was, as we see in this slide, first of all, very important. Employees did not receive any feedback on their performance in the screening test. So they did not know how well they performed or not. Okay? If, uh, you know, they could make their uh, own assumption of, on how well they did. Then employees know, knew their role as clerk or manager, and the employees knew their wage, but didn't know if their wage was low or high. And employees also knew that the employers had a budget constraint and could assign high wages only to one third of employees. Employees also knew that the employer was informed about their performance in the screening test and about their gender. So they knew this information was available to the employer and that the employer could use it or not to make his own decisions about allocation of wages and roles. Uh, we had a control treatment, which we call the pay secrecy treatment, uh, where you know, employees knew exactly what I explained to you now, but they had information on their own wage, on their own role, and the number of men and women uh, that were in the company, so something that everybody can uh, uh, more or less know in real life uh, without pay transparency. And then we had a treatment on pay transparency where there were exact information and setup as we've seen in the control treatment, but they also knew the average wage in the company, the average wage for women in the company, the average wage for men in the company, and also the number of men and women in each role in the company. So they had uh, a full disclosure of what was happening in terms of role, average wages, and gender distribution. 
Now, as I've told you earlier on, there was an experiment also for the employer, and the employer decided this distribution of roles and wages. Therefore, the employer was the one deciding about uh, how the gender pay gap would look in our experiment. And this table just shows you under pay transparency what participants saw. 19% of the participants did not see any gender wage gap. 34 saw uh, a gap in favor of men and 47 saw a gap in favor of women. As you can see, this, not, this does not reflect very much what we can see in reality, but still, we could use it to understand the mechanisms behind introducing pay transparency. Okay, the request for compensation uh, had uh, three elements to it. The first element was there was uh, risk aversion in, uh, uh, embedded into this kind of mechanism because people did not know, uh, you know, that the outcome of the request for compensation was uncertain and it depended very much on the information that was not fully available to employees because it depended on their own performance and as I told you before, this was not uh, given any feedback about this. Uh, they also needed to know the colleague's performance and uh, the colleague wages. This was an information that was not present in pay secrecy, but pay transparency introduced. Uh, then it required self-evaluation. Uh, the outcome of the compensation request depended on their own performance, for which they did not have feedback. And then lastly, it was costly because for the employer, uh, this action when uh, grounded and founded and agreed upon was uh, it meant a loss of income, but also it meant a loss of win income, a wage loss for employees when they brought forward a request for compensation that was not granted. Um, here, just the sample selection and characteristics quickly. We had uh, three countries, Germany, Spain, and Poland, uh, where we the, did this experiment. Uh, we chose these three countries because in, in Germany there is already some form of pay transparency. It was only recently introduced in Spain and there is none in Poland. So we had uh, the whole range of uh, possible options in terms of pay transparency currently undertaken. And we had uh, 614 observations uh, in the pay secrecy and just over 1,200 in pay transparency. Our research hypotheses are basically three, and uh, they are not directional. There is a difference. Uh, what we imagined was that there would be a difference in pay transparency compared to pay secrecy on three elements, on the average performance of employees, in the extra effort exerted by employees, and also in the number of applications for request of compensation and the share of granted requests. Why didn't we make any uh, sort of directional hypothesis? Well, because in uh, all three uh, effects, there could be both a positive and a negative direction, and uh, which one would prevail was not clear, also because the previous um, literature was not uh, uh, you know, agreeing on, on which direction it was going, but also because this very much depends on the work environment, for example, trust. So differences in uh, pay could be, um, you know, accepted if there is a high trust in the company, but also worker characteristics, self-esteem, risk aversion, and fairness views, but also because it very much depends on the distribution of wages within the company. Uh, we had three outcome variables. The first one the per was the performance in the main task, which is the number of correct strings correctly classified uh, in 10 minutes. And you can see that clerks, uh, on average, classified 131 strings, managers 156. We also had uh, included in our paper an alternative measure, which is a binary measure of, for passing that threshold that was the minimum required to receive the wage. Then we had a dummy variable for stop when employees stopped exactly at the threshold. So uh, continuing after the threshold was, uh, was for us a way to reciprocate to employees and other intrinsic motivations such as proving themselves or uh, making a point about uh, their, their role or wage assigned. And then last, we had the request for compensation here again, which is a dummy variable for the employee who asks or not for compensation. Now, let me bring you to the results. The first results that I want to share with you are at company level. 
This is our main regression, which shows the effect of uh, transparency and gender on our main outcome variables. We had other main regress regressors other than female and transparency, which were the role, the screening task, uh, risk attitudes, social demographics. And as you can see in the top quadrant, when we introduce transparency with the blue dot there at the very top, you can see that there is no effect on the main task score. Okay. And uh, here was a continuous variable that could uh, take values from 0 to 234, which was the maximum that they could work. And uh, there is, it's not significantly different than 0. The other, uh, there was also no effect on uh, the compensation, which is uh, the green dot. And however, what we found was that there was a positive and significant effect on the likely likelihood to stop which is the red dot there in the top quadrant, which means that introducing pay transparency lowers intrinsic motivation. When we introduce pay transparency, people are more likely to stop at the threshold. Okay. The other interesting result that I want to show you here at the company level, uh, it's about the gender effect. First of all, we can see in the bottom part of the quadrant that there is no significant difference between men and women in terms of uh, uh, the main task score. And this difference was also not present in the preliminary uh, task that we did. However, uh, women are more likely than men to stop the red dot in the bottom quadrant, and they are less likely to ask for compensation. Okay. How did we interpret this result? Well, we think that uh, women stop more often and ask less often for a request of uh, compensation because stopping is less risky for them, is less harmful for the employer and for the employee, and it is also less eloquent kind of action because it does not require any assumption on your own uh, you know, performance. The other interesting result that uh, I want to show you is at, at the individual level, because as I told you before, there is either a higher than average kind of situation, so your wage is higher than average, or it's lower than average. So this has an impact as well on how pay transparency works and the mechanisms behind it. And here you can see uh, that uh, there are two results that I want to share with you. The first one is in the, highlighted in the blue box there, and uh, it shows that transparency makes the allocation of the request for compensation more efficient. As you can see, when there is a greater than average wage, so your wage is greater than an average under pay transparency, the requests for compens the likelihood of the request for compensation decreases, while it increases when you, your own wage is smaller than the average in the company. Overall, as we said at the beginning, there was no, there was no changes in the overall number of requests, but we can see that uh, pay transparency improves the efficiency of this. Uh, request for compensation. The other very important result that uh, we've uh, seen is that employees significantly react to the same gender differences, but not to opposite gender differences. And this is highlighted in the red square down there. You can see that the stopping behavior and the compensation request uh, behavior increases when you see your wage being smaller than the average wage by gender, why there are no significant differences when it's across genders. Why did uh, we think this is happening? Well, maybe uh, women and men compare themselves to women and men in terms of similar performance, so not knowing how they did, uh, you know, it was as a proxy they compare themselves to other women or other men. But also maybe some norms uh, work here because it's more acceptable to uh, see differences in in-group rather than out-group. Last result that I want to share with you, um, it's something that we can say it's uh, sort of an incidental uh, finding for us because we see here what happens with managers. Um, in the uh, red squares, you can see that men managers are negatively impacted by, uh, be, by the share of women that is present in the company. When uh, there are no women, the top block, you can see that they perform better and they stop less often. However, when the share of women increase, so more women, means that men 
take a uh, hit in their performance, so have a lower task uh, score, and they have a higher likelihood to stop. What happens for women? For women, well, it's interesting as well, because women, when women know that there are other women managers, they perform better. So you can see in the top uh, square in blue there that uh, being the only women reduces the task score, while uh, the more women there are, the better the score uh, for women themselves. Let me uh, give you a summing up of our findings. Well, first of all, we know that pay transparency does not have any significant effect on average productivity, which is good. But we see that there is a decrease of productivity for those employees who are at a disadvantage, so they see that they have a lower wage than average. It does, in fact, decrease employees' willingness to provide extra effort okay, for both high-wage and low-wage employees. And a good thing is that it does not affect the overall request for compensation, so it does not increase contentiousness, which is a worry for policymakers, but it makes the allocations of these requests more efficient. So low-wage employees are more likely to ask for compensation under pay transparency, while high-wage employees are less likely to do so. Last but not least, uh, interesting results on the managerial positions. Uh, when males strongly react to uh, being a minority uh, compared to women. What are the policy implications for us? Well, first of all, make sure that you understand that crowding out is possible with pay transparency. Also, pay transparency is not enough to increase trust, and other forms of transparency in the company should be introduced to justify and support those fair wage differences. And uh, pay transparency as well is not alone to encourage women to stand for their rights. Uh, so measures to strengthen self-esteem, balance self-evaluation are needed and need to be put together with pay transparency measures. And it is important also to stress the overall effect of pay transparency uh, that very much depends on what it shows, so depends on the distribution of wages in the company, which is a result that is also quite strong in the literature, and, and we confirm also with this experiment. We are very aware that our study has its own limitations. First of all, that these results should be one minute, introduced uh, qualitative rather than empirical valid. Uh, we know that we not, did not include uh, peer pressure, peer support, emotions, mobbing, or any other kind of repeated interaction. And we also did not account for uh, uh, differences in a judicial system. Last, last, last thing, uh, we think that uh, to make pay transparency work, we should do three steps. First, introduce pay transparency. Second, make more women more aware, so introduce complementary actions. And third, make sure that the actions that are there available for women to fix unfair wages are uh, designed around them and they are not uh, made to incur in big economic uh, losses or reputational costs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great start. And the first discussant of this paper is Sofia Barani. Thank you for the very nice presentation. Um, I really enjoyed reading the paper. It's not in my field at all, but I think uh, for me it was very nice to read something different and maybe, you know, what my my insights or my ideas about the paper are a little bit different than what, what you would get from somebody who works um, in the field. So I'm just waiting for my slides to come up. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, the main uh, question of the paper was whether pay transparency can improve uh, or close uh, the unexplained component of the gender uh, pay gap. And uh, basically this is interesting because there are reasons to believe that it might, which is a direct mechanism that if you, uh, if you provide um, uh, information with pay transparency, whether the pay is fair or not, and you give better access uh, to justice for those who have a, an unfair wage, um, then, um, then uh, 
the, this might rectify the discrimination so people can ask knowing that their wage is not fair and having access to to uh, rectification, they can, they, this can close the gender gap that, that exists. And it might also have a kind of equilibrium outcome effect that knowing that employers knowing that, you know, there is this mechanism in place, they are going to discriminate uh, less to begin with. Uh, against this, uh, on the other side, uh, there are some um, uh, findings that employees might be resentful of when they find out, for example, that they have lower wage than other people in their company. And so they are going to be less productive and more likely to leave the firm. So there will be a higher turnover. Uh, there might be an increased litigation. So maybe more people are going to ask for uh, a compensation uh, if they have, um, if they have uh, access to this. And of course, this has a cost. Uh, this pay transparency has a cost, a bureaucratic cost, at least for the companies. Okay. Um, so what the paper does is they analyze the response of employees to these two joint policies um, in an incentivized online experiment. So I think you explained the experiment very well, uh, but I put it here on my slides anyway. So there is a, there is a screening test to, to, to begin with, and people are put into group A or B based on their performance. They don't, people don't know which group they end up in. And then uh, participants are assigned by other participants who are employer participants in the experiment into uh, managers, which can be at most one sixth of the, of the people that, the, that belong to this employer high paid clerks, which are at most one third of the people, and low paid uh, clerks. Um, so I think this is actually a very important and, and a lot of my discussion is going to be about how these employers behave and what is the, the outcome uh, uh, at the firm or company level. And then the treatment is, uh, is whether what information uh, the, part, the employees receive. Okay, so the baseline is that they only know their own wage and own gender, uh, sorry, own, own wage and own role. They know their own gender, of course. Uh, and they know the number of men and women in the, in the firm. And then in the, there are two other treatments where they find out their own, the, the wage of people in the same, the average wage of people in the same role as they are uh, also by gender, and they know the number of people working in the same role. And they also find out finally uh, in the other role what are the, what are the shares and the average wages. And uh, the, this, un this compensation request is only for clerks because the managers, they always have the same wage, so there is no uh, room for compensation request. Clerks can ask for compensation if they get unequal pay for, uh, for equal work. And what this means exactly is that they get low wage while somebody in the same role in a group that is like theirs or lower uh, gets a high wage, okay? So it's important, an important criteria here is that uh, somebody who is in a in a group the same group so in group A or group B the same group as as the person is in uh, based on the screening test or, or in a lower group uh, gets a higher wage than this person okay and uh, people are paid if they reach a threshold number of strings that they needed to classify and they can stop at this point they are told when they are doing the experiment that they they reach this threshold. Um, but they can also classify more and they don't get any extra pay for that. So this is the extra effort component. Okay, so I have some questions about the experiment. So the first one you, you answered, the average firm size is, is uh, the average and the all firm sizes are 18 uh, people and a firm is equal to an employer. Uh, one thing that I would have really liked to see is the alignment of pre-screening scores and, uh, and the roles. Okay, so I have no information on whether these employer participants were rational, were how did they assign people. Uh, also in general, it would be good to know the distribution of, 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 a, of groups uh, and, and positions also by gender, okay? So it would be good to see whether, you know, people who are in group A tend to be more uh, managers or more high, 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 um, high paid clerks and whether there's any difference in this between men and women, okay? Um, and then you told us that there are these revealed gender gaps. So these are the gender gaps that people who are in the pay transparency treatment see, this 12% no gap, 30%, 34% higher wage for men, 47 uh, higher percent higher wage for women. But it would be also good to know the distribution of this across firms, okay? How, in how many firms do we see, you know, um, um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, this gender gap? And not just the sign, but the magnitude, okay? Are there big differences across men and women or just small? And whether these are explained or unexplained differences, okay? Do all the differences come from because, you know, men, women are more in group A or men are more in group A? I don't know. Uh, so, so that would be important. 
Um, also, the tra pay transparency treatment, I think, is completely different for managers and for clerks, because for managers, the, way is, the, the pay is always the same. So there's no, you don't, managers know this and they don't get any extra information. They always find out that my wage is 400 and everybody else's wage is, the, is 400. So all the information that managers get in the treatment is how many men and me, male and female managers are. Uh, and they find out about the wage distribution a bit, uh, the average wage of the other group. So the, their treatment I think is completely, they, they can't find out that, oh, I'm a manager, but I earn less than the average or more. Uh, so I think that all the managers should always be treated separately, which means that you should always interact, I think, the treatment with being a manager or just do separate uh, regressions for the, 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 the two types of groups. And uh, I have a question about this equal pay for, uh, for uh, no, the, the, the request for compensation. So, so uh, you can request compensation if you get unequal pay for equal work. But the work just depends on whether you're a clerk or not. So you have to reach this, the given threshold. If you're a clerk, whether you're a high or low paid uh, clerk, the threshold is always 120. And you get paid if you reach that threshold, whatever your group. So I don't understand why uh, you can only ask for compensation if somebody is in a lower or, or in the same or lower group than you gets a higher wage, right? So if there are two clerks and they're pre Te their screening test score are completely different. One is group A, the other is group B. And you know the group A guy has, gets a higher wage, uh, but they still do the same work in the end. So their work is equal uh, and, their, uh, and their pay is unequal, whether, whatever their initial screening score is. So I'm not, I think you need that for this, the, for this request to be risky, but I, it, doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't correspond to equal work for, or unequal pay for equal work in my view. Um, okay, so then uh, how did they look at, uh, evaluate the impact of pay transparency? Basically by running regressions of pay transparency, also interacted with male, uh, female and manager on these three outcome task scores, stopping at the threshold and, and submitting compensation requests. This is only for clerks. And then uh, also they, so that was the baseline uh, analysis. And then they looked at um, uh, pay, the impact of pay transparency by relative wage group and gender. Uh, that was the second uh, an analysis, which I think this is only really interesting for clerks because managers are always in the same relative wage group as themselves. And, uh, the, and finally, for managers, they looked at the uh, pay transparency interacted with the share of female managers. Okay, and they controlled for all kinds of things in all of these regressions. So, so what are the results? So the impact of pay transparency uh, without controlling for relative wages uh, was that it had no effect on task scores and on compensation requests. Uh, it increased stopping, but only if not interacted with manager and female. So, um, you know, from this you took away that people are more likely to stop if there's pay transparency, but as I said, I think that because the managers have a completely different treatment, uh, you should interact the manager with the treatment and then it does not increase stopping, so I'm not so sure of this result. Uh, and in any case, I'm a little bit uh, confused with this average performance versus extra effort, which I th understand that in your experiment, it's exactly, it, you can separate it neatly, but in real life, there isn't this, this difference. So, uh, you know, that's also something. And, and also the average score includes st stopping at the threshold, right? So if, if under paid transparency, people are more likely to stop at the threshold, which means that the, the average you know, performance from the threshold and above must be lower. That means that if the average doesn't change, then below that threshold, people must be performing better. So pay transparency seems to like compress maybe the distribution of average ta task scores rather than, you know, maybe that could be the interpretation if we can't so neatly separate these two um, extra effort versus like normal effort. Um, the second, uh, uh, so the second, um, um, analysis was that th they looked at the impact of pay transparency by wage group and, and gender. So, so the baseline uh, was that, okay, yeah, I forgot to put one of them. So, so the baseline was that you don't give any information, right? And then, and then there was that you have exactly the average wage. Uh, and, and then there is the, the option that you get a larger wage than both uh, uh, genders. You get a smaller wage than both genders. And then you get a smaller wage than the same gender, but larger than the opposite and, and, the, and the other one, okay? So these are the, the four interesting treatment uh, cases, I guess. Um, and um, 
And these are the outcomes. So, so if, you, if they look at both genders, women and men separately, and you see that I put a, I put a note here uh, when this coefficient was significant, okay, for the three different uh, groups. And so from this I read that it's really only the compensation request that is very uh, robust. It's, it's, it holds in almost all uh, for, for men, uh, women, and both genders together. The others are kind of, you don't really see the colors on this, um, on this projector, but the others only hold for one, you know, one case and not, not the others. So that's not, not that, um, uh, in, these are not that uh, robust, I think. Uh, what I find very surprising, so, so sorry, just to, to clarify, the compensation request here tells us that people behave kind of rationally, right? So if they know that they have a larger pay than average, that means that they cannot be entitled to compensation, so they don't ask for compensation, okay? And if they have a lower wage than average, uh, then they are, might be entitled to compensation, depending on how their group is relative to the others, uh, but, uh, and, and that's when they ask, okay? The most surprising finding, I think, is that people tend to compare e themselves to the same gender and not to the other one, okay? And here, I would, I, again, I think having some information about what is the distribution would be really good because I don't know how many instances do we have of men and women who have lower wage than uh, the other gender, but higher wage than the same gender. Okay, so if this is very few, it might just be a matter of power uh, that you don't find this rather than this being a, a real result. Um, so you have about two minutes left. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, I will finish, thanks. So um, the final um, uh, test, that the analysis that they do is that they look at the impact of pay transparency on managers. And here I have a few questions. So they find that women's task score is lower and men's is higher with pay transparency. Um, uh, what, what is the interpretation of this? Is this because you have the interaction term? So I would like to know what is the, what is the, the effect of pay transparency without the interaction for the managers. It would be nice to see. Uh, so if you just have pay transparency, uh, what, would be, what would be the effect? And, um, and what they find is that, um, so women's task score is lower and men's task score, men's, male managers' task score is higher with pay transparency. But this, this is mitigated towards, you know, zero if, if the share of female managers is higher, okay? So I think that what you could, what you would, could look at instead um, of having the, female, the share of female managers also for the men is to look at the share of male managers, which is just one minus the share of female, right? And then you would have a very symmetric result, which is that um, uh, it, managers work harder when they're more managers of their gender. Right? So it wouldn't be that men react badly to women, but men you know, are more competitive when they're more men. Maybe they work harder, and women are, work harder when they're more women uh, like that. Um, and here, I would, it would be good to clarify the magnitude. So what is the range of the share of female managers across companies uh, to see how, you know, how much this actually changes? OK, so what are the policy-relevant findings? I think this. First one is that there is no effect on average per performance, potentially some negative effect on extra effort. Uh, I already said that there is no clear distinction, uh, I think, in reality between these two things, so it's a bit, uh, you know, maybe it reduces average performance. And uh, the second, that it seems that employees mainly compa compare themselves to own gender, and um, here- Sorry, I you have to come to an- to Okay, to okay, so, okay, I'm gonna stop. This is just, oh, sorry. I just wanna see, like, going back to the initial question, what you answered, I think, is that uh, there is some evidence that people have lower productivity on the con side. There is no evidence of increased litigation. What it would be great to go back to is to see whether they actually close the gender gap. So uh, pay, firms with pay transparency have a lower gender gap or not in the end, okay, after litigation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we, <laughs> we move on to the next discussant, uh, Claire, Claire Lynn. She is present or not? Yeah, all right, lovely.
can I use this time to, uh, to organize the, the open discussion session later on? So we have about 10 minutes for open discussion. I would ask everybody who wants to raise a question or make a comment to put up this like this. And then we have one, one little and quick round, and then we will complete the discussion. Is that all right? So if you don't, didn't pick up your, it's over there. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this in, uh, really interesting paper. Um, I want to start with a disclaimer that uh, I'm not an experimentalist and um, I also do not work on the literature on gender, but I have also been, but I have actually been reading a lot of legal cases on gender issues. So I try to take advantage of my comparative advantage by actually bringing up some of the legal dimensions of the reality associated with the gender pay gap. So uh, hopefully, um, my discussion is going, uh, yeah, Ian, the previous discussion are going to be very complementary. So um, first, I want to uh, start with an um, overview and praise of um, this very interesting paper, and, uh, which is also very thought-provoking. And um, a, a single proportion of the experiments are very carefully and cleverly designed. So I, uh, it was actually a great pleasure to read this paper in detail. And I'm going to focus my uh, discussion on three dimensions. So first, I'm going to start with the discussion of um, the broad concept of the uh, gender pay gap and the overall econometric measurement of it. And um, in, in the main body of the discussion, I'm, I'm going to spend a lot of time thinking about the linkage between the reality of the gender pay gap overall, not just the uh, uh, information treatment, but gender pay gap overall, and the sort of interpersonal dynamics associated um, in the real world. And um, in that process, I'm also going to uh, talk quite a bit about the players' uh, perceptions and motives, uh, both in the experiments and in the real world as well. So this paper starts uh, talking about uh, the, the time trend in the gender pay gap, the overall gender pay gap, and also uh, they in, throughout the process, uh, throughout the paper, they also talk about the sort of cross-country differences in the, the gender pay gap, and. Um, the GPG uh, that they introduced in the introduction is basically a combination of the portion that is explained by observable characters of the workers and, and also the unexplained uh, GPG uh, that could uh, be potentially attributed to discrimination. So the first question that I want to um, ask in terms of um, how the text actually looks to the reader, it wasn't super clear to me that the cross-country differences that they mentioned and also um, the cross-time variation uh, in the overall G uh, in the G uh, GPG that they mentioned is consistently measured across different countries and also across time. And whether it's precisely about the overall G GPG that, that actually, um, so, uh, it wasn't super clear to me uh, precisely how it is measured and what is the specific scope within which the women and men are compared, given that this concept of GPG, overall GPG, actually includes all the variation in the age, uh, uh, experience level, et cetera. So I think it would be, in terms of writing, I think it would be uh, very helpful if, could, if you could actually um, uh, precisely write down the definition that is used um, and what, whether it has been sufficient consistency across time and, and the uh, in the country as well. And um, I'd like to um, get into the reality of the actual dy uh, interpersonal dynamics and legal dynamics associated with HPD as well. So um, this, uh, the experiment in this study is very carefully and cleanly designed uh, so that the measurement of the productivity is very easy and also transparent as well. And this helps us to isolate the treatment effect of the information provision in a very, very clear manner. At the same time, it has this drawback of uh, sort of abstracting away from a very important dynamics and very important legal issues uh, that are at the center of the GPG very often. So I want to bring up this uh, case of uh, uh, UK Employment Tribunal. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with the UK judicial system, uh, employment Tribunal is part of the UK judicial system that is primarily in charge of all the, most of the employment uh, issues. And there has been a very uh, famous recent case uh, two years ago, with a ruling two years ago, which is between um, a, an anchor at BBC, 
whose name is Samir Ahmed and, and the BBC, the corporation. And the case was like the following. So this woman um, was getting paid about 440 pounds per episode. And there was a male employee who was doing a very similar program who was getting paid 3,000 pounds per episode. So this male employee was getting paid um, for uh, getting paid more than six times uh, the payment that sh uh, she was receiving. And this was, this was a very um, highly publicized gender pay gap, and she was arguing that they were doing very similar kind of program and do, uh, doing comparable work. So this is, a, um, this is a gender discrimination. And the argument made by BBC was that uh, even though they are actually doing very similar work, uh, this is not the case of equal pay because this guy, this man, male employee, is much more high profile figure who is very popular, who has much uh, uh, visible sp standing among the viewers. So even though they do similar types of programs, they are not, uh, they are not workers of equal value. So um, as a result, this actually ended up in court. And um, so the, point, or the, the major point that this case makes is that this notion of equal value work is actually highly, highly elusive in a lot of legal cases. And the contention is uh, primarily around whether we can actually convincingly make the case of equal value work um, between one woman and one man. And, um, the, uh, the, the point of the con contention is very often about the actual measurement of how to actually value um, the work or productivity or the value of the worker. So, um, uh, so in that sense, um, this experiment is abstracting, uh, abstracting away from one of the very um, important central dynamics regarding the GPG. And um, that begs the question of what kind of industry do we actually have in mind in designing this experiment because the kind of industries where the measurement of productivity or performance is very, very super clean is, uh, I would say, typically the kind of um, industries where uh, workers are relatively low skilled. And as we actually move to the high skill uh, uh, occupation, it becomes more, much more subjective in my view. So it begs the question of whether the low skilled uh, occupation are, is the kind of places where GPG is particularly a significant pro uh, problem or it's high skilled occupation where GPG is really salient. And um, there's also um, a very clean design of um, what is necessary work and what is extra work. And this, is, uh, this also helps um, to isolate the um, treatment effect of the information provision in a very clean manner. At the same time, it has this drawback of um, letting us abstract away from a very important dynamics. So um, one of the reasons why people do uh, the sort of uh, quote-unquote extra work very often is not because of their intrinsic motivation, but because organizations very often <laughs> deliberately make uh, the distinction between necessary work and, and extra work very, very vague. And um, um, uh, one of the important motives of the workers of engaging in um, extra work is for maintaining the relationship, um, which has this label of career concerns in economics. So they, even in the case that they do not actually get rewarded immediately in pecuniary terms, very often they get praise um, for their citizenship, engagement, loyalty, and the promotion reviews, which is very, very uh, often the case in the economics promotion review, and even. Uh, in the in the very long term, they can or they can also expect um, other kind of rewards such as job referrals, um, being praised for a, 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 a being a great citizen when they actually try to move to different companies, etc. So um, there is a, a very uh, the second uh, important central dynamics um, affecting extra work and the GPG that is um, that is uh, somewhat missing in this experiment as well. And I also wanted to um, raise questions about this uh, linkage between the uh, rewards for asking for correction. So in this uh, experiment, um, 
it is the case that when they ask for a legitimate correction, uh, they get granted, and, and the uh, co compensation is actually larger than the compensatory damage that they deserved. And in the case they uh, make a request that is not legitimate, then they actually uh, get punished very severely. And my view of the reality is that it actually works very, very differently for women and men in the real world. So very often, Women ask for legitimate correction, and they get uh, they uh, they get denied for the correction. At the same time, they get illegally retaliated against. So that's a very uh, common phenomenon. And in contrast, uh, men uh, ask for very often somewhat questionable raise, and they get it, and they do not get retaliated against. And there's also this um, issue of the gender norms. So we, when women assert their value, very often they get portrayed as a person who is bitchy, aggressive, unlikable. When, uh, while when men assert their value, they are portrayed as people who are smart, confident, and charismatic, et cetera. So um, I think there's a, a quite a bit of gender norm issue associated with, um, in terms of the consequence of asking and which uh, is, is, is a sort of one of the um, differences between this experiment and reality as well. Okay, and there's also a um, sort of a uh, very interesting result that appears in this paper, which is that employees are more sensitive to lower wage with, uh, with respect to own gender rather uh, than the gender pay gap. So, they talk about sensitivity, but it wasn't very clear to me it was whether it is actually driven by sort of information or perception or whether it's actually driven by their sort of um, conditioning, uh, behavioral conditioning regarding the social barrier or political barrier. So uh, it may be the case that they become more surprised by, by, by their wage relative to their own gender, or maybe that they uh, feel relative power, like women feel rather relative powerless uh, when the pay gap uh, is associated with gender. And also, when you ask for correction relative to uh, other members of the same gender, you are not accusing your employer of illegal discrimination. But when you're as actually asking for correction for gender pay gap, you're essentially uh, asking, um, you're actually uh, very often accusing your employer of uh, illegal discrimination, which very often uh, results um, in a retal illegal retaliation from the employer as well. So that's a very important um, interpersonal personal dynamics that is associated with asking uh, yeah. practice. We have well. about one, one to two, two minutes yeah. left. So, um, so this is um, so uh, this is very much an overview of the the primary dynamics, um, interpersonal dynamics associated with GPG, GPG that I've been talking about, and I wanted to bring one legal case that is associated with the uh, uh, interpersonal dynamics that I've been talking about. So there was one very. A uh, high profile legal case in the UK Employment Tribunal with a ruling uh, in this year that resulted in $2 million damage award associated with GPG. And among these $2 million, uh, two million pounds uh, G uh, damage awards, and among them, 400,000 uh, was about the back pay. And uh, in this case, which is between Stace Macon um, versus uh, Pia, the UK branch of the uh, French bank. Um, she asked for um, the correction of the gender pay gap a lot of times because she was uh, getting paid about 120,000 per year, while may, uh, men who are uh, doing very comparable work were getting paid 160,000, and there was also substantial gap in the bonus as well. And whenever, as, whenever she asked her boss for the correction, she was always told, not now, Stacy, uh, in a very demeaning manner. And her boss said it too many times. Her, her male employees, her male peers began to mimic it, uh, always saying, not now, Stacy. And there was also um, a retaliation in terms of, um, in the form of negative appraisal, and her male colleagues also um, uh, placed a witch hat on her desk as well as a sort of retaliation. So. Um, this is a very uh, typical kind of um, uh, dynamics um, that follows when women ask for legitimate correction. So this is um, an important food for thoughts in thinking about the sort of linkage between the experiment so, and so, the reality so, as well. I, I, so, I'm sorry, yeah. you have to come to an end. Yeah, I'm essentially uh, done. So. So uh, that's, um, that's uh, pretty much uh, the core of the linkage between the experiment and the reality. And I'm also, like going forward, I also want to think about the experiment where 
we do not uh, not only give information about the averages, but also give uh, information about the distribution entails. And we can also think about the situation where not only the um, information about uh, wage distribution is opaque, but also the measurement uh, of the productivity is also very opaque as well. Okay, thank you very, very much. We are slightly behind schedule, so we have to shorten the uh, general discussion. Please put up your name like this, ideally, and then I'd <coughs> go one round, and if someone did not, not pick up the system. Please, Amirik. So, yeah, I had a question on the, the countries you mentioned initially. So you had these three countries. Seemed like an interesting validation. So what's the result uh, per country? Yeah. Um, it's a very interesting paper and um, I mean I think the discussions were also great. I mean I think I just wanted to follow up a little bit on this point related to um, the sort of results on comparing oneself to one's own gender and in particular what the policy relevance could be here. I mean it seems like this could be very important to trying to understand potentially the unexplained uh, parts and you know, also to see if there's something we can actually do with that, and so if there's some way we can actually use that. And actually, my second question was uh, was uh, what Emmerich just asked, which is, can you tell us something, because these countries you look at are interesting from the point of view that they have in place um, different policies related to uh, gender trans uh, pay gap, sorry, pay uh, transparency, and so whether you see anything, any differences there. Uh, David Newmark. So, so just from, from the U.S. perspective, I think there's an important dimension that gets missed here. Because what you, makes the U.S. laws so strong is class action lawsuits, right? That is, you can try you can try a claim on behalf of you know for a couple people on behalf of a big class. And what that means is that knowing how many people, not just where you stand relative to somebody else or the average, but how many people stand sort of un, in, in your group are underpaid. Uh, is critical, and it's sort of the first thing a lawyer asks if you go to them and, th and say, I think I'm being underpaid, right? Because the lawyer taking on a single case, you know, small lawyer, small amounts of money, but class actions become your damages multiplied by sort of all the, the women, and it, which at a big company can be in the thousands. Um, so I don't know if anyone's ever tried to incorporate that in an experiment, but, I, but you know, there, there's, there's an, I, I would expect these laws have far more leverage in the U.S. because of that. Because in some sense, knowing about the data really makes a difference for how strong the case is. Uh, on a priori grounds, and in terms of you know what's at stake. I, I, I just followed your instructions. So um, Moritz Kuhn, University of Bonn. Um, I, I want to follow up on uh, Claire's uh, excellent uh, discussion, and uh, because I think like you were making this distinction between unexplained and explained. So one one thing one might be very concerned about is like maybe we just don't have the right data to explain. So um, I think many firms have actually very clear like pay scales, pay bands where you are like located, and so then within these bands, there's like not a lot to like discuss. If there's a woman and a man on pay level 13, they get the same pay. So it's really this question about like um, like do we do we already have the right data to to compare? Because like in many cases, like we did something comparable for the German public service where we have exact pay bands and you still find a gender pay gap. So, which seems like very hard to, to explain unless it's a, it's a measurement error. Um, and then the next question would be, you, you expect, or the, the related question would be, you, you're doing a static experiment, but may, maybe the gender pay gap is a dynamic, uh, dynamic thing where we, we really have to think about promotions and how women like climb the career ladder and come up to the higher pay scales. And if we don't measure these pay scales, then in the end we think it's something that is static and at this moment in time, because like our data tells us it's women on the same, like or with the same observables, although it's something that is um, somehow in the in the past where uh, women just didn't have the chance to climb the well, like like because of social norms or whatever might then be the reason didn't climb the Kajila as, as, as quickly or as, as far as men. Uh, Pierre Cahuc, Sciences Po. So I was thinking about the implementation of pay, of pay transparency, because if you think of the real world, 
when you have relatively small firm, for instance, it means that you would, you would, you would uh, end up by comparing individuals rather than group, what you do in your experiments. So, and as, <coughs> as Clara has underlined, then you, you, you are trouble, you have trouble to, to measure the uh, performance of each person. So did you think about that? Uh, so what, what, what would be the problem here? And another small question about the selection of participants for external validity. So who are these people who are employees who, who are keen to participate in this kind of uh, experiment? Okay, uh, I turn back the floor to Mariana. Good. Um, uh, thank you very much for all the feedback. This was uh, very interesting. Um, regarding the country differences on the employee side, there was no difference. However, there were differences in the employer side, uh, for which we have another experiment that we would like to write a paper about and then, uh, and then see there what, what is happening. And then we can definitely give uh, uh, more information about all the distributions and and, and so on uh, there, but also in our paper. And I, if I have to divide the feedback that I got, uh, there is some uh, more technical uh, feedback and on the analysis that we did, which, he, which we could definitely implement. But there is a lot of questions about the external validity of, uh, of our work. Um, the employees that participated were uh, people at age work currently uh, employed. A employers were uh, HR uh, uh, professionals, so we try to maintain, uh, uh, you know, uh, as close as to reality as possible. And uh, we also try to cover uh, the industries as well as, as much as possible. Um, and I think that there on the external validity, yes, there is a, a, a lot of things that come into play. But what we tried to do here was to understand the mechanisms behind it and see if there were open questions and questions that were not, uh, you know, considered and included in pay transparency discussions, such, for example, comparing yourself uh, to women if you are a woman, that requires an extra action there uh, when it comes to, to, to pay transparency. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, there, uh, there is uh, more information that we can include in the paper, definitely, to make it more clear, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, but also there is a lot that goes around uh, pay transparency and many complications that could be uh, included as well. But I think that, yeah, we tried to um, open questions for more debates ab about pay transparency that it cannot be a very straightforward policy mechanism as it is included now. So. Cool. Thank you very much. And uh, I forgot to give the floor to uh, Barbara. She had a question. She's from... The virtual world, please. Barbara, are you there? Or yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. We, we could hear you short briefly, but now you we can't. I, I now it's better. Sorry. Is that okay? Okay. So what, what, what I thought was interesting was the differential result depending on the wage of the individual with respect to the distribution. And uh, what I find kind of harder to reconcile with what we know from other evidence is that when people were paid above the average, they didn't exert any more effort once they knew about the pay transparency. So there are a few, a few results, for example, from the gift exchange literature, where we see that if people have this kind of unexpected surprise that they're more than the average, then they would sort of compensate, they will reciprocate with higher effort. I wonder whether there is an issue of, say, lack of power there, or it could be investigated further whether this effect about being paid more than the average could work differently, according again to whether, depending on whether you're paid more or less than the average of your own gender. So the own gender thing, I thought it was missing there. Um, and then a more general remark, I think it's really good to have a broad motivation about the prevalence of pay disparity and then some open questions about discrimination. But then again, in the conclusions, I think it would be good to uh, to stick to the to the experiments conclusion in the sense that there was some conclusion about, for example, helping women with self esteem, helping women, for example, uh, redress uh, disparities that are not granted particularly by this experiment. So I think that the conclusions should stick to the to the empirical analysis. 
cool. This, this, I, I take this as an editorial comment. Uh, not, uh, and we can thank you very much. Uh, so we move on uh, to Thanks. the second paper of the morning. And the presenter is Marco Alberto de Benedetto. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay. So, immigration and teacher bias toward foreign students is a, a joint work with uh, Maria de Paola in which we investigate how the geographic concentration of immigrants affects the way teachers evaluate students from an immigrant background compared to uh, natives. Now, generally speaking, the economic consequences of immigration are uh, hotly debated by both academics and policymakers. And even though there is a huge literature investigating this kind of effects and finding uh, long term benefits for the economies of uh, host countries. C citizens still rate immigration as one of the most pressing issues for their countries. Moreover, um, there is a branch of this literature, especially psychology literature, that has focused on the geographic concentration of immigrants in shaping um, the attitudes natives might have toward immigrants. And in fact, according to uh, this group threat theory, Natives have negative attitudes toward immigrants as they feel threatened by, by them. And once these adverse attitudes toward immigrants translate into a discrimination, then it means that both the socioeconomic status and the integration of immigrants are both armed. Also, uh, a hostile environment in which immigrants work and live might negatively affect the physical and mental health of immigrants. And we think that all these issues are more relevant when discrimination takes place at school and comes from peers and uh, teachers. So the um, idea behind our uh, paper is that um, teachers might have uh, stereotyped um, expectations about students' skills, and in turn, young immigrants might feel less motivated. Uh, they can make less of an effort in their study activities um, with negative consequences, not only on school performance, but also on long-term outcomes once they are in the, in the labor market. So what we say overall is that discrimination at school, especially in primary school, and I will explain later on why we focused on primary schools, uh, can work as a sort of barrier to the integration of immigrants in the, in the long run. Now, just to give an insight of uh, what the immigration flows is in, is in Italy, we can say that it has increased over time, even though the share of immigrants in the population is lower compared to other European countries, such as Germany and France, and it reached 8.8% in 2019, whilst in Germany and France float, floated around 9 and 6%. And along this general trend, of course, the presence of children from an immigrant background has increased in Italy, especially in, in primary and in middle schools. It reached roughly 11%, and it is lower in high school it is roughly 7% according to uh, the information provided by the Ministry of Education in Italy. So, in order to um, answer our research question, we used a database provided by INVALSI, that is a government uh, agency that assess 
the performance of students early, students in the second, fifth, uh, eighth, and uh, tenth grade. And we have information about five different waves from 2012 to 2016, and we end up with a large sample of students, more than one million located in roughly 7,000 institutes and uh, roughly 15,000 schools, where the institute in Italy can embed, can include more than one school in uh, 580 local labor, local labor market. Um, we uh, exploit information uh, of, uh, provided by Invarsi to build our outcome variable, that is the, the teacher assigned grade in both math and language. And we also observe um, information about the standardized blinded grades. Um, in particular, there are three different indicators. Uh, the, the, what we used in the main analysis is the cheating corrected standardized test score, where Invalsi directly uses a statistical procedure to purge data of this kind of problem. Uh, the second one is the fraction of correct answers in the Invalsi test, and the third one is the RASH score, where the RASH model belongs to the item response theory model, uh, which um, jointly estimates two different parameters. The first one is related to the difficulty, and the second one the ability of student in replying to all the items for the entire test. Um, we exploit the citizenship to build our uh, variable immigrant that takes the value one if the student is first or second generation immigrant and zero otherwise. And we have also a lot of information about pupils, uh, their parents, so both educational attainment and um, um, job uh, occupational status and on school uh, characteristics. And then we merge this data set with um, a database provided by ISTAT to, um, to have the share of immigrants in the, in the population, and in particular in the local labor market. So why we focus on uh, uh, primary uh, schools as the experiences that children have in primary schools are quite important in terms of how they conceive on, of schools and how to relate to native classmates and uh, uh, teachers. And also because uh, when discrimination um, takes place at this vulnerable age, uh, in particular, uh, they start primary schools when they are six and they finish when they are 11. Uh, this can limit the emotional benefits with negative long-lasting consequences, not only in terms of school performance, but also uh, on their career once they are in the, in the labor market. Um, we, we did the same analysis also for eighth graders, even though we do not have information about the student questionnaire that is adopted to have also information on non, or on non cognitive skills. And we decided not to focus on the 10th uh, graders because uh, the dropout rate uh, increases and is roughly 36. 0.5%, so it means that immigrant students in high schools are quite self-selected. Okay, so, in order to recover the, um, the, the effect of the share of immigrants, so the increasing presence of immigrants, in the local labor market uh, on the way teachers evaluate immigrants compared to natives, we estimate this, uh, this model where, as I said before, the dependent variable is the uh, teacher assigned grade in both math and language, whereas the main variable of interest is the interaction between the immigrant dummy and the share of immigrants in the labor market. 
we control for characteristics at the pupil uh, level. W is um, a vector containing information on school, so uh, number of classes, number of students enrolled at the beginning of the school year, the share of immigrants and the share of female students in the class, and we control for um, labor market fixed effect and for year, year dumbness. Uh, why we focus on the local labor market for two different reasons. The first, uh, the first one is that Invalsi only provides us with the municipality where the institute, so the headquarter is, is located, uh, where in, uh, in each municipality there might be different schools belonging to the same institute. And the second one is that if it's true that the share of immigrants or the increasing presence of immigrants in the area affects the way teachers evaluate students, then we actually do not have information on where the teacher uh, lives. So uh, which share of immigrants, so the presence of immigrants in which municipality affects the behavior of, the behavior of, of teachers, share of immigrants in the municipality where uh, he lives or where he works. So this is the reason why we focus on the, on the local labor market. So even though we control for this uh, labor, local labor market fixed effect, we cannot say that the coefficient of our uh, variable of interest can be interpreted in terms or in a casual manner. Uh, because th there are, of course, endogeneity issues. The first one is the omitted variable bias. So there might be potential economic shocks in the labor market that affect the demand for immigrants and the way teachers evaluate students according to their citizenship. Uh, there might be a self-selection as immigrants self-select themselves in the labor markets or measurement error because there is it's very hard to have a perfect track of the movements of immigrants from one, one municipality to the other, even though our information comes from official data. So in order to solve endo endogeneity issues, uh, we rely, we hinge on the main literature and use the shift share instruments as proposed by CARD, uh, Z. That is the sum with C, that is the country that goes from one to N of Lambda MC 1991, that is the share of immigrants from country C in the local labor market M in year 1991, multiplied the uh, number of immigrants, okay, coming from uh, country C at time T, uh, everything normalized by the population uh, in the local labor market in 1991. So what we exploit here is the so-called enclave effect. So before presenting uh, the results, I want to show you uh, the average gap that there the, um, the is between immigrants and natives in our sample. So we have the first three specification for math and the last three for the language score. Um, in the first specification, we do not control for the um, invalsity score that is used as um, proxy for student ability. Uh, in, the, in the second one, we control for uh, a linear uh, polynomial, whereas in the third one, a li for a linear polynomial for both math and language standardized test score. As we can see, the um, uh, the coefficient of immigrant is negative and statistically significant, and one, uh, once we control for the standardized test score, so for the student ability, it drops, but it's still uh, strong. So here I um, provided also graphical evidence of this average gap. In this case, we have on the y-axis the teacher assigned grades in language by quintiles of the standardized test scores. As, as, as we can see, immigrants receive always a lower grade by their teachers compared to natives. And the same pattern is found for uh, math. So main results. So we have here our variable of interest, so the share of immigrants times the, the immigrant dummy. Um, 
uh, we found what? So the effect is statistically significant only for language, but it is sizable also for uh, a math score. In fact, a one standard deviation increase in the share of immigrants in the local labor market leads to a decrease of 0.04 for math and 0.05 for language in the uh, teacher assigned rates. Uh, that is roughly one fifth and one sixth respectively of the average gap that I uh, reported in the previous, in the previous table. Um, from the first stage, we have the, uh, a strong enclave effect. So there is a strong correlation between our instrument and the endogenous variable. And these results, uh, of course, are robust to a series of robustness that you can find in the, in the paper. Um, another thing uh, regarding the instrument, uh, we um, implemented a series of tests just to reassure the, the reader that the exclusion restriction holds. So we implemented the Oster test, Conley test, and two different tests proposed by Mitariton et al. Um, okay. We also provided evidence, uh, so an heterogeneous effect according to first or second generation of immigrants, where second generation of immigrants are those who uh, were born from um, immigrant parents but in the host country. And what we found is that these, uh, the increasing presence of immigrants affect teachers evaluate second generation immigrants, uh, especially in, uh, uh, in language. So we found a statistically significant effect only in the, in, the last, um, in the last column. So it means that teachers probably, probably have lower expectation uh, about second generation compared to first generation immigrants. Um, we also try to uh, understand different mechanisms uh, relating to um, our uh, main effect. So the first one, we split uh, the sample according to the median value of the population size distribution. And we find for both math and language that the, uh, the share of immigrants times immigrants is statistically significant only for a small cities when the population size is smaller than uh, the median. Um, and this might happen because, um, for instance, in large cities, citizens, so natives, have higher standard of education or they have experienced long um, history of uh, immigration and diversity. And in fact, when we split also the sample according to the educational attainment of the population, we found that this effect is stronger and is present only at the bottom of the distribution, so below the 25th uh, percentile. Okay. So uh, the second mechanism, um, we check whether the effect is heterogeneous according to the, uh, the area where the school is located. And we actually found that um, this sort of bias, of teacher bias, is stronger in the south compared to the center north where for, for sure the, um, the migration inflows started in the center north uh, first. And in the center north, maybe citizens have acquired more accommodating uh, attitudes toward foreigners. And these results are also in line with the, with the literature, uh, especially uh, Bushin et al. paper, um, who found that uh, a greater exposure to ethnic minorities reduces the implicit and expli explicit uh, prejudice towards uh, immigrants.
Okay, so of course in the papers we, uh, we investigated other aspects, but I had to pick up uh, some of the mechanisms. Here, um, thanks to the suggestion provided by one of the referees, uh, we provided further um, evidence that the share, so the, the increasing presence of immigrants in the area where the school is located affects teachers' behavior and not the behavior of, of students in the class. So we, in this case, we exploited two different waves. So the student questionnaire provided by Invalsi for two different waves in which students were asked about victimization or bullying behavior. So we built different dummy uh, variables, victimization, bullying, or uh, some proxies of the socialization, let's say, of students in the class. And as we can see, we never found any statistically significant effect of the interaction between the share of immigrants and immigrants. So it means that the main channels goes through the behavior of teachers and not the behavior or indeed the integration of, of students in the class. And uh, last but not least, uh, so we focused in the main estimation, we presented results for fifth graders because we had information on uh, student questionnaires and so on and so forth, but also we wanted uh, to check whether the, the age of students or statistical discrimination was at play. But actually what we found is that for second graders, uh, the results are very similar to uh, what we found for fifth graders, so it means that uh, we, we can exclude the so-called statistical discrimination behind our results. So. In conclusion, uh, we uh, contributed to the literature investigating the average gap between immigrants and uh, uh, natives, and we explain part of this average gap by means of the, this increasing presence of immigrants in the area where the school is uh, located because this increasing presence of immigrants might generate, even unconsciously, uh, feelings of hostility toward immigrants. And uh, 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 we found also that this effect is heterogeneous according to the uh, size of the uh, municipality in which the school is located. Um, uh, it is heterogeneous in terms of the area where the school is located. And also, um, I didn't present here the tables, but they are in the, in, in the paper. Um, it is true only for older and less uh, educated, less qualified uh, teachers. So, in a nutshell, what is the policy uh, implication of of our paper, so since there is this teacher bias toward immigrants, uh, and this teacher bias might affect the uh, short-term and long-term outcomes of immigrants, so not only school performance, decision uh, of dropout uh, of schools, um, but also the labor market outcomes, so their careers, then it means that different policies should be implemented in order to uh, increase what is the social welfare. And in fact, according to the Ministry of Education, different policies should be implemented by principles, such as the peer mentoring, on, but also on all those policies aimed at boosting the skills of teachers in the aforementioned areas. So in small municipalities, especially in the south, and affecting specific characteristics, specific groups of teachers, so older and less qualified. And that's it. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> this, was a, this was a precision landing, really. Uh, we have two discussions of this paper. The first one is uh, Gabriele Fack. The floor is yours. Ah, very good.
So, <clears throat> um, so thank you for inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper. Um, so uh, I think it was very well explained what the paper does, so I'm not going to uh, go back and, and uh, really uh, uh, summarize uh, very, very briefly the, the paper. So the main question of the paper is how uh, immigrant immigration uh, in the local labor market affects teachers' grading bias uh, towards immigrants. And so this is done by looking at a uh, evolution of immigration in Italian uh, uh, local labor markets. And teacher bias here is basically the difference between uh, grades given to non-blind tests, in, I guess, in class, uh, versus uh, tests that were uh, blind, uh, blind, so graded blindly. Um, and so the findings are that in areas where, uh, which there was a, an increase in uh, immigrant share, uh, teachers, especially in small cities, uh, seem to exhibit a larger bias ag against immigrants when uh, grading non-widely. Um, and so uh, what is really nice is that uh, this paper actually tries to go beyond papers that have established that there is a bias in teachers' grading against some groups. So there's been some papers that show that actually uh, teachers tend to bias, um, to have biased grading uh, towards immigrants or actually in some cases toward boys, and this might actually affect their effort. But then the question is, uh, where does this bias come from? And because it's important for policy implication to understand uh, what is the source of the bias in order to be able to try to address it. And so that's uh, what the paper does uh, by kind of asking the question, uh, can we relate this bias to some local uh, labor market conditions? Um, and the paper is very nicely done with this very nice uh, Italian data that have the universe of students and that are actually uh, using uh, uh, standardized tests. Uh, so although I realize that in order to get a reliable measure of standardized tests, you need to actually correct for cheating. So apparently there is pervasive cheating probably in many countries, but at least uh, uh, Italy is trying to correct uh, the, the grades on that. Um, and um, so the results are very robust to many, uh, to many uh, robustness checks, and particularly the uh, teacher bias uh, in language uh, classes. And so it's a very interesting paper of very good data, and I, I really enjoyed reading it. So now, uh, in order to uh, dig in a little bit into uh, the paper, I'm going to discuss a little bit the estimation strategy, and I will uh, then mainly discuss uh, the interpretation of the results. So the um, Estimation strategy, so is based on basically uh, looking at how variation in the share of immigrants uh, across legal, labor, labor market, local labor markets, uh, affects teachers' bias. And so since uh, uh, there might be some endogeneity, uh, there is a, a shift share instrument that is used uh, by basically weighting uh, flows of immigrants uh, by uh, the composition of immigration in 1991. Uh, in different local labor markets. So here the question is, uh, um, so clearly it seems that it's a, uh, a very relevant instrument. So what, what was happening uh, uh, in uh, 1991 actually determines uh, where uh, immigrants then locate uh, later. Uh, but I still wonder uh, how much variation do you have uh, that comes from variation in immigration flows between uh, 2012 and 2016, which is the area of analysis. Uh, and in particular, I was wondering whether you're looking at the stock of immigrants or at the flow of immigrants. Uh, maybe it doesn't matter if you have, uh, you know, year fixed effect, but still uh, I was wondering if you could say a bit more about, you know, the, like how uh, uh, this really affected uh, different areas. And also something I was uh, trying to understand is that here, actually, uh, some of the uh, Interesting result is that uh, bias from teachers seems to come from second generation migrants. So basically those are the children of potentially migrants who migrated uh, in the 90s or at least earlier. So then in a sense, uh, I'm wondering whether then the exogeneity of your instrument uh, is, is potentially a bit uh, more complicated to defend in the sense that then 
uh, you're looking at basically uh, people who migrated in the 90s. And so if there is correlation with immigration shock later, maybe this, uh, there could be some uh, um, problems here. So, uh, uh, I mean, maybe you can do uh, something later uh, related to the different groups of migrant, migrants, immigrants, and I, I will come back to that later. Um, so then the second uh, main question related to the estimation strategy uh, is about uh, what is basically uh, the uh, scope of the analysis. So here uh, it was very, very well explained uh, in the presentation and in the paper that uh, the choice of looking at local labor markets is kind of due to practical constraints uh, that it's very hard to know where teachers live and not we don't know, not necessarily know exactly where the school is located. However, I think uh, that you might think of very different mechanisms through which uh, teachers might have some bias against immigrants. So here the idea is really like basically in their daily interactions, uh, they see more immigrants and so then this creates a bias against uh, immigrant uh, students. Or maybe it's because uh, at the local le um, level you have a uh, lot of information about uh, migration shocks, and so that's the relevant level. But uh, I think it would be interesting to know, uh, to try to discuss a little bit more uh, why this uh, local labor market is relevant in terms of mechanism. And uh, I mean, it can be a relevant mechanism, but then you can think of uh, other kind of uh, smaller. Uh, units, geographical units, where it actually matters. And so you could think that uh, what matters it not, is not only the local labor market, but also the neighborhood or the school, or even within the school, the class. And here I come to actually a control that you add. So you, there is a control for uh, the share of immigrants in the class. And I think it's very interesting because you can think that there is a difference between basically general um, attitude toward towards Im immigrants that you can get from local labor markets. And then there is a question of what is the actual interactions with immigrant students that teachers have, which is going to be at the school and at the class level. And maybe if there are many more immigrants in the school, it makes the interaction uh, different than if there are less, less immigrants. So you might want to control for that. But then uh, the you know, local share of immigrants in the school or in the class is actually potentially very endogenous. And so uh, then there is a question of uh, whether actually it's problematic if you put it in your regression. And um, I think it's very interesting, but then you would want to have some kind of instrument as well for this uh, variable. Uh, and so um, I think it would be interesting to first throw the result without this and then kind of discuss uh, how Adding this uh, might affect the, the results, this variable of share of immigrants in the classroom. And I don't know whether you can use some variation, uh, you know, across classes uh, within uh, schools over years to try to kind of find an instrument. But uh, uh, I think that uh, the share in the class and the share in the labor market it deserve more discussion to, to see whether they are uh, quite correlated or not. Okay. Um, then there is the question of, uh, so basically here, and I think the overall question is this literature, we are comparing uh, grades in non-blind tests to grade uh, in blind tests, and to what extent the difference is pure discrimination, or to what extent uh, there are other reasons that might explain that the two grades are a bit different, so how to rule out that these are not these other explanation uh, but it's really discrimination that is going on. And here in particular, I saw that, if I remember correctly, you were using uh, the non-blind grades uh, that were related to oral exams versus uh, blind tests that were, I guess, written exams. So then I'm wondering whether you know, this might require different types of skills, and in particular related to how you're able to express yourself, etc. And so, uh, even though apparently the uh, grades on written exams, non-blind written exams, uh, are missing for uh, many people, I'm, I mean, could you still check that the results hold for this type of, uh, uh, of like similar written exams? And also, um, basically, 
uh, I was wondering whether you, you could have other uh, measures of non-cognitive skills uh, that you could use uh, in order to see whether, I mean, this could explain uh, potentially the different results. Uh, if, I, if for some reason immigrants have uh, lower non-cognitive skills uh, or that you could maybe, you've done a lot of heterogeneity analysis trying to look at the characteristics of the teachers, but maybe you can also do some heterogeneity analysis uh, using the characteristics of the students and look at whether the bias is larger for students who tend to be uh, higher ability or students to, who tend to be lower ability on the basis of the uh, blind, blind test. Um, and um, then also there is a question of if teachers grade on a curve and since you showed that uh, immigrants they are doing worse on, on blind tests they, they tend to be potentially at the bottom of the class so could, could it also explain some stuff so can you try to see at what is the position of the students in the class and try to see also uh, if there is uh, if you do some heterogeneity analysis here um, and I was actually wondering whether you could do your main specification, uh, but putting as a dependent variable the grades to the blind tests. Of course, you would not control for blind tests in the, in the, in the uh, um, control variables. But then, if you can show that the share of immigrants in the local labor market doesn't affect grades for the, non, for the blind tests, sorry, if you if you uh, if you put blind test as a, as a uh, dependent variable and you can show that basically there is no uh, differential grading um, according to the share of uh, immigrant in the local labor market to the blind test, then it would be kind of potentially really convincing that there there is nothing going on here um, in uh, you know blind tests. And so if you see a difference, it's really something coming from you know. What uh, what is graded in the uh, uh, in the um, non-blind tests, um, and then uh, my my last comment is about uh, the fact that uh, you're looking at immigration as a whole, uh, but it could be interesting to look at different uh, uh, immigration from different regions of the world, uh, because the you know the 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 way uh, people might react. Uh, and might have different types of um, anti-immigrant sentiments might depend on uh, the origin of the, of the uh, immigration. And uh, so I, I wonder whether you can actually try to uh, make some differences and look at differentially at the effect for different groups of immigrants. And in particular, maybe you could also leverage on the uh, opening of, uh, I mean, of the, of the expansion of uh, EU in order to use it as a kind of exogenous uh, uh, change in uh, the uh, ability for some groups of migrants to come to Italy. And so maybe it's a kind of another kind of instrument for some groups of immigrants that you could use uh, as a way to kind of reinforce uh, the robustness of your results. And also as a way to see whether uh, the effects are the same for immigrants who, who come from uh, some other European countries or whether the effects uh, might come from immigrants that come from uh, uh, North Africa or uh, Asia, because other people have shown that uh, immigrants from Asia and immigrants from uh, Africa are not necessarily uh, uh, subject to the same uh, discrimination by teachers. I mean, it depends on the country, but uh, so it could be interesting also to investigate this in, in the case of, uh, of Italy. So I'm going to stop here, but uh, thank you for, his, uh, very, for this very interesting paper. Cool. Thank you very much. And uh, Inga Heiland is the second discussion discussant. Great. 
Thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to read and uh, discuss this paper. Uh, let me start with a one-line summary uh, of the paper. So the, uh, the paper is interested in understanding the gap in grading uh, the, um, between native and foreign students. And in particular, how this grading gap changed uh, with regard to the increased prevalence of immigration in different uh, regions in Italy. And the methodology that the authors employ is a within-region analysis. So they're, they're studying uh, how the change in immigration in, in different local labor markets in Italy affected this uh, relative grading of immigrants versus uh, natives. The authors employ an instrumental variable for the share of, of immigrants to address uh, endogeneity concerns there. And importantly, they also uh, control for the ability of the students, uh, which of course is key when we think about how to interpret this gap or whether we can interpret this gap as uh, discrimination. Um, my uh, view on the contribution of the paper is that it kind of connects two interesting literatures. The first literature that has looked at this uh, grading gap um, with regard to different groups of, of students. And it uh, connects this literature to, to a broad literature which has studied the impact of uh, immigration on, on social outcomes. And the most important uh, takeaway from my discussion uh, is going to be that this is, I believe this is a very uh, carefully executed empirical uh, paper and it addresses an issue of high uh, relevance. So migration is a, a big economic phenomenon. It's uh, supposedly going to become even more uh, important in the future given kind of the, the challenges posed by climate change among others that we are facing. We also know that discrimination has very detrimental uh, effects on, on human beings. So I think this uh, paper addresses a very important point and uh, something that the paper also, uh, in uh, my opinion, contributes to is this general discussion about how we can uh, really uh, measure discrimination, given uh, that lots of skills are unobservable uh, in, in the data or to the econometrician. My uh, discussion points are going to focus uh, around identification, and I'm going to reiterate some of the points that uh, Gabrielle also made. Uh, in order to think about uh, identification or how we can identify this, this change in, in discrimination potentially uh, associated with an increase in, in the prevalence of migration, um, I want to think about what the uh, ideal experiment would be to identify this uh, effect. And then contrast it with the methodology that the authors have chosen in order to understand which uh, assumptions uh, they have to make. Some challenges uh, that I will discuss in this uh, respect are going to be teacher and student heterogeneity, um, as well as uh, the, the possibility to really measure the relevant uh, abilities here. And I'll end with one uh, short comment on the uh, motivation of the paper. So the ideal experiment, I think, uh, to, the, to study discretion or to identify this, this uh, effect on discrimination would be a situation where we observe the same student graded by the same teacher, either at different points in time, like a point in time where immigration was large uh, versus a point in time where it was low, or in two different municipalities uh, characterized by different levels of immigration. This is, of course, uh, asking too much. So what the authors employ instead is that they uh, construct something like a quasi-experimental uh, design which is that they compare the treatment of the group of students that lives in a certain municipality by a group of teachers that works in a certain municipality at uh, two points in time, with high immigration and with uh, low immigration. And the uh, assumptions needed here uh, in order to identify this effect on the change in, in discrimination are twofold. First of all, in order to identify the impact of the change in immigration on the change in the grading gap, the authors need an instrument for the, the share uh, of immigration, which they have and I think uh, is, is convincing. However, in order to interpret this change in the gap as a change in discrimination, I believe uh, more assumptions are needed. In particular, what needs to, to be assumed in this uh, setting is that the composition of teachers and the comp composition of students either is uh, uh, constant, exogenous, or can be uh, controlled for. And uh, 
because this concern about the composition of students and teachers uh, changing, I think, is valid here because there are several uh, results in the paper that point to uh, the effects of or the, the heterogeneity of teachers and students being important for, for grades or for the, the relative grades as well. So there are results in the paper suggesting that teacher characteristics matter. So teachers in smaller cities or in, in regions where the population is less educated uh, seem to be driving uh, the results. There are also findings that uh, student characteristics matter to the extent to which they are kind of subject to, to this biased uh, grading. And in the present setting, I think this, uh, this is going to uh, create a problem in a situation where teachers or students move in response uh, to immigration. So uh, if this is the case, like if for some reasons more teachers would move into regions where immigration uh, has become more prevalent, I mean more teachers that are, uh, have a higher propensity to, to discriminate against uh, students, the effects that we see, like this identified gap on the change, uh, this identified change in the gap uh, of grading, could just be due to more uh, discriminatory teachers living in, in that region. Or it could also be that students move uh, in response to this uh, change in immigration, which um, could kind of generate this change in the gap that we see in the case where students with characteristics that make them sort of more likely to be discriminated against have moved to these uh, regions. And this is, of course, a very different interpretation of the gap than uh, from what we initially are interested in, which would be kind of a change in the, in the attitude of the same teacher towards the same uh, student. And uh, to the extent that this moving can happen in response to the change in immigration, it's not something that the instrument uh, can address. It's also uh, problematic in the sense that if all we see is about moving, so it's really just um, teachers that discriminate more moving from one region to another in response to this change in immigration, there's not going to be any effect on, on the country level while we are still uh, measuring this, this change in, in the gap. So what does the, the paper do about uh, student and teacher heterogeneity? So for teacher uh, heterogeneity, or in particular changes in the composition of teachers, I didn't find any, uh, any um, result in the paper that would kind of alleviate this concern. A lot, uh, on the other hand, is done about student characteristics. So there the authors observe a lot so they can control for the composition of students uh, uh, in terms of observable variables, which cover socioeconomic characteristics, um, as well as ability to some extent. And so um, seeing that there are lots of variables that matter, of course, also raises the question, are there other unobserved variables that also matter that, that are not here? And one point that uh, Gabrielle also mentioned was the country of origin of students. So if it was, if it was possible to call, control for that as well, I think it would be uh, very important. Then the other aspect is the, uh, the possibility to control for skills that affect the relative uh, grading. And I think the, the paper goes a long way with having these uh, blind degraded uh, test scores, but I'm still uh, wondering whether uh, more needs to be done uh, here. And this goes also back to a point that Gabrielle made about uh, these different kinds of tests potentially requ requiring different uh, skills. So I, I can uh, imagine that there are uh, lots of reasons why immigrants might perform uh, less well in these uh, uh, standardized, uh, sorry, in this non-standardized and non-blindly graded tests than in the standardized ones, because potentially they are really designed to test for a different uh, skill set. Or it might also be possible that these standardized uh, tests can be can be practiced in advance, and maybe immigrant students put more effort into practicing for these uh, kind of tests. And uh, one result in the paper that actually made me uh, think about this was. Uh, this regression analysis where the authors relate uh, the, for, for example, the math score in, in the uh, non-blindly graded test to the math score in the blindly graded test. And we see a positive correlation there, uh, but we also see a posi positive correlation with the language score in the uh, blindly graded test, and vice versa for, ma uh, for the language score. So we see that the math uh, score in the blindly graded test affects the language score in the non-blindly graded test, which makes me wonder about whether there are other uh, skills 
that also matter that uh, are not controlled for uh, here. And of course, this, if unobserved uh, skills matter for, uh, for this uh, grading gap, then this, this uh, threatens the interpretation of the gap as discrimination. And it could be potentially the case, kind of going back to this idea of students moving, that the change in the gap that we see reflects a, a change in the, in the composition of students with these different kind of uh, skills. So if we have uh, a case where high immigration regions receive more migrants with this, this additional valuable skills that you need for the uh, non-standardized tests, then this could be uh, also explaining uh, the results. Then uh, one last comment on the motivation of the paper. So the, the first paragraph of the paper states that uh, many empirical investigations have only, only found minimal economic consequences of uh, migration. And I think this is not, not quite precise because there are at least as many uh, studies that have found uh, sizable impacts of uh, immigration. In fact, my reading of the literature is that there's a huge debate both about the magnitude of, say, the effects of immigration on, on wages of, diff of different groups as well as uh, the sign of, the, of uh, this effect. So I think this uh, should be framed a little bit uh, differently. All right, uh, this brings me to the end. So I want to conclude with uh, saying what I said before, that I think this is a very uh, well-written and well-executed paper. I think a paper could uh, gain from discussing uh, this ability measure a bit more and convincing the reader that uh, you're capturing the most important uh, skills, and also to uh, think about what could be done to address this issue of uh, teacher and student mobility in the presence of uh, uh, heterogeneity of, of teachers and uh, students. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think we open the floor. I s let's do the same thing. Please uh, raise your hands and then one round. Yes, Emery, please. <laughs> So uh, thanks a lot for the paper. So uh, I had a question on this uh, test course. So I have the same concern about the difference between the, the blind and the non-blind, whether it's really the same abilities you're testing. But also, I, I, if I understand correctly, it's, uh, the, the blind test is observed at the municipality level, not at the individual level? At the school level? At so is, it, that's level. A, is that at the same level as the, as the blind? You observe it for each student. OK. So is there a concern that you should control for other uh, moments of the distribution? Or, or see differently, shouldn't your unit of observation actually be the one at which you measure the... Yeah. Uh, and, and do you find the same result if you do it at the, at the school level? Do you observe that indeed the share of immigrants uh, increases the gap? Yes. Oh. Yeah. I replaced local labor market fixed effects with school, class, municipal fixed effect because um, uh, it was a request of one of the referees they said, what happens to your estimates whether rather than controlling for labor market fixed effects, you add school or class, and we provided this table, but the results are, are, are um, still the same. Um, are there, oh, okay. Um, so I wanted to raise some issue um, along the line of um, uh, other issues, uh, the issues that we they were raised by other discussants. So the discussants uh, correctly uh, raised issues of the endogeneity of migration and also compositional changes in the student skills. I think that even in the case that migration is perfectly exogenous and composition is perfectly constant, I actually think that there's a direct treatment effect of the share of the immigrants on the language skills of the uh, kids. And that's, my, that's actually based on my personal experience. So I am um, an Im immigrant with a native language that has a very different structure from any European languages. And I lived in the city where there were very few um, people with uh, the, uh, the same origin as mine. And I also lived in the cities where lots of, there are lots of lot of people with the same origin. And when I lived in the cities uh, with um, the friends that, sh uh, that share the same origin, I actually experienced that my lang like English language, pro English pronunciation deteriorated very severely because I spent a lot of time speaking my own um, native language. And I talked about it with my friends uh, with the same origin, and they all said that they also had that, that experience as well. So um, I, I, I am actually thinking that uh, the uh, 
uh, children's um, speaking skills uh, are very fluid uh, and they are uh, changing as a result of the sort of uh, like a type of the population that they interact with as a, a result of the um, changes in the share of the immigrants. And I also think um, that very often for foreigners, it's very often the case that their uh, written language, foreign, their written skills is much better, like writing skills are much better than speaking skills. So as a speaker, as a native speaker of the, the Asian language, it's actually extremely common that like Koreans uh, are very good at grammar and, and writing, et cetera. They're extremely poor in speaking. And their writing skills are much more constant, and their uh, speaking skills are much more fluid as a result of um, their social interactions um, and what kind of language they were speaking at the moment. So um, I'm actually concerned that even in the case that the um, migration is kind of exogenous, and the, uh, the skill, the, the sort of composition of the uh, innate skills of the students are quite constant over time, there could actually be direct impact of the share of immigrants on the language skills of the students that are measured, yeah. Thanks, uh, Marco, for a nice, uh, nice talk. Um, so a little, I, I found it very interesting at the end that you kind of um, gave some policy recommendations. And, and I mean, I think mostly they were directed towards sort of the teachers and better training, more information, et cetera, which I think given um, the sort of arguments you're pushing, it makes sense. But I, I also agree, and it's a little in line with the last couple of comments, it might be better to be a bit open because in a sense by looking into, I mean, it, it is important to kind of consider what is being measured within these oral exams versus the written exams because it, well, it could be sort of, uh, as was described, I mean, differences in, in expression. So it, in that sense, again, it could be a matter of um, directing policy more towards more towards the students in that mm -hmm. sense. But the other element, and this might be easier for you to measure, which is looking at classroom behavior. So if you can get measures of, for instance, uh, absence uh, rates, um, or I mean, if, so, so there might be a way in which you can get administrative data on sort of uh, something which is correlated with uh, classroom behavior. And this can also see whether the teachers are in a sense punishing for differences in, in, in behavior. Um, so it could be capturing that, my point is. David, please. So I was, I was debating whether to make this point or not, but I think so this is a panel entirely focused on discrimination and stereotypes and things. I think it's probably an appropriate place to bring this up. So I've, I've been studying discrimination for, you know, since my dissertation, actually, scary thought. Um, and I've also been doing a lot of reading the last few years as we start to rethink moving beyond individual discrimination and how, how we should study discrimination. And I, and I think what was reflected, I, these are all really good comments. I think Claire's point is a great point. Um, I always tell my Chinese graduate students, like, get out of your Chinese graduate student circle and, and, and force yourself to speak English while you're here. Um, um, but what, what, what I see reflect a lot of this discussion is this this over-attachment to the null that it can't be discrimination. Like the entire discussion was about why, why, why the paper might be overstating discrimination. Um, now when we're studying employers, you know, yeah, there's a profit motive. I mean, the Becker th argument is overstated. But, you know, there's some reason to think that what we're seeing is maybe not discrimination because firms have some incentive, at least in competitive markets, to not discriminate. But in most other contexts, like this one, there's no incentive to not discriminate. There's no, you don't get punished by a market for being discriminatory. And I just think we need to, we need to just be sensitive to that when we're thinking about this research. You know, there, there might be as many reasons that, that discrimination is understated by the study. Um, and, and it's just not clear why we're attached to this null. I mean, there's this bias in economics, you know, there's an effect of something, let's think why it's not there. But I think in terms of how we study and think about discrimination, we got to start paying more attention to that that problem of this sort of. It's always a skeptical view that it is discrimination, um, instead of sometimes saying, oh, you know, that's actually the most plausible explanation, um, and let's sort of flip our lens for how we how we think about um, the strength of the evidence and what else could be going on and all that. So, just a general comment. Okay, well, Roberto. Roberto Galmiati. Okay, just. Uh, uh, <coughs> I have two little questions slash comments. So um, I, um, the point of Inga about uh, the, 
uh, the selection uh, of teachers seems to me the most, uh, the most important, more than, more than the mobility of, of students. And I'm wondering uh, whether you can have uh, uh, m a, lot of, uh, a lot more information about the characteristics uh, of the teachers in the Imbalsi, or at least uh, if you could uh, exploit the, the rules of assignment to teachers in the school. So you are, you are using, um, uh, lo you're exploiting local in the sense of regional variation, right? So uh, at least reassuring the reader that allocation of teachers is within region or not in Italy. So can you be, can you decide to go from uh, Reggio Calabria to Bergamo or not? So th this, this should be very clear. So mm. how they move, uh, what is the Second question, we were wondering uh, with Pierre, we never seen uh, the ULS of your, so uh, I understand that you, uh, that you uh, the, the reason why you implement uh, the, si the shift share, but it would be nice to see the ULS also and compare no, the ULS to the shift. They share. were in the, in the table, I, I didn't. Ah, they were, okay, okay, <laughs> good. But so. in the paper there are. There okay, are. Yeah. okay, great. After the, the first stage estimates, we reported the, the ULS estimates. Okay, um, and we have two other. further interventions. First, Barbara, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. So, uh, th thanks, Marco, for the presentation. Uh, I have a question about this kind of very important variable in, this, uh, in your whole analysis, which is the presence of immigrants. So, this captures various things. So, one is basically the generation of feelings of hostility among teachers, which is basically your, your headline result. Then you also mentioned that the presence of immigrants in, by exposing the native population to migration can also generate an evolution of those attitudes. So that's where you were talking about the divide between the North and the South. And then, of course, there is the issue of the enclave. Basically, this can have a direct impact on the uh, fluency of Italian language among the immigrants. So given that, <coughs> sorry, even that this variable can generate different uh, uh, mechanisms. Have you thought, for example, about bringing in external uh, data on attitudes? So, for example, you could look at whether instead of just splitting north versus south, splitting between regions with a higher sort of sentiment against immigrant presence or more tolerant attitudes towards the immigrant presence. So, basically, using independent information on that to do heterogeneous analysis. Okay, and uh, the last on my list is uh, Paola Pinotti. Can you hear us? Paolo, yeah, hi. And sorry for uh, not being there, being unable to, to make it in prison. So uh, I follow up on Robert, Roberto's question about uh, uh, the OLS results. So uh, I quickly checked now the OLS results in, in the paper and they are actually not significant. I mean, they, they are all zeros, right? So. As I said before, I, I think it's clear the reason why we want to have uh, an IV estimate here, but still it would be good to provide an explanation for uh, such a huge difference. So the OLS coefficients, they are 20 times lower and again, very close to zero and not significant compared to the IV, right? So mm -hmm. one explanation to, could be that immigrants are very good in predicting places where they're gonna be less discriminated and so they go to, to these uh, local labor markets and to the schools rather than other schools. But I mean, it requires a lot of confidence in their ability to, to self-select across these local labor markets and schools. So if you have, uh, I don't know, any other explanation for, for this difference between the OLS and the IV estimates. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we turn back the floor to the presenter. Okay, let's try to answer to some of, of the um, questions. So first of all, we haven't used written non-blind uh, tests because there are a lot of missing values in the uh, data set provided by Invalsi. So this is the reason why we, we focused on the, on the oral, um, oral test. Um, the second one, um, so uh, it might be true that there might be uh, other skills we do not t take into account about students, but actually we, we, we controlled for this uh, student ability, so uh, blind, uh, um, blindly test scores and also on non-cognitive skills. So this is the only information available from, from this um, data set. 
Um, the other thing, the share of immigrants in class, we know that it is potentially endogenous, and this is the reason why we explain a bit of the literature and we, we state in the paper that is endogenous, but one of the referees asked us to add it in the, in the main regression. Uh, I can try, I actually I don't know if there is a, um, an external data set about the sentiment, um, um, for instance, at uh, regional level about immigrants, but we, we can try to see if, if there is something in order to reply to Barbara's comments. Um, the other thing, uh, replying to Gazala, uh, difference in students' behavior, what we did is to, as I said in the, in the presentation, we used um, as dependent variable some, um, some victimization, bullying, uh, um, indicators of socialization in, in, in the class. Um, so w we did the best we, we could in order to, to answer to, to this question. Um, and that's it. So I, I will try to, to recover all your comments and try to, to embed everything in the new version of the paper. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. But before we go to the coffee break, I would like to hand over the floor to Georges de Menil, who most of you know it, but some may not know it. But he is uh, one of the three founders of this event, actually, uh, something like 30, 40 years back. I don't 30, 35, and, and um, um, uh, this is uh, my 75th panel. Uh, also, Richard Portis's 75th panel. He was here uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, and um, uh, you've really come up uh, in the world. Our, our first meeting was in a modest conference room uh, on the ground floor of the Maison des Sciences de l'Homme. Uh, and today, here you're on the top floor of the Ministry of Finance. and and uh, we're received by the Directeur du Trésor, uh, whom every uh, Frenchman knows is one of the most powerful civil servants um, in the country. Um, I, I think, I mean, one of the things that has uh, um, changed also is the diversity of the group. Uh, I think that the gender balance is better now, certainly, than it was uh, initially. Um, the geographic balance is also quite remarkable. And um, I have to tell you, we really struggled with that. Uh, the balance between Northern Europe, Southern Europe, uh, there was a lot of effort, blood, sweat, and tears at as Churchill would have said, uh, involved in getting to the point where we are, we are now. And I think that the fact that you have uh, the involvement, the commitment, really, of the CEPR, uh, CES IFO, uh, and Sciences Po uh, is a kind of guarantor and, uh, of uh, what really matters in the end, uh, which is the balance uh, of the panel. Uh, and that had, there's, uh, has often been a, a, a subject of considerable uh, uh, conflict and test, contest, uh, and the balance of the authors. Um, one thing that, that has not changed is the basic challenge which is to, uh, at the one, t one in the same time, to be at the frontier of economic science, to be relevant for economic policy, uh, and to speak to the broader non-technical public. Um, that's, a, that, that's difficult. It's a difficult challenge. It's very difficult. It's very easy to be tempted at various times to go one way or the other, 
to become uh, an acad a really purely academic uh, gathering or to uh, give in to the impulse to speak only uh, to the public. Uh, and uh, I congratulate you because you're really, uh, you're not doing that. Uh, it's not easy, but I think it's worth it. It's worthwhile effort, uh, so I congratulate you. Cool. Thank you very much. And <laughs> I assume coffee break is just over there. So, cool. Yes, I think this was very useful. Well, I know. Uh, I, uh, it's really. You are carrying this uh, remarkably well. I mean, really, you, the team, you know, it's, it, and, and the, I thought it was wonderful that Proust was here yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, I think that this uh, Sessi Pro, Sessi PR, Sales Pro balance, uh, it's behind the scenes, but, uh, I hope, I, I mean, I hope I'm not misguided. I think it really, I mean, I, I think it seems to be a strength. Yeah, no, I think, I, no. It's, it's, this is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's balanced, as you say, that's yeah. very important. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a pity that, uh, that Charles isn't here. Yes, uh, yes. I mean, he yeah. is really the one who... You bet, uh, you bet, uh, yeah. Brought yeah. No, I wanted to mention to him, actually, Charles, first two managing editors were Charles and David. Right. Yeah. Um, yes. So he is there as long as you are, actually. It's yes, absolutely. Fantastic. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Good. Very nice. Well, listen, that was... Uh, I'm going to slip out because okay. I have various things I have to take care of. But Kai, it's wonderful to see you. Likewise. I think last time only virtually, this yeah. time real. That's and, very nice. And you haven't changed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's very polite. <laughs> so, keep it up. Okay. Oops. Oh.
petit machin là, t'as ça. Et en fait, ils vont t'envoyer le truc là. À droite, ça, ça avance, ouais, c'est ça Ouais, je suppose. Je sais pas, ouais. Okay, thank you for inviting me. So this, so this paper is a joint paper with uh, Nicolas Navarrete, which is uh, who is uh, uh, at City University and who was a uh, Uh, postdoc at uh, Paris School of Economics when we wrote the, the, the paper. It's about, uh, uh, it's an evaluation of the, of the ban on Islamic veils that took place in French school in the, in the 90s. So, uh, as you know, uh, rising immigration from Muslim countries is creating uh, very strong political tensions in, in Europe. Uh, many people believe that uh, the, the, the rise in mis Muslim communities in In, in, in city suburbs uh, uh, represent a threat for, for, for Western value, for Western civilizations. And uh, in this context, you also know that uh, uh, many countries have uh, started to, to, uh, to have started to restrict the, the wearing of clothes that, 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 that hide, the, that hide the, the face of people in public space. So in Belgium, in Norway, in Denmark, in some uh, uh, German regions too. So the legal ju justification is in general that uh, uh, the public space uh, should be neutral, that you, do, that you should uh, be able to see the face of people in the public space. But of course, there is a deeper, a deeper debate behind that uh, between uh, those who argue that uh, it is uh, such policies are necessary to, to counter the, the influence of, uh, of extremists, of, uh, of extremist religious group in, 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 our, in, in Western suburbs, and uh, those who argue, who argue that uh, these policies uh, represent uh, new uh, symbolic violence against the Muslim group and, and uh, limits and attacks against the, the freedom of, of religion. So the, the ban I'm, I'm going to talk about is kind of a pre precursory policy that took place in France in basically two steps. So the, 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 first, the first fundamental step was in 94, when, the, when François Béroux, the, the, the Ministry of Education at that time, uh, issued a, a circular, a ministry circular, where he officially asked a school principal in France to, to ban uh, non-discrete, uh, let's say, this way, non-discrete religious symbol, religious sign in school. Uh, the reason he, 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 he argues that, uh, the circular argued that, uh, that uh, such uh, non-discrete signs were a such act of proselytism and were uh, a such hurting the neutrality of the school space 
And also, he, he also argued that in uh, some cases, there were uh, obstacles to, to the good running of classes, sport classes or technology classes. Uh, so that was the first step. This, in some sense, this, uh, this, uh, this first uh, policy was kind of success. If you, uh, if you look at the numbers produced by the minister, the reports produced by, by the Ministry of Education, the number of uh, veiled students in French school, which was not that high before the circular, uh, let's say about 1%, a little more than 1% of Muslim girls were, were uh, wearing uh, some kind of veils, a veil, and after that, some years after the circular, we were at about uh, uh, four to five uh, hundred. So it was not big number before, but uh, we, we, we see, at least if we believe the, the report of the French uh, Ministry of Education, we see a sharp decrease. So this was the first step. One issue with the circular is that the implement, uh, he, uh, something important, he also appointed mediators to help implement the circular in school, to help uh, discuss, uh, to help the pedagogic team to to, to interact with uh, families uh, who were asking questions and were not uh, always uh, fully aware of, of, of what to do. Uh, one issue with the ministry circular, it, it, has, not the, it has not the same strength of, uh, as a law, so it's very much uh, on, uh, on teacher's shoulder to, to implement it, to inform at the beginning of each school year, parents and so on. So many teachers were asking for something stronger, for, for, they were asking for a law, and after, uh, I, I will not go into the detail in my presentation, after, after several debates, after several official committees uh, uh, giving uh, reports, um, uh, a law was uh, eventually uh, passed uh, in 2004, which uh, definitively uh, uh, banned something that everybody uh, is supposed to know now, uh, irrespective of the information received from school, uh, that ban uh, non-discrete uh, uh, religious symbol in a uh, in, uh, French school. So our research question will be to assess, to try to evaluate the extent to which uh, the impact of this, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, uh, two-step regulation on, on, uh, on, uh, on female, uh, on, on Muslim group uh, female students. So in theory, I, I will not write a, a big model, but in theory, the ban has at least two, uh, two immediate effects. Uh, it forces, uh, it forces the veil student to remove their veil and their veils, and it removes the pressure on unveiled student to justify uh, their choice not to wear the veil. For those who are under pressure in their family and who choose not to wear the veil, if there is a law or, 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 or is there a, a regulation for, which forbids the veil, it's, it's easier if they have, they have not to justify themselves anymore. So this is the two first immediate effect. So at the end of the day, the effects on, on school trajectories can be positive, they can be negative also. They can be, of course, negative for those uh, who, are, who, who are happy with the veil, who, who, are really, uh, who really want to, to wear the veil and are forced to, to remove it. But it can be positive, of course, for those who wear the veil, but uh, are forced to wear the, to wear the veil, are unhappy with that. And it can be also positive for those who don't wear the veil, but are under pressure at home or in the neighborhood to, uh, to wear the veil because uh, it removes them to, from the pressure of, of having to, to justify themselves. So it's, so it's, it's basically, uh, there is no strong prediction. It's basically an empirical case, question uh, uh, about what, what effect is uh, dominating. At the, start of the, at the start of the project, I was thinking that the, the outcome of, of, of our evaluation would be a zero effect, in fact. Um, so the data that we are using are, are mainly data coming from the, the labor force surveys, French labor force survey. So we use uh, the full set uh, of uh, surveys conducted between 2005 and 2019. So you have in this survey the, the usual uh, labor force survey information. Something interesting that we have uh, since uh, 2005 is the, the nationality of, uh, of the parents and the nationality in particular of the father. Uh, the Muslim faith is, uh, is transmitted mainly by the father. So we don't have uh, the religious affiliation of, 
of, uh, of the parents, of the family in which the, 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 the student is, but we can construct a proxy using this uh, nationality information. So in the following, what I call the Muslim group is the group of, of people whose father's nationality at birth is from a country where we know that there is a majority of Muslim, where, 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 where at least 50% of the population is, uh, is Muslim. So it includes mainly Maghreb. Uh, Maghreb is the, is the main uh, country of origin in France that can be called uh, Muslim. We have also Middle East, and it is mainly Turk, Turkish, uh, Turkish families in the French context. And we also include uh, non-Maghreb African country. You have in France both uh, African countries that are not, not really uh, Muslim. You have uh, others that are mainly Muslim. On average, it gives something like 50% of Muslim. And we have checked that our results are, are robust to using or not, to including or not uh, the non-African, the non-Maghreb uh, African country uh, in our definition in our in our definition of, of the Muslim. So what we did, some, so what we did to check that we that our proxy was not that bad, we use a, 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 um, an auxiliary survey conducted by the by the French Statistical Office and the. The, the French Demographic Studies uh, uh, Institute, which is the trajectory and origin uh, survey, in which you have the information on both the faith of the parents and on the nationality of the parents. So we check with this auxiliary uh, survey that uh, about 85% uh, of our Muslim group people were actually people where uh, the father is, is, is Muslim. Whereas in the non-Muslim, in our non-Muslim group, only one percent of the of the of the of the people had a, a Muslim father. So one percent versus 85 percent, it's a, we 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 think it's a it's a good proxy. Uh, so in the end, the working sample we, I'm going to to work on is the is the sample of individuals who are born born in France. We want them to to go to to have been in in school in France. We are going to focus on those age 21 or more, just to be sure that they have finished high school. Uh, but the results are, are robust to using more uh, are sharper threshold, older people. Um, and it gives us a sample uh, with about 10,000 observations per cohort, um, uh, about which 7% are from our Muslim group which matches what we know from the Demographic uh, uh, Institute. Um, so basically, what the, the basic stuff we are, we are doing is comparing uh, the across cohorts, across birth cohorts, the trajectory of uh, Muslim group uh, women and, and, and non-Muslim group women before and after uh, the, uh, the circular to start with. So, here, the, the, the red line is showing you the, uh, the evolution across cohort of the proportion of high school graduates. It's uh, our main educational outcome, but we have used, we, it's robust to using a more, uh, more comprehensive uh, measure of, uh, of educational attainment. So this is the, 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 rate, the red line is for, for the, for the non-Muslim group. The green line is for the Muslim group. So, and the vertical line is, is represent the, the, the limits of the before and after the, 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 the vote of the circular. So what we see is that before the, before the circular, that is for cohorts who left middle school uh, after the, uh, before the circular, who, who didn't, did, who, who, who reached puberty before the circular, we have a gap, an important gap, an hein, educational gap between Muslim and non-Muslim group, it is not surprising, which fluctuates between 10 and, and 15 percent, but with no, uh, with no trend, that is to say it's about 15 percent in the early 70s and about 15 percent in the late 70s. It's difficult to, I will show you more, more specific tests, there is no trends in this gap across this pre-circular reform. And the gap is huge, it's about 15 percent point. When you look on the right-hand side of the graph, uh, cohorts who, who enter middle school after the circular, who spent their, 
the whole middle school years in after the circular. Then, then you, what you see is again something which is not trended. The gap is not trended either, but the gap is much lower. Let's say it fluctuates between 5 and 10 percent, and the, the average is about 7 uh, percent. And all the action, all the narrowing of the gap between the pre-reform and the post-reform uh, post uh, cohorts happen between, uh, for these uh, in-between uh, cohorts, who are cohorts who, for which a fraction of middle, of, of middle school years have been spent in middle school uh, after, after the circular. And the, and the progressive narrowing is, con, is in line with the idea that the more years you have spent in middle school after the circular, which I interpret as the, la the larger the fraction of the courts who has been, who, who was, who reached puberty and the age of the, of, the of the wearing of the veil after the circular, uh, the larger disproportion, the, the narrower the, the gap. So, so this is about the, this is using the same information, but this is plotting the estimated uh, gap for each cohort using a full set of controls, and it replicates what, I, what, I, what I've just said, that is to say, the, compare with the, the, the reference is the gap observed in the late uh, 70s. So you, you have a gap which is fluctuating uh, uh, near this level uh, for the pre-circular pre, uh, pre, uh, pre uh, cohort, and then you have this increase in the gap for the in-between cohorts, and then the gap stabilizes uh, and the relative level of education of the Muslim group uh, is about uh, between five and 10 percent points higher. Uh, five minutes left? Okay. So uh, we can do the same stuff with the 2004 law. So it's about the same story, let's say, but the effect is, uh, is less important. That's to say we, you have this uh, pre-law uh, pre-low gap, which is about uh, 5 to 10 uh, percentage points. Then there is a narrowing of the gap, and the gap is uh, fluctuating at a, at a lower level after the, after the low. So we have, we have something attenuated for the 2004 low in compa compared to the, to the uh, 94 steps. Okay. So this is the, the same thing with the, with the estimated gap. So to test the robustness of this graphical result and to explore heterogeneous effect, we have, we have developed several, uh, several re regression models using uh, several possible uh, specification. Our preferred specification is this one, where you regress outcomes on uh, nation nationality of the father's dummies and, in and in, uh, uh, time the cohort dummies and an interaction between the Muslim group dummy and a treatment dummy, a dosage of treatment dummy, which is a variable which uh, uh, capture the fraction of your middle school years that you have spent in middle school after the circular, if, for the circular, and after the law for, uh, for the law. So when, when, you did, when you do that type of, of regression, sorry, uh, doesn't work anymore. Okay. I drop, so, so I, can you, can you go back for one slide? Okay, for the 94 circular, we, we end up with the same evaluation uh, as, uh, as that, that I emphasized before. Let's say uh, the Muslim cross-dosage cross -dosage, uh, variable capture 8% reduction in the gap in the in the high school graduation gap or in the education attainment gap after the circular what when you do that for the for, for men which we we have also replicated the graphical analysis for men as expected we find no effect let's say the, the same the same specification applied to the sample of men did not show any uh, any reduction in the gap for, for men after the after the circular uh, for the low we have uh, uh, we have a, a twice uh, lower effect and no effect for women and, and no effect for, for, for men either, so all is okay. So what we did uh, with, um, um, with, the, with this model, we also explore heterogeneous effects. So the, 
what we find is that, uh, as expected, when we, when we replicate this analysis for the different group, for the different subgroup of Muslim families, uh, we obtain larger effects for those that are more Muslim. Uh, as I said before, uh, Maghreb and, and Turkish uh, groups are much more Muslim in terms of prevalence of the, of the Muslim faith than the uh, non-Maghreb uh, uh, African country. And uh, when we replicate the, the, the regression analysis on the different subgroups, we find uh, twice higher uh, effects for, for the more Muslim groups. It's OK. We also find bigger effects on families that can be expected to be more religious. So we, we, we proxy the, the religiosity by using the information on, on, the, on, the, on whether the, the mother was uh, working or not, was out of the labor market or, or not. With the TO survey, we check that uh, uh, religiosity was indeed higher for families where, where, where the mother was not on the la labor market. And we, and we find stronger effect for this family in line with the idea that the the, the remove the, the relief of the of the pressure of work, of, of of the veil was was stronger in that kind of, of families. Uh, we also look at longer term effect. We look at what happened at at years thirty, and one one of the most interesting effects that we find in the longer run is that we we, we find that the circular coincides with a rise a very significant rise in mixed marriage for uh, for the Muslim group women. Uh, the, the, uh, the raw numbers are quite uh, impressive. There is a, at that, at the, at the, for, for court, before, when you look at court just before and just after the circular, you have a multiplication by two of mixed marriage. So this is consistent with the fact that uh, more education has, has, helped, has helped these uh, students to, have, uh, to improve that, their, pro, their pro social uh, networks. Okay, right. Right. okay, I will conclude now. Uh, so, um, uh, I will conclude now. So, there is many possible uh, candidates for explaining our result, out migration, private school, do they have, do, are, we, are, we, are we in fact uh, identifying the effect of private education? So, we checked that it was not the case. Uh, there, what, I, what, what I can say to, to conclude, there is, in the paper, we also uh, replicate a recent paper that look at the effect of the 2004 law um, for uh, using almost the same data as we do, except that they use only half of the labor force survey that we use. So when we replicate their, their analysis of the, and they find the negative effect of the 2004 law, when we replicate their analysis with the full set of available data, uh, we find zero effect. Uh, we interpret the difference uh, using sampling variability, uh, their samples are actually very, very, very small, uh, sampling variability uh, issues. Why do we find a small positive effect and why do their specification show a positive effect? Uh, their specification is rather different that, that, than ours. They, they look at the, they compare cohort who reach the age 18 and 19 before and after the law. And what we believe is that uh, uh, most uh, people in, uh, in France are still in school at, uh, when they are 19 years old, so there is no big reason to, to think that they have been really more exposed or less exposed to the law, to the law after the 2004, for, uh, after, the, uh, after the age of uh, 18. So uh, I could come back to this issue if you want uh, afterwards. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Eric. Now. So we have two discussions on online. So Giacomo, Giacomo Di Giorgi from the University of Geneva. Are you, do you listen, do you hear us? Yeah, I'm alive, barely. Good. Now we see you. So. Yes, minimal standard, yes. Cool, so let me just share the slides, I guess. Uh, let's try the PDF version, see where this works better. Okay, I think I'm gonna go for these ones. I guess you can see them, I can see that you can see them, so I'm just gonna jump in. Is that okay? 
Okay. Cool. So thanks so much for you know giving me the opportunity to read the paper, go through it. Sorry, I'm gonna be there. I brought a little bit of the Swiss mountains in the pictures. Um, I'm gonna blame my illness if I just say something completely crazy. So that's you know just pencil that to some post-COVID things. So this is actually a you know first thing that you wanna do I guess in such a panel is to understand whether you know summarize the paper and whether the paper is important. So what I did was I just asked Google. Uh, you know, and Google tell me that this seems to be a big deal today. Uh, apparently, it's coming back uh, in many dimensions. Even with more reputable journals, like I guess is the, the FT, the other ones, I don't know what they were, but Google gave me that as a first search. And in other countries too. So, you know, first thing first, this is an important question. Now, um, what is the summary that I can find? Uh, to me is that uh, there's a, a positive effect. Let me say 10%. Actually, I have some issues on the dosage model and other stuff. We'll talk about that, I guess, quickly. Uh, I prefer the sharper thing. So let's say it's about 10%. Um, the identification is essentially in this type of design is actually fairly standard. Uh, it's a core difference in differences. Now, if you add the dosage model, it's actually slightly different than that, but it's, that's, that's what it is. Uh, and, you know, in principle, we could do triple differences with gender, which, I, by the way, would be my preferred specification there. What um, I'm going to talk about, I guess, in this next uh, seven, eight minutes or so, I'm going to try to sort of go to mechanisms. Um, and I think that's where the important stuff could be. So I'm going to skip ahead a bunch of slides uh, and, and try to sort of get here. And then maybe we go back if there is time, otherwise I can share the slides with the, you know, the others and, and you know, whatever it is. So is there any suggested mechanism? So the, the paper has a, a tiny toy model. Uh, I, I, yeah, uh, so we'll, I think I'll, give, I'll go back to that a little bit. But. So my answer is that one of the things that the others believe to be true is the reduction in conflict uh, one way or another is within the household or within the neighborhood. Uh, unfortunately, there's no real test for this in the data or in the paper, actually. Maybe it's possible to go a little bit more direct into this and just take some part of the model to the data. Um, you know, maybe there are time use surveys in France, I honestly don't know. Um, and maybe there are other ways which I'm going to be suggesting. Maybe there's other ways to think about this. Uh, you know, it's true that on the one hand, conflicts may be reduced because you know, now there is a choice to be made, but on the other end, as uh, Eric said at the beginning, uh, you know, this actually could be going the other way around. So it could be that, you know, conflict is actually not reduced within the household, it's actually increased because now you have, uh, you know, you can just redefine it over because someone else in the state tells you that you don't have to wear the veil and uh, that's what happens. Is there a loss of social identity? Um, now, Another story could be an assimilation direct, you know, it's just an assimilation story. It's basically, you don't look different. There's no signal of, of differences now um, for the previously veiled women or the to be veiled women. Um, so I think this is sort of easier maybe to check because I'm guessing you can find occupational distribution data um, in the labor force survey. Uh, I'm not a huge expert on that, by the way, in French data, but. Uh, um, so maybe it's one of the countries I've never really worked with. So, um, but I'm guessing the occupational distribution is not that hard to find and the simulation would actually lead towards something like that. But there are the measures of simulations that people could uh, easily, I think, get at. Age and marriage, number, spacing, first born kid, the, you know, the year when the first born. Residential choices, I guess it's an important one in two dimensions. One is where do you end up living? But the other one is, you know, if the neighborhood is what is constraining you, as an unveiled, to remain unveiled, then, you know, looking at that heterogeneity could actually be quite important. I'm guessing that there's a lot to do with neighborhood segregation in France, as far as I understand the, 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 the geography of uh, the major French cities. Uh, children first names have been used quite a bit in this assimilation literature. Uh, you know, you probably all know the work of Rans and co-authors. Um, so, you know, this some stuff that can be done, I think, on the assimilation side. I'm, I'm not sure it's actually the story, by the way. What I'm sort of sure is not the story is uh, the one when you look at, at the average population in mechanism. So this is the next slide. So I took page 29. Um, again, you know, I wasn't very, very, very um, 
precise on this, but let's say page 29 sort of suggests what uh, was actually said by uh, Erika at the beginning is, uh, is about 1% of veiled women in cohorts from fathers who are actually of national DD, that is uh, Muslim nationality. So this basically means there are very, 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 very few women in the data who are veiled, like very, very, very few. Uh, if you just do the calculation, I mean, I took the table, I just did the, did the calculation without using a calculator. So I did it by on my head and I guess, I think I'm sort of potentially right. Uh, but the effect that you get basically, and I'm using again, this 10% or 7.2 percentage point effects in table one comes out of the unveiled women. It can't, it, it just cannot in the data come out of the, of the veiled women. Now, of course, you know, this, you're identifying difference and differences and it's, you know, part of it is flat for the non-Muslims that the part is increasing and maybe I might go back to that. But essentially if I, what I did is somewhat close to be correct, the effect comes entirely from the unveiled women. So therefore this is a different story to the first one I actually had in mind, which was more the direct story. And you know, it was actually, you know, this, this idea of maybe it's actually not that those who are unveiled now become, sorry, those who are veiled now uh, can be unveiled, but it's actually that uh, those who are unveiled are really fighting, are really struggling for staying unveiled and staying in schools. And that's what really is driving everything. So that might be the total of the story, but that points towards a test that is basically neighborhood level. You know, maybe, you know, maybe you have some sort of prevalence of people within a neighborhood. Uh, I don't know with the order level for sure, but I'm guessing there's some persistence in where people live. And so maybe census can help you doing that. Uh, uh, but maybe that's, that's the direction. Now, why, why do I think is the part of the story the most important part? Well, first, it's an economic policy panel discussion, so we might want to understand what's the story. Uh, this was, uh, you know, in 1994, I was a very, very, very young high school student. That's not true, but, uh, and you know, I remember that even my partner maybe remembers this, maybe also Barbara remembers this. Uh, you know, we were actually demonstrating in schools in Italy for this thing. Um, so, you know, it seems like to be a very important issue. And so figuring out what is actually that changes, uh, to me, it's, it's important. Um, as I said, I don't know how many veiled students there are today, but that doesn't seem to be the channel in any case, even within this, uh, within the, 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 the paper to, of today. So what is the actual policy that we're doing? And what is the actual policy that one maybe can learn about? Uh, I think we need to look deeper. The only thing that I can come up with is this idea of neighborhoods and see whether, given that, it seems to me that the results are coming mostly from that side of the story, so the unveiled, so the ones who are resisting being veiled. Then I'm guessing that if the story is the neighbor pulling pressure or whatever, or the family and so on, that's where we should look into. Um, yeah, this is basically um, boring feedback. I'm not gonna give it uh, because it's boring. Um, now, one thing that I may be more on the technical tedious stuff, um, if I have still some minutes, I don't know how many, how long I have, I'm assuming I have a minute or two. Um, so it, it is true that, you know, when you estimate difference in differences, of course you estimate differences in differences. So, you know, you, you shouldn't make a, long, a big story about one of the two things. To me, the, the, the green thing seems to be following a secular trend, but it seems to be not very much changed by the policy. And what is happening is basically says reaching out to where the level of, let's say, maxing out of the non-Muslim uh, graduation rates, um, and for that, you know, the triple difference seems to be reasonable here because although the effects are not significant, the male trends are actually not that different. And so that is a way to actually take into account that cellular trend. So this is, you know, I mean, if you test these things, actually identical to the women. Uh, and so I would actually go straight to the triple differences, but, but you know, the other part that maybe it's interesting to me is I don't, it's hard for me to figure out why there are no labor market returns. And I don't think sample size is the issue. Uh, in fact, actually, you can expand sample size very easily because we sort of know how experience and labor market progress evolve. It's a quadratic, quadratic form, so you can actually account for that. If you're worried about you know, people not being old enough, uh, it, it's actually not that difficult to do, do that for you know, income and stuff. So. Yeah, so I, I, it's, it's hard for me to understand how is it possible to get like higher graduation rates, et cetera, et cetera, but essentially no effects in the labor market or if anything, actually negative effect in the labor market. Um, there's one thing that sort of 
in, in the testing for heterogeneous effects, uh, I didn't see in the table, it's actually a test. These are actually split regressions most of the times, and there is no test for the differences. So, I mean, you know, if you take results for men and women, actually the main results, I don't think they're very different, by the way, in statistical terms. Uh, uh, and, and so there's no test. So I, I, at a minimum, I would do that. I'm going to conclude here. I don't know whether I have time left. Uh, there are some other boring stuff that I can talk about. But, uh, mostly, you, you, you know, it's the mechanism what worries me. You have one minute. Yeah, I think I'm, uh, I'm good. I, I think Paula has more interesting things to say. Okay, so, so, Paolo, the floor is yours. Yes. I guess oh. I, maybe I need to unshare or you can do it directly. Uh, let me see if I can. Well, I can stop sharing, so I sorted that. Oh, yeah, you need to, you need to. I, I, did, did, I, did, I, did, I did stop, so you should be able now. Okay, can you see my slides? Yeah. It's fine. Maybe better like this. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot and sorry uh, for uh, uh, not being able to make it in prison. So I, I cannot invoke COVID like uh, Barbara or Giacomo, but uh, just conflict, conflicts with my teaching schedule this afternoon. So sorry about that. Um, I agree with, with Giacomo. I mean, it's a very important paper on a very important issue, although I, I don't remember protesting about that when I was in high school, but I, I think maybe I was not very engaged in high school in, in these things, and that's my bad. But uh, again, so just the third summary of the paper in a row, so maybe I, I'm going quick on this. So uh, uh, the paper is about the effect of banning the Islamic veil on educational attainment. So it focuses on uh, two policy experiments. So the first one was uh, Ministerial Circular, 1994, which is carefully explained what it is in the paper, and then a 2004 law. And the main result is that there is an increase in educational attainment for Muslim female students relative to non-Muslim female students. Again, it's true we don't really, we cannot really measure the religion, but we just infer that from the uh, the father's country of origin, and, and I think it's okay. And what is kind of very convincing to me is that we don't detect the same differential effect on males. So I also thought a bit about the point that Giacomo made about the secular trends that you can see uh, the same secular trends for males and females. But as you also mentioned before, once you go for a diff in diff, you should kind of trust that, uh, you know, the, the, the common shocks, they are captured by the control group. Uh, and therefore, I mean, you should just interpret the, the difference in difference and not just the level. So, um, and then some qualifications, the effect of the 2004 reform is much weaker or, or absent, uh, depending on the specification. And something that it's, I think, relevant to discuss is that the effect is limited uh, to females that are exposed in, in middle schools, but there's no effect for female students that were exposed later on when they were already in high school, and I will get back to this. There are also positive effects on intermarriages and number of children, while no effects on labor market outcomes. I was also a bit puzzled, like Jacob, about this uh, when I first saw it, but I think the explanation that is provided in the paper, like opposite effect of higher educational attainment uh, against having more children and therefore lower attachment to the labor market, it's kind of plausible. Then, of course, it, it, it's sort of an hypothesis. It, it's not really tested in the paper, but as an exposed explanation, I found it uh, quite plausible. So let me go uh, straight to what I think it could be done to improve a bit the paper, which is already uh, very good, as I said before. So I, I think it to be important to explain better the institutional context. So, uh, of course, the, the description of the schooling system is key for understanding the results and especially for understanding why you have an effect only on female students that are exposed in middle school and not in high school. And just, you know, the, the way the paper is written, it was unclear to me. I don't know if it's just me, but there was some back and forth between uh, you know, the description of the schooling system, the description of the policy, I think it could be explained in, in a much better way and even, you know, 
shorter and, and concise uh, to the point. And then related to this, you kind of detect an effect for a uh, course that were exposed uh, quite early uh, while still in middle schools. Uh, there's no effect on the course uh, that were exposed while in high school. So if you remember the graphs, no effects uh, uh, on the 1979 course and all previous course. Uh, and then, you know, the, you, you, you kind of justify this with, with, with some sentence like this. So we see the lack of the effects for those in high school in 1994 and empirical result that may be the consequence of the bank coming in an age when most of the educational career is already set. Now, like Giacomo, I'm not an expert in, in the French uh, schooling system, but if I were in Italy, I would say that, you know, when you are in high school, it's still a crucial moment for uh, your educational career and later on your working career, right? So we see students that change their educational trajectory, uh, their performance, uh, during the first or second or third year of middle school. I get, I'm not sure that the games are already uh, closed when, when you are a first or second or third year of high school, right? So in particular, you, you mentioned in the 1990s, low achieving middle school students had to go into pre-vocational or vocational education with very few opportunities to find their way back to high school afterwards. So can you show that? Uh, can, is there any way to uh, find in other data the track choice or even in the labor force side? Again, I'm not an expert of the system, uh, neither I'm, I'm an expert on, on the data, but um, can you like identify the type of uh, school degree that, uh, that these workers have and therefore see whether, you know, you should see a, 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 a strong effect on, on, on the track choice, right, as an additional outcome. And I, I think it would be important to justify, again, why you find an effect only for those exposed in, in middle school and, and not in high school. Another uh, main comment, this is, I, I guess, the, my second and last important comment, the comparison with this other paper, right? So uh, the results are very different, so they find a rather quite a strong negative effect. You find sometimes a positive effect, sometimes a null effect, uh, but you should just be explicit, I think, what you think could explain uh, the opposite sign, including, if you believe so, the fact that, I don't know, they did something incorrect with the data or the empirical studies. I mean, that paper is published in, in an important journal, right? So it's a uh, top uh, political science journal. So now we we have two papers uh, in both in important and widely read journals that find different, very different results. It's kind of worrisome, right? So you you talk about the fact that you are, if I remember correctly, at twice as large sample size. Uh, I don't know, I'm skeptical that this can can explain the results, right? So, I mean, one thing is if, if you multiply the, the sample size by 10, I understand you can reverse the size. If, if you double the sample size, it seems hard that you, you're going to find uh, very different results, right? So even to think about, look, I mean, whether you use a 18 years old or 19 years old as a cutoff, I don't know if, if that can really explain the thing. So, yeah, it's just an open question. I didn't really understand uh, where the difference in results come from. Uh, the model, I mean, this is uh, this is our less important comment. This is more a matter of taste. Uh, I think it's very clear that the two competing hypotheses, and as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is more of an empirical issue. So if one or the other one is, is, uh, is what really happens in the data, but I'm not sure we need a model to, to make this hypothesis more explicit. I think it's just uh, in, enough to explain them in, in plain words. Um, and then, okay, I, I found it weird that table B3, which is the first main result that you show and that I like, is actually a simple diff in diff uh, between true course of exposed and not exposed students uh, was uh, relegated to the appendix. And then I, I went to, I mean, I also had access to the referee reports. And so I saw that uh, I think one of the referees asked you to move that table to the appendix. I, I thought that should be the first table 
uh, in, in, in the main, uh, in the main. I mean, not not an appendix table. It should be the the first table of results in in the main body of the paper. But yeah, I don't know. I, I don't want to argue with the with the referee or uh, so. I I will leave this up to you. Uh, but in general, yeah, there are quite a few results that I think are interesting and that are put uh, in the appendix. And and I, I thought this could uh, this was quite a pity. But yeah, uh, in general, I think. The paper is great. It's very important, very relevant, and very well executed. So, thanks a lot. Okay. okay, thank you very much for this very nice discussion. So, we have time for questions before Eric can answer. Gabriel, you want to start? Thank you. Uh, one thing I was wondering, so uh, there is this very uh, impressive increase in attainment of these girls. And the question is, uh, I mean, can you really partly, um, is it partly related to the fact that there was a push in uh, increase in attainment for some groups of the population in France and those who have been pushed are those who were initially at the margin of actually not going to higher education or to high schools. and so. I'm wondering whether you, you, you tried to actually use a kind of smaller control group, but that could be actually maybe a, a control group also of people who were also at the margin, so maybe like other group of uh, second generation immigrants that they are, were not from Muslim countries, so maybe you already did it, or groups of from you know, lower socioeconomic backgrounds, so that you can basically show convincingly that even though there was this trend, the trend was different for the, this group of women than to other groups of women. So, thanks. Okay. Claire, Claire uh, sorry, you want to start? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Nicola Limodi, also from Bocconi University. So, I, uh, one of the mm, key descriptive results that was shown, it was about the trends in education. And what I thought was a, a result of the paper, but I was that basically after the reform, the trend of Muslim graduated actually slowed down quite, quite a lot. So it became a lot less steep. I thought that was a central result of the paper. And, uh, but you know, I must have missed something. I mean, I would be happy to, to hear a comment. And whether there is any information on you know, the alternative education uh, systems that you know, some of these uh, female may have enjoyed, you know, relative to, uh, I don't know if mosques in France have schools. I mean, not madrasa style, as it's, it happens in some, of, in, some, you know, in some Muslim countries, but if there is any information about, you know, what was the alternative uh, system in place. Sorry, Claire. Um, I have a question about the 2004 law. So I actually strongly suspect that it could be uh, a violation of the Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And I think it may have affected the sort of um, motivation and reasoning and enforcement um, uh, by the people who are supposed to enforce it and also the people who get affected by it. And the reason why I believe that it could be a violation of Article 9, which protects religious freedom, is because the statutes of Article 9 protects a public manifestation of the religious belief. And there's also a sort of UK Christian adult version of a lawsuit related to this issue. So there was a, a British employee uh, of a British Airways uh, who was banned. Uh, so all employees of British Airways were um, prohibited from wearing a Christian cross necklace, and uh, the employees of the British Airways actually sued in, in the domestic courts, and they all lost three stages in the domestic um, employment tribunal. And then they appealed to the European court, and they actually won in the European court. And, and it was ruled to be a violation of Article 9 of ICHR. So um, if the people who were in the position to enforce um, this law w were kind of suspicious of this issue or mindful of this issue, and the people who are going to be affected or mindful of this issue, um, and mindful of this backlash of this um, like legal dimension of it, it could have affected 
the, um, the, the teeth of the law. So I was wondering if there was any sort of national level legal um, uh, discussion about that at all, yeah. Is that, is that better? Yes, so Isabelle Mejan from uh, Sciences Po. I uh, also uh, had a question about like the control group, let's uh, call it like this, because in the figure that, the main figure uh, that you showed, we see that for the control group, the, the trend is very smooth, while instead we kind of see uh, some volatility for the, for the treated group. So I was wondering where this volatility comes from. Also because you mentioned that part of the, some of the results are a bit sensitive to which cohort you're uh, including into the sample. So potentially this volatility might matter as well at that point. Roberto. <laughs> Roberto again. So uh, Nicola's comments uh, made me think uh, about the fact that uh, so probably from that moment on, um, that's my, uh, I don't have data uh, clear in mind, but uh, it seems to me that the number of pupils enrolled uh, in private schools increased a lot uh, from that moment on. It can, can this partially explain an effect? So it's a sort of sorting into more into private schools that for any reasons can be more tolerant than, uh, uh, than the public ones. Uh, and so you have, a, and then you have a, a sort of positive effect of the, uh, uh, let me use this French word, the cocooning uh, of the private school uh, toward these guys, uh, towards these, these, uh, these, these young women. That's uh, my question. Okay, I had a related question about uh, your outcome variable, graduation, because there are many different type of uh, graduation, uh, the baccalaureate level in France. So do you observe common trend for different type of graduation? I, I mean, uh, that's it. So, so, so now, er Eric, you, you have like, uh, yes, some time to reply. Okay, so thank you for, for all the comments. I'm not sure I, I understood them perfectly. With respect to the private school uh, issue, of course it, it could be uh, one reason for the improvement if, uh, if these girls had uh, uh, has, has chosen to go to private school and if private school is good for them. So it could be an explanation. So at the time of the circular and even at the time of the law, there were not any Muslim faith school in France. So it was not a possibility for them to, to join a Muslim school. A small share do attend other private schools, including Catholic school. You have a tradition of uh, attending uh, Catholic school by Muslim group uh, women. And with the TO survey, with the survey uh, conducted by the Demographic uh, Study uh, Institute, we have checked that this proportion was, for the Muslim group, was, was the same before and after the ban. So we don't think it's a major uh, mechanism that can have explained the, the, the shift. With respect to the control group, there is, I agree, there is kind of volatility, uh, but it's related to the smaller, uh, if, if, it's, if, it's, if this volatility is stronger for the, for the treated group, if it is because uh, the number of observation is, is, uh, is smaller. So this is why you need uh, to look at uh, really the full set and, uh, and use the full, the, full, uh, the full set of surveys if you don't want to, to really uh, to, to, to re identify clearly triple diff or double diff effects. Uh, we try to uh, use other control group, in particular the, 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 the control group uh, uh, con, um, composed of uh, other uh, migrant background uh, female students. There we, we don't detect any, 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 any change in, in any particular shift at the time of the, of the ban for this, uh, for this other control group. Uh, but again, we are limited in this exploration by the fact that uh, when you look at smaller groups, it becomes more fuzzy. And, uh, but at least in the paper, we have this uh, other control group uh, with uh, other migrant background. 
Um, uh, we, uh, with respect to the uh, educational outcome, what we, we have tried several versions of the, for the educational outcome, and we have one that, what, one that is kind of a continuous measure of uh, where, where, we, where for each level you, you can calculate the number of years that you formally have to spend in school to, to validate in school. And the results are robust to using uh, these, uh, these, uh, these different uh, possible um, uh, measures. Um, uh, with, with respect to the, the comparison with uh, the, the paper by the, by the political scientist, so there is, th there is this issue that they don't use, and I don't know why. We have been in touch with them very early huh, in, the, in the process of uh, before their publication and before at the time of the first uh, working paper. We were in contact, then the contact stopped at some point. Um, so one issue is not simply that they, we, I don't want to be uh, too confronta confrontational, but one issue is that they don't compute, I think, the correct standard deviation for their, uh, for their uh, regression model. They use a cluster their uh, standard deviation with only seven clusters, which is uh, considered as highly problematic. And when you just take robust standard error, you multiply their standard error by two. Most of, uh, large fraction of their effect become non-significant. And, uh, and uh, you look at the paper, look at the new version if you, if you want more detail on this. We, we, we now relatively uh, replicate in depth their paper, and my reading of their, of their result is that uh, they choose, uh, they choose the, with the data that they use, they choose the only uh, specification that can give uh, a negative effect. Uh, we, we played a lot with their specification, with the, with the cutoff cohort, with the way to compute uh, standard deviation, with the size of the sample, and uh, we never end up with any significant effect except for this uh, uh, specific uh, specification. So that's, that's, that's what we believe. Huh? So, so we, believe they, we believe that when we use their specification, we have no effect. If you use the full data, if you use uh, uh, standard, uh, standard errors, and, uh, uh, and in theory, given, and now there is the issue of the specification, what they look is not the age at which people reach uh, puberty and reach the age of wearing the, we the veil, which is the age at which a conflict may arise, they, 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 try, they, they, they propose to look at uh, people depending on whether they have left school or not at the time of the ban. And they consider that age 19 is the age at which you left school because it's adult, adulthood. But you can very easily check in the French data that at 19, 19 years old, the majority of 19 years old are still in school, especially for these cohorts. 19 years old was the normal age to obtain the occupational uh, high school diploma uh, for this cohort. So, uh, so I don't think this, is, uh, this, is, this specification is uh, really designed to capture the effect of this uh, reform. Well, it's, uh, it's explained in, the, in, the, in, the, in an appendix uh, of, uh, of our paper. Uh, it's something we have been very we have been very clear with them. Uh, we started the project uh, at a time uh, we didn't know that they were on the same kind of project. Uh, they were more happy than us to publish their paper, and, uh, and that's it. Um, uh, maybe I missed some question. I, I, I agree with the first referee. With, I don't think he's wrong in arguing that the that the action is mainly for the unveiled students. Uh, that is to say, so this is, uh, uh, this is uh, why we think uh, maybe we have no positive uh, argument in favor of some mechanism, but we think that it excludes some mechanism that are often in the public debate. To say the public debate is really about, uh, uh, on the negative side, uh, is really about uh, the ban having uh, uh, driven uh, uh, many uh, veil students to drop out from school. In fact, veil students were, were not, the share of veil students were very small. The share of students that were actually excluded 
uh, from school at the time of the ban was even smaller. We are talking about uh, 150 people excluded. In France, when you are excluded from school, you can still have access to free distance education, so it's not complete, uh, complete uh, exclusion. So uh, we believe that these numbers uh, go in the direction that the potential negative effect, at least for this fraction of the population, cannot have been that big. I agree with this uh, assessment. So I take the comment from uh, the referee, uh, from the, yes, the table, I agree that table one was uh, pretty cool, but it was uh, the referee asked to, to drop it, and uh, the referee asked to keep the model, if I remember correctly, so uh, I would be happy to drop the model and uh, to keep table one. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if I miss some, uh, some big comments. Um, uh, yes, I agree that, of course, we would like to dig uh, deeper into the mechanism, but uh, the, data, the data are not, uh, we have tried to do that. Uh, we, yes, there is, a, there is a, an important comment. Why do we observe no effect on, on, uh, on, a, on a labor market outcome? Uh, my interpretation is that we have more marriage for this Muslim group, more essentially more because of an increase in mixed marriage. You have more marriage because more mixed marriage. And uh, so you have also more children for these at, at age 30, between age 30 and 33. And so we interpret the lack of effect on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on labor market outcome and the small negative marginally significant effect, if I remember correctly, on, on labor market participation as the uh, as the joint opposite effect of uh, having more children and uh, being more educated. Thank you. Thank you. I think there is, thank you, Eric. There is a question by Giacomo online. Giacomo? Yeah, just a little point. I, I actually, I don't think you can estimate the negative effect on veiled women. There's basically no, none in your data. That's the point I'm trying to make. If you just look at the proportion, the conditional mean function you're going to be estimating are going to have basically zero of those women. So it's not a huge deal in a sense because I think the effect is coming from the other end in any case. It cannot come. Just, just mathematically, it cannot come there. But the problem is that the negative side of things, unfortunately, in the data, there are too few to be able to say something about that. Um, but you know, at least that, that was my lazy calculation of the thing. So I might be completely off there. But I would actually then correct page 29 because that's what page 29 says. You mean um, that you mean that the effect could have been very negative for this small fraction? This is what you no, mean? no, we don't. I mean, this, essentially, we don't know. That's what I okay. mean. Okay, well, I agree with that. Just by well, what, draw, what I'm, but, what I'm yeah. saying is that um, on a, the, 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 the overall effect is bound to be very small given their small numbers. This is what I'm saying. And I, I don't disagree on that. What I'm saying is that we don't know whether for that class of women, the negative effect can be actually huge. It can actually be 100%. It's just they're not in the data. They're just, in, in, just quantitative. They're not in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the labor force survey that you're using, given the proportions. Okay. Um, and so it's hard to know that, uh, basically. I'm you know, just making like a, um, yeah. So that, that was the point, uh, yeah. That, but you know, this doesn't, I, I don't, you know, whatever it is, the effect is coming for sure from the unveil, already unveiled women. I mean, it, it has to come from there, no matter what. Um, yeah. So, so, but the other side is hard to say because unfortunately there were so few in the in the, in in the population. So that once you get into the you know into the sampling framework, so I actually read the sampling framework for the level four survey. It, you can't you can't have men in there. Like it's like three or four per court. So. And you don't know whether you're actually capturing them because you know it's, it's obviously mismeasured because it's not you don't know whether they actually were wore the veil before. That's not revealed there, so it's you know an expectation some of them will. Um, yeah, that that that's that. Okay, thank you, Eric. You want to comment on the fact that the effect come from the unveiled one? No, no, no not anymore. Okay. Uh, Barbara now has a question. Baba. Sorry, Pierre, if I could add something very briefly. So perhaps one could have a slightly more nuanced view of the potential negative effects, if any. So I, I completely agree with what Georgia says. Giacomo says, I'm sorry, that we really have to... 
that we really have to re realize that the veil population is very small. So it's very important to understand what is the group dynamics involving the non veil population. So negative effects may not just be generated among the veil population. It could be that even the non veil population might feel sort of alienated by the ban and sort of might might be less likely to identify with the school culture. So I don't think that we would be bound to estimate zero negative effects, even if they're there. So I, I think um, it, it would be probably interesting to dig a little bit deeper in possible group dynamics. So there is a little bit in the literature, for example, on team decision and the composition of teams and what happened with the introduction of gender quotas in board, that even people who were not women actually changed their behavior. So perhaps it would be useful to expand a little bit on that kind of dynamics. Thank you. Okay. One word for the about the unveiled the the team of um, the, the the topic of uh, unveiled students being under pressure uh, was really a recurrent theme uh, in the in the report written. Uh, uh, by the Commission Stasi, for instance, uh, by uh, by the mediator that has been appointed for this, uh, for for, uh, for for helping a pedagogical team uh, to uh, to to interact with families. There was there, in all these uh, qualitative reports, you have this notion that many uh, unveiled students are suffering, are even traumatized by uh, being under pressure. Uh, in order to, to, to wear the veil. So, so we are at least backed by, by that kind of, uh, of literature. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, cool. wow. <laughs> and uh, now it's time for lunch. It is in the next room. We have uh, about one hour.
1, 2, test.
Hello, everyone. It's time to start. OK, so we are very happy to listen to Jean-Benoit uh, from Banque de France. So Jean-Benoit, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pierre. Maybe I should wait for my slides. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. So it's a pleasure being here today presenting that paper. So it's a paper that uh, I, uh, I wrote with Paul Vertier, that is uh, our boss, Sens Poliep, and I'm at Banque de France. And we started this paper when we were PhD student at, uh, at Science Po. It's a paper about gender discrimination in uh, French local election. So, I mean, as we all know here, women are really uh, underrepresented in politics. Is something that is uh, that is really known here. So at the time of the natural experiment that I will present in a second, in 2015, when you look at the figure, you see that in OECD countries, only 30 percent, roughly 30 percent of parliamentarians and ministers are women, which is quite striking. And when you start thinking about the reason why there is this underrepresentation of women, like the literature says that there are various complementary explanations. The first one is that women may be less willing to engage into politics, so for personal reasons, uh, for instance, for harder family work trade-offs. Also, women may face higher, political, higher obstacles from political parties once they engage in politics, so there are also a large number of papers about that, that basically political parties send women in uh, areas that are not winnable. And finally, there is also this idea that voters might discriminate against women. Okay? In this paper, we focus on the last hypothesis. So the research question is just super simple. Do voters discriminate against women? And if yes, what are the determinants of this discrimination? Identifying Gender discrimination from voters is something that is extremely challenging. I'm sure you all know that for several reasons. The main one may be that, in fact, we do not observe what people vote in the voting booth. So basically, we do not have access to, to that information. So it's hard to really pin down discrimination. And also, we know that there are a lot of selection uh, effects that take place there, that male and female candidates that run for election are not comparable because, for instance, a woman that entered politics in the 90s was not, as a man that enter, was not the same as a man that entered politics in, in the 90s. So you cannot directly compare the result of male and female candidates to say that there is discrimination. So the main methodologies that have been used so far to study this topic was either to use aggregate votes or, or surveys. The thing is, they are representative, but they are subject to selection bias. So that's not perfect. There are also literature that use laboratory experiments that allows to disentangle the mechanism, but that are hardly representable of, uh, of, uh, of what happens in the real world. So to really study and answer that question, we needed to find a real natural experiment at a large scale that allows us to disentangle all those different mechanisms. The thing that is nice is that we believe that we found such uh, ex natural experiments. It took place in 2015 in France. So in 2050, basically, there was the departmental election. So it's an election where we, uh, elected, where we elected departmental councillors <laughs> for more than 2,000 electoral precincts, so to elect nine, uh, 97 counties <laughs> assemblies. And the thing that is really at the heart of the paper is that for the first time in the history of French election, voters had to vote not for one candidate, but for a binomes of candidates. Okay? And the binomes had to be gender balanced. So it was one male and one female candidate. Here in, in our samples, we are more than 9,000 pairs of candidates. And the thing that is really here, identification strategy, was the fact that 
the order of, of appearance of candidates on the electoral ballot the day of the election was determined by the, alpha, by the alphabetical order. So here, in a nutshell, the thing that we do in the, the rest of the paper is to check whether when you have in your binom a woman in first position, you receive uh, a number of votes that is significantly different than if you had uh, a male in first position. Okay, and I will show you in a minute why this test is, uh, is convincing. So the thing that you, keep it, you have to keep in mind about this election is that the context was a little bit, um, was um, a little bit not strange, but that there was a high level of, uh, of, um, of un uninterest for, this, uh, for this, uh, this election. So people were not interested by, uh, by this election. The participation was extremely low. Basically, it was an abstention rate of 50%. Uh, taken all together, the IFOP, so that is the French uh, polling institute, said that this election were characterized by an insufficient level of information and that the introduction of pairs of candidates, so the reform, created confusion in the, in the minds of, of voters. And also that 25% of voters didn't even know the prerogatives of department councillors. So voters didn't really know what happened during, uh, during this election. This is important to keep in mind and this will explain part of the results that we have in the paper. So here, suppose that you're the day of the election, basically the setting was the following. So you enter the voting booth, you have pairs of candidates, so with a male and, uh, and female for all the different pairs of candidates, and you choose to cast one, uh, one preferred ballot. So as I said, the, alpha, the, the order of the candidates on the ballot was the alphabetical order. So if we had Peter Dupont and Réve Cavanier, so we would have had Peter Dupont first because D goes before V, but if we had Rebecca Bagné instead of Vagné, it would have been it would have been the opposite. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, identifying assumption. So we claim in uh, in our setting that the fact of having a woman in first position was as good as random. So that this is completely exogenous. So. Supposing that means that parties did not manipulate the order of the candidate, namely that some male candidate didn't select uh, a, woman, a woman candidate just because of her surname so as to be first in the, in the ballot. We, we say that it was com completely, uh, com completely exogenous, and it also means that the treatment is absolutely uh, orthogonal to the characteristics of all the candidates. If we assume that, so if we assume the fact that this order is as good as random, then, and that's really the technical point of the paper, under this condition, finding an effect means two things at the same time. First, it means that some voters misunderstood the rule of the election. Why? Because when a binom was elected, the two candidates on the binom received exactly the same prerogative. So there wasn't any logical reason to discriminate if you had a, a, a woman in first position. If you discriminate, it means that you missed the rule of the election, okay? Second thing, it also means that there is a pure gender bias. Why? Because we control for all the selection effect as the, the, the treatment here, the fact of having a woman in first position is, um, is as good as one. So the data that we use in this paper are pretty common. We use a bunch of uh, electoral data from Ministry of Interior. We use data from uh, the census at the local level to, uh, to, uh, to control for local heterogeneity. We also use lots of data on information. And here information will, as you will see, also play an important role. The first data that we use are aggregate data of newspaper circulation at the departmental level, okay, provided by Ponce and Tricot. And we use um, data at the ballot level. So here, the data at the ballot level, to get them, we used one uh, specificity of the French law that says that for, uh, for, for the election on the ballot, you can, but you do not have to, report additional information. But you can do it if you want. So have, we have tried to collect as many ballots as we could. We only could uh, collect 12% uh, of them from different sources, from Science Po, from some department that collected them all, also using Google and Facebook. And we coded from, this, uh, from these ballots additional information, the political experience, 
the occupation, the age, and the, and the photo. And we will use this, uh, this additional information to characterize the type of discrimination that we face in this, uh, in this election. So the overview of the results, what we find is that for right-wing pairs of candidates, there was an important discrimination as they lost between one to two percentage point vote less if they had a woman in first position rather than a man in first position. We do not observe it for left, uh, left parties, extreme left or extreme right. It's only for right-wing candidates. This, uh, this lower share of votes translated into a lower probability of accessing the second round and to lose the election. So it had an impact on the outcome of the election. Second, we show that the level of information available to voters matters. At the aggregate level, we show that discrimination is lower when newspaper circulation is higher. Okay? And at the ballot level, we show that when additional information is provided, discrimination disappears meaning that the kind of discrimination that we face here is of statistical nature. Finally, we show that the missing vote benefited to other candidates. It didn't translate to a higher abstention or a lower turnout. People went voting, just they decided to vote for other candidates. So the, the, the relative literature here, we contribute to three different streams of the literature. The first one that identifies discrimination in the real world settings. This the statistical versus taste-based discrimination debate, and we also contribute to a growing literature that studies the, the ballot order uh, effect. So, in the rest of the paper, we have decided to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to uh, distinguish all the different parties, considering extreme left with communist front gauche, party gauche, left the socialist parties and left-wing coalitions, right UMP at this time and right coalition, and extreme right Le Front National. Yeah. So here, first, uh, first table, the exogeneity of treatment. So basically, I need to convince you that the treatment here is absolutely exogeneous. So the first thing that we did was just to run a test to regress the fact that a binom has a woman in first position and the characteristics of the binom. So here, first column, it's for uh, the whole sample, then for the different subsamples. So we, you, you see that there are some stars here and there, but the joint, uh, joint, uh, jointly significant test says that basically we do, not, uh, we do not explain the fact of having a woman in first position with all the car different characteristics. And if you look at the R square, the pseudo R square, it's, it's, it's super low. Also, as robustness checks, we have run exactly the same test, but with all the variables taken differently, and we, uh, we, uh, we, we have the same, the same conclusion. Also, to be sure that there wasn't any manipulation of treatment by parties, we show that the distribution of letters for male and female candidates were exactly the same. So there wasn't any uh, candidate that decided to pick a woman uh, because of her name to, uh, to, be, to, appear, uh, to, to be first on the, on the electoral ballot. So assuming that uh, the treatment is oxygenous, the fact that we have done here, the model that we have chosen to run is super simple. We just regress the share of votes that you receive on the fact that you have a woman in first position controlling for some characteristics of the binomes and local characteristics, okay? Here to ensure that we, um, that we have, that we, that we, uh, we still, that the SEDVA, uh, the SEDVA assumption holds, we have decided to restrict on uh, precincts where we, uh, where we add only one candidate running for the right, uh, and for all the, different, uh, all the different parties, okay? So why do we expect a stronger effect for, uh, for the right-wing candidates. So before turning to the result, just you can think about this idea, why is it only for right? So you, you will have people saying, okay, so for extreme right, it's a Maris Le Pen effect, etc., and etc. But if you look at the literature, there is this literature that tells you that statistical-based discrimination is fed by uh, the low level of exposure to female candidates. And when you look at the figures, you see that right-wing parties have a structurally low number of female candidates. So those voters, they weren't really exposed to uh, female candidates, and it one hypothesis, it one hypothesis that, that could have led them to, uh, to, to discriminate against, uh, against women. So now, here are the main specification, the results. So panel A, uh, we only control for the numbers of candidates. B, we, have, we add uh, individual controls. C, we interact individual controls. And D, we put all the controls that we can think of. 
And here you have in column the different parties. So you see that for extreme left, left and extreme right, we do not have any, uh, any effect. While for right wing parties, there is, uh, there is a penalty here and the, 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 that binomes with a uh, woman in first position received between minus point, uh, minus point 0.8 percentage point to minus, uh, to one, minus 1.3 percentage point less votes that binomes where uh, a man is in first position. Okay, so here it's robust even when we uh, add the, the standard, uh, the, the standard p-value or when we adjust for multiple testing, namely Bonferroni test, uh, Bonferroni uh, correction or Anderson, Anderson correction. Here on the probability of reaching the second round, it's the it's the same thing. You see that there is a, there is a, still a, a negative a negative effect, and it reduces the probability to access the second round by uh, minus four uh, percentage point. So we have a large number of robustness checks showing that it works. Whatever the samples that we consider, uh, uh, even when we relax the pseudo assumption, even when we restrict to the subsample of incumbent, non-incumbent candidates, meaning that our, our results are not driven by the fact that it's the incumbency status that matters, and when we weight the regression by the size of the precinct uh, and, uh, and, and other things like that. So now, turning to the, the role of information. Here, the first thing that we have decided to do was to say, okay, so we know that there are some departments where the level of information is higher because of newspaper circulation. We check whether it has an impact on, the, on this discriminatory effect. So here you see that we just cross the treatment with the fact that you belong to a top decile newspaper circulation department, and that the effect, whatever the number of controls that we have, tends to disappear. So it means that in those departments, there wasn't, there, there, we, we do not identify this, uh, this negative effect. But, as that's the thing that is important here, we don't know whether it's because people have better understood the rule of the election, that they understood that both guys would receive exactly the same prerogatives, or because they had access to information about the candidates. So we needed to find uh, individual information to, uh, to really answer the question. So the first thing that we have done was just to say, okay, let's consider the incumbency, statue, incumbency status, and incumbent voters should have more information about incumbents. So we, we, we try to see whether when we cross our treatment with the incumbency statue, it has an impact. So here, first column, when we consider all different types of incumbency, second column, only mayors and municipal councillors, third column, departmental councillors, and for this different specification, when you consider only a woman incumbent in the binomes or a man incumbent, no incumbents, or the two incumbents, you see that the, the interaction between the woman first variable and the incumbency status here doesn't show up, meaning that there is no effect per se of incumbency. But, as that's the thing of the paper, if incumbency doesn't play a role per se, when you cross the fact of having a woman in first position with uh, additional information that you get on the electoral ballot, that were political information, that here that you tell the voters that basically you are an incumbent, in that case you see that the effect, is, uh, the, the effect disappears. And whatever the specification, we have that. So it seems that voters enter the voting booth, and when they realize that they had additional information, they have, they have decided not to discriminate. So let's skip that. Finally, on the uh, positive effect of opponents' votes, shares, we showed that there was some vote transfers that took place during this election. So here, the thing that we do is that we run uh, a, specific, uh, a model where we have as dependent variable the aggregate share of votes received by the other parties, and we see whether when you have, when you face a right-wing opponent with a woman in first position, you get higher share of votes. And we see that here when we consider the number of votes ex over the total number of expressed votes, we have a positive effect. When we consider these uh, numbers of votes over the registered voters, we have a positive effect that is a little bit lower because there was a high level of abstention during this election, so that there was some vote transfer. In additional tables in the, in the paper, we show that these vote transfers was uh, targeted toward closer substitute to, uh, to the right-wing candidates. So to sum up the paper, we show that we have right-wing female candidate that suffers from statistical-based discrimination, that information plays a role both at the aggregate level and at the ballot level, and that finally, vote transfers occurs 
towards the other candidates, and in particular those who are uh, ideologically closer. Thank you. Thank you. Perfectly on time. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. So, Emric, it is your time for the discussion now. While, while I wait for the slides to be put up, a small disclaimer. Um, Jean-Benoit was a, student, a PhD student at Sciences Po, so I saw the paper in its very early stage, so I have a particular sympathy for the paper that uh, might taint my, uh, my report, my uh, discussion, if it ever comes up. It was a long time ago, yeah. <laughs> no, not that long. When was it? The first? Okay, so, uh, so I think it's an essential topic that's uh, tackled in this paper, uh, the question of uh, gender um, discrimination in uh, politics. In particular, uh, we all, we've all asked the question, uh, was, uh, was Hillary Clinton not elected because she was a woman? Uh, is there a special discrimination that has, has, has played a role in, in recent elections? So, Given where we are today, uh, we are two days away from uh, a first round uh, of the elections in, uh, in France. So here is the, the 12 candidates, so you might not all be, uh, be aware of these candidates. So there's four uh, women among them. Nathalie Artaud, Anne Hidalgo on the, the, the Socialist Party, Valérie Pécresse from the Republicans, and uh, Marine Le Pen from the uh, far right. Um, and what is, so the first question is, is it, is it uh, so it's quite, it's a reasonable proportion, it's, it's four out of 12. What is the, the tendency in France? So if you look at, uh, at the, the evolution, so this is the number of candidates for all the presidential elections going back to 65. You see that there's been clearly an evolution, but it's sort of stagnated recently. Uh, this, four, uh, this proportion of more or less four out of 12 has, has remained quite constant over time. The only difference is that now, they are, uh, unfortunately, maybe, uh, closer to being uh, in, uh, in positions to be elected. Okay, so they are representing uh, important parties, Les Républicains, Front National, and, and the Parti Socialiste. So there's this evolution, uh, and it's an important question to see whether, uh, where we're going in the future and what's the role exactly of gender in these elections. So, uh, to prepare this uh, discussion, I decided to go back a bit to the literature, given I didn't know much uh, about the topic. So I'll start with a, a small vision of where the paper is placed in that, uh, in that literature. So let's start with the, uh, the, the big literature in political science that is mostly based on uh, experimental surveys, where essentially they give choices to, uh, to uh, participants in these surveys and ask them, would you be ready to, to vote for this woman or this man? Um, and typically, there is quite a number of robust results, uh, in particular, that are represented in this, this very nice meta-study. Uh, and some of these findings, I think, are important for this paper. The first finding is that women tend to have higher support. Uh, it's typically two percentage points in these surveys. Of course, it's partly driven, probably, by, uh, by uh, demand effects uh, and these survey settings. But still, there's this, this advantage for women. But it's much less uh, so for uh, Republicans versus Democrats. So we'll come back to it with this right-wing story. Uh, and the second thing is that there's something that's very uh, standard, which is that marital status and number of children has a big impact on uh, the probability to vote for, for these individuals. And again, I think it connects to the paper. Uh, so if you, uh, for instance, in this paper in uh, APSR, you see that when you offer these choices for, for, uh, for participants, the probability uh, of being elected is very much increasing for both male and female uh, as a function of uh, being married and having children. So at the bottom, uh, forget it if you are male unmarried with no children, and then if it goes up slowly uh, until uh, you have male with married kids and the same for women. And they argue that this is, uh, is a clear disadvantage for women uh, because uh, it's going to be more costly for women uh, to, have, uh, to have kids during, uh, uh, during the electoral periods. And so uh, there's this tendency. And secondly, it's much more pronounced for the Republicans because it's linked to family values that are more prevalent. So it partly explains the, the preference uh, uh, that you can find in Republicans. 
So that's sort of the, 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 the survey-based evidence. And then there's a, a literature that uses actual electoral data. So one part of the literature documents correlations, and there's one very interesting recent uh, paper in, uh, on French data uh, that shows that you know, when you look at the, the, the probability of having a woman, a woman elected, it correlates very strongly with local uh, wage uh, gender gap. Okay, so places where you have more uh, discrimination in the labor market tend to have more discrimination on the, on the political market, which suggests something about preferences. In this paper, they don't find any effect of party affiliation, so we'll go back to this right-wing story. And then there's this large literature on uh, looking mostly at causal effect of uh, gender quotas. But there, the problem is you have a hard time dis disentangling preferences from the choice of, uh, of political parties. Okay? How, do, how do political parties actually select their candidates? And you see that clearly they try to uh, use this strategically. So for instance, the Bagues and Campa paper, they show that quote, when you put in place quotas, it, it mechanically increases the share of women. Uh, but it does not increase the, the probability of women ending up in a leadership position, either as party leaders or as mayors. Okay, so there's strategic positioning within these uh, settings. So essentially, the, the paper comes in in a position where you have different pieces of uh, information, but very little uh, actual causal evidence on, uh, on preferences. And so I think there's a clear uh, positioning and contribution of this paper. Uses a very clean natural experiment. So uh, you could, as, as you showed, the distribution of names is well uh, distributed across, across uh, gender. There doesn't seem, therefore, to be a strategic use by the political parties of putting uh, women with letter A and men with letter W. So there's no strategic use of the, of the last name. And you find clear result. Uh, vote share of the right-wing candidates uh, lower by 1.5 percentage points and uh, less likely to win uh, the, the election if the, the woman is placed first in the, in the ranking. Okay? So, there's two f so what you need to get this result, you need two things. You need a combination of what I call mistake, uh, and I'll come back to what is exactly mistake. So you need voters to make mistakes, and you need discrimination. Okay? At first, you could wonder if it's really discrimination or it's just that it's, it's correlated with incumbency because women are less likely to be incumbents. But the paper clearly shows it's not, it's not about incumbency. It's really uh, the, the, the gender uh, of, the, of the candidate. So what I want to finish my discussion with is to understand the nature of the mistake and understand why it's only uh, right wing. And I think it's the two things where you can still improve the paper because we, we still left a bit in a, in a middle ground. So let's start with the mistake. So what I call mistake is this fact that uh, it shouldn't play a role whether you're first or second, and it does. So you have two, two versions. One is it comes from information. So people are just min misunderstanding the system. Uh, and the second is a salience, a behavioral uh, mechanism of salience that uh, the f being the first choice makes it more salient and, and has therefore a higher impact. Okay, so a, be a behavioral uh, channel. There seems to be evidence that I find in the paper, but I think the authors should do a bit more to, to, to corroborate it. So uh, salience doesn't seem, to be, uh, so, uh, doesn't seem to be playing a big role in the sense that increasing the salience by providing a picture, for instance, or by providing other elements uh, is, uh, uh, that doesn't seem to be uh, playing a role. Okay, so suggest that the salience effect is actually not, not the dominant one. Uh, and the information effect could be playing a role uh, with the uh, evidence you show with the newspapers that in places where you have more newspaper circulation, uh, there tends to be uh, less discrimination. Okay? And through, the paper, through, through being more informed, you might be more informed about the electoral system in general. But again, this is sort of my take from the evidence that's presented, but I think you should, you should present a bit more and, and, and clearly argue which mechanism you think is is, is the one that, uh, that's underlying it. The second thing is why the right wing only? And there I think you seem to be a bit reverse engineering it with your story, uh, that you find this explanation after, after the fact, so you really need to be convincing on that point. And uh, in particular, I think you're a bit exaggerating because we don't know if there's an effect only for right wing, it could be that the other parties, are, the people are better informed 
or are less subject to salience uh, effects, or are discriminating less. You need both of them. So it's not necessarily that the others discriminate less. We could also be better informed. Okay? So that's the first point. Second thing, you use switching behavior. So you look at where people go when they don't vote for the right wing if the woman is first. But you never tell us if they switch to parties where the woman is ranked first. So you need to, to at least convince us that that's, that's, not, uh, that's not happening, that it indeed. Uh, um, and, uh, and finally, I think what you, you, what you would need to do is to link it back to the survey evidence I showed you initially to say, is it, the, is it something about family values? Is it something about uh, ideology of the, of the right wing? And in particular, I think you have information on family composition of these candidates. So does it play a role? Uh, so uh, my, maybe there's information out there. At the very least, you should, you should really dig into the, the why you see it uh, only through right wing. Uh, just to point out, it, it's not a question of multiple hypothesis testing. There's quite a, a number of elements in the paper that reassure us on, on that point. It seems to be really a right wing effect, and you need to explain it uh, probably better. So uh, I think it's an important contribution, uh, well placed in the literature where there's little evidence of really uh, identifying uh, voter preferences. Um, it also shows this, this story about uh, this, the, the fact that, like, independently of gender, the fact that position has an importance uh, it tells us something also about how people vote. Uh, and I really think you should understand better this right-wing bias uh, to, uh, to, to explain it better. And finally, to conclude, uh, it's, I, I hope uh, if we end up in a, in a second round uh, with a certain candidate, I hope we'll have a little gender bias that, that kicks in, uh, in in two weeks. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Amrik. Um, the, the next uh, discussion is by Eric Onang. Eric, are you around? Um, yes. yes. Can you hear me and can you see slides? Yes. We see your slide and so you can start. Great. Awesome. So um, thanks very much for um, allowing me to uh, discuss this, this great paper. Um, and sorry for not being in Paris with you. Uh, I want to start also with a small disclaimer. I'm not very uh, knowledgeable about French electoral system, parties and the, the overall um, setting in which we're kind of based today. Um, so I, I'm probably more like the median voter in your setting, very ignorant about um, the, the information that you actually need to make an informed choice here. Um, so to really briefly summarize um, what I think the paper does and provides is that there's really convincing evidence, in my view at least, for gender biases from, local, from voters in local elections. So that, that I found really convincing also because I think that your natural experiments work relative, works really well. Um, so you really have a setting where the treatment seems to be as good as randomly assigned. And that's a rare case uh, in which um, you provided convincing evidence that it's, that it's working quite well and that there's not much manipulation going on with the treatment. And then you have a clever way of, of, to, of assigning this gender bias to statistical discrimination. Um, and by providing evidence for the fact that this statistical discrimination can be resolved once information is provided. That being said, um, I have um, a couple of minor concerns, I'd say, um, and some suggestions of how to improve the paper um, still a bit, although obviously there's um, already um, several um, referees involved and uh, uh, you, you already did quite well in the revision, I think. <clears throat> so one thing that I found um, surprising a bit is that most of your specifications deal with split sample estimations in the sense that you split your um, estimates by party, um, showing us that the effects only occur for the, um, for the right-wing parties. Split sample estimates are, however, not exactly the same um, as fully interacted models, because obviously we, we kind of assume different models are true for different parties in this case. Um, which, when looking at the results, doesn't necessarily hold true. Um, so I suggest that fully interacted models are preferable 
uh, when you want to show heterogeneous uh, treatment effects, which you actually do. So in the appendix in table 17, you, you show that the um, results are fairly similar when using this fully interacted model, <clears throat> which I suggest should be the main specification actually. Um, for a second reason, because it would allow you to actually add precinct fixed effects. Um, because you can exploit then with, within precinct variation across parties, which we so far haven't done. So this would be much stronger um, control for all the potential um, unobserved heterogeneity that still occurs at the precinct level, uh, where you can uh, potentially avoid more manipulation um, if kind of parties cater to their specific uh, demographic or electorate in, uh, in the precinct. So that would be one suggestion that you have. So far, I haven't seen any specification with precinct fixed effects. Um, second point I want to make is regarding your information results. So your full sample is one where you have approximately 9,000 candidate pairs or binomes um, in your sample. And then you kind of cook this down for the information results to a little more than thousand ballots for which you have information um, on the on the candidates. But eventually you only end up using 166 for the right wing parties <clears throat> where you find that information on experience kind of overrides statistical discrimination and you interpret this to say that female candidates specifically in right wing parties are statistically discriminated discriminated against um, specifically also for their lack of experience because all the other information doesn't seem to play a role. Um, so there's two things regarding that. Um, you, you also show that right-wing parties had less female candidates in earlier elections than other parties, which in my view by definition, in, independent of whether they're incumbents or not, means that they have to nominate less experienced candidates for the ballots in 2015. <clears throat> And um, what you then do is show that there's manipulation, no manipulation of the, the treatment um, regarding the information um, that, that they provide in balance, uh, in, in balance sheets and in, in ballots, because you show a balancedness table based on your uh, more than thousand ballots, which you don't use in your specification when you, when you look only for right-wing parties. So the balancedness table is not very informative of um, the variation that you then later on use when looking only into right-wing parties. Um, so I would suggest either showing the balancedness for the right-wing sample too, so that we know whether there's information provided <clears throat> or not um, for the ballots that you end up using, or as I suggested uh, on the first point, use the uh, um, full sample of ballots for all parties and conduct a fully interactive model analysis on the full sample. Um, because also potentially the results for other parties might provide interesting insights. We don't know that actually. Uh, what happens with these parties when information is provide, provided? Does that, in, in, when, when there's um, no statistical discrimination, does information also uh, improve women's um, outcomes in these um, cases. Okay, so um, maybe a couple of um, suggestions if I may. Um, so one type of information that I might be exposed to as a relatively ignorant voter is when, at least I, when I drive through my neighborhood, um, prior to elections, and I'm not well informed about kind of local elections candidates, and I don't know what platforms they're on, et cetera, is um, electoral posters, right? Um, and this is what everybody can see. They're quite salient, I guess, too. Um, and voters are, are, without acquiring this information, exposed to this information. So I went up on the internet and tried to find a couple of these posters, and um, they seem to be uh, abundantly available um, for a lot for the Front, Front National, that's clear, uh, but you probably may be able um, to find also for, for other parties uh, that are in the right-wing um, category. And I found that they sometimes switch the order of candidates. So I, I brought you here 
um, two electoral posters um, where Jesu or, or Jesu, I don't know exactly, and Judah uh, are switched, uh, even though their um, their alphabetical order with their female candidate would have been different. So they're put here in first place over the female candidate. You might find posters where this exactly the opposite. So I'm not implying that um, this is um, happening more often. <clears throat> I don't know if this is different for, for di different parties too. Uh, I also don't fully understand whether this is done by the Front National because this is um, um, a ticket or a binum where there's another party involved. So there seem to be also kind of um, couples or pairs of candidates where um, you, they are from different parties. This might be a reason for that. I don't know. I don't fully understand this, to be honest. Uh, but it, it would be interesting to me if you kind of can gather this information and look at the uh, electoral posters and see whether changing the order also affects um, the, the outcomes um, of the elections. Because I guess this is an information that's that's more abundantly available even than uh, information on the ballot or not, or the ballot itself. Other suggestions, um, I, I, I want to kind of also emphasize this here. It's I would be interested in understanding better what voters do when um, there's a female candidate put first. Where do you go exactly? So what, what happens, especially also when other binomes feature female candidate first, uh, you cannot switch to that if this is statistical discrimination. Are there examples where there's kind of no way out uh, or are there examples where you have to switch to left voting uh, because all the right wing parties have a female candidate first? Maybe there's um, also interesting findings when you kind of generate placebo here where, where first names are actually non-gender specific or not clearly distinguishable from male names. Maybe you can look into that and see if there's kind of what voters do in this case. And then finally, maybe um, uh, also an important po point, because when reading the conclusion, um, I didn't see too much of a policy implication yet. So I think for, for this journal, it would be interesting to take kind of um, end on a kind of a bit stronger note on what to do, actually. So what should we do? Should we make it mandatory to provide information? Is this potentially also problematic uh, if we want to have or achieve gender balance? Um, in other circumstances, <clears throat> or should we actually randomize the sequence and leave voters uninformed about um, uninformed about this? So, so what what would you suggest are the policy implications of your of your research? Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much, Eric. You can applaud. <laughs> you. So, do you have any? Yes, you want to start. Um, very interesting, and you know, we are all engaged. So it's, yeah, Nicola Limodio from Bocconi University. I mean, it's very interesting, and I found, you know, the paper design, I mean, I agree with the discussions. Now, you find this right wing uh, discrimination against females. But the macro of that is not true. If you think of all female, of female political figures in Europe, like, you know, Angela Merkel or Theresa May, Margaret Thatcher, or the ones that are about to be in power. You know, in Italy we have Giorgia Meloni, well, in France you know, and so on and so forth. I mean, it doesn't square. Now, I know that you know, macro and micro is very different and there are different things, but do you have any comment on that? Or then, you know, do we know why uh, some, you know, there is this, uh, that could be, like, you know, right wing being actually the one, right wing parties being the one at the forefront of fighting gender discrimination. Andrea Tesei from Queen Mary University. Um, so very interesting indeed. Um, so I have just a couple of minor comments. Uh, so the thing that surprises me is that, as you said, this name ordering affected the elections. And, and it's surprising that parties didn't internalize that. So they left votes on, on the table. And so, I'm wondering whether an alternative is that, say that you do have, so you need to pair these two guys and you have a best second guy there, so a best female pair, uh, but she'd need to go first. And you understand that it's gonna cost votes. And so I wonder whether there is an extent of manipulation in 
precinct or areas that, that, that were more closely contested. So in areas where you win by a landslide, then you still go with the, with the best candidate, irrespective of the name. In close margin uh, constituencies, then you, you sacrifice the potentially best candidate because it doesn't have a, a good last name. Um, Another thing, it would be interesting, maybe it's in the paper, uh, having more background about what, what this pairing does. So is one the deputy of the other? Are they on, on at the same level? Uh, from the poster, it looked like there's one key guy, so Judah, and, and the other one, uh, I mean, it's vote Judah, although there is also the other one. Uh, but then really what I think is the, is the for me at least, is the key comment that is the one made by, by Emmerich. Uh, you really want to show that um, the vote is not sacrificed, but, but you go to someone else, provided that the other pair is, is, is correct, so that the woman goes next. Otherwise, you're sacrificing your first best to get something that you equally dislike. Thank you. Yeah, very nice uh, paper. Um, so something that has not been discussed too much is, um, I mean, that I found uh, a bit surprising is that there, is a, it, there seems to be a high level of mis misunderstanding that is key to, to, to understand the discrimination. And that sounds a bit surprising to me, especially since this was the very first time this gender balance rule uh, applied. So this has been discussed uh, in the medias. And also because, as you said, it's uh, an election in which the level of, of abstention is very high, and thus you would expect that the best informed uh, electors are those that are coming. So I don't have a very good suggestion, perhaps at least to discuss this, because I think in the paper it, the, this aspect has not been discussed too much. Perhaps it's possible to exploit the level of abstention, the variance across uh, across uh, over space, but uh, I have no idea whether I, it can be useful, but at least I think it deserves a bit of a discussion because, I don't know, I was a bit surprised about this. Thank you, Isabel. You want to go? Thanks. Hello, my name is Ginevra uh, from the Ministry of Economic and Finance in Italy. So I have first uh, a quick suggestion for a reference, but maybe you already know this paper by Cervellati and others, because there you can uh, use it as a reference to disentangle, uh, disentangling between uh, the saliency effect and uh, misunderstanding. So this goes back uh, to the previous comment. And then uh, I have a question about the interpretation of, of your uh, results. So as far as I understand, um, it is true that women were already underrepresented, in, especially in the right-wing uh, party, and then you find an effect uh, of a woman being the first uh, in the ballot. So, and you also find an effect of information that uh, reduces this, this bias. So I was wondering, is it possible that people vote for more familiar names and men are in general more familiar to voters because they are well known and they are uh, they have more they are well known on the media and so on and so forth familiar names in the sense that are known to the people they go on tv they are on the media uh, they have been there since a long time and so when the when the woman is the first she is less familiar to people. People know her less, and therefore they go to another ballot. They, they switch somewhere else, not because of a pure gender bias, but because of lack of familiarity of the person. Okay. There is no more question. Okay, so Jean-Benoit, if you want to start on three. Okay, so fantastic. Uh, I'll try to, uh, to answer as many questions as, as, as I can. Thanks a lot for all those um, really interesting comments. Um, so for uh, Enric, uh, yeah, I mean, it's really, I think it's really the heart of the paper and what in a way makes it really exciting. The fact that we really start to understand that voters are in some way really uh, have a kind of limited attention. So it's, 
we know that here it's really hard to disentangle all those different me mechanisms, and as you said, between salience and the really lack of, lack of information. We have tried to explode, for instance, the, the, the impact of the photo per se, but the thing is, as we have only get uh, information for 12% of the total ballot, when you start to cutting your sample, it's really hard to get any uh, insightful results on that. So for sure we will discuss it, and uh, there are lots of reasons here where, yeah, that I totally agree with you. We can add in the paper, for instance, that right-wing voters are most of the time older, so it can, uh, it can also play a role here, and we have to add that, but I don't think that we will have much to, uh, to, uh, to add in terms of real uh, specification and, um, and hard, hard results on, uh, on this side. On the, vote, on the vote transfer, yeah, we know that here it's, it was also extremely hard to identify it, and uh, while the first effect on, uh, on the binom is super straightforward, super striking, for this one it was really hard, also because uh, like when those guys decided to, uh, to vote for another, uh, for another binomes, we do not, like, it's, we've tried to, uh, some specification where you count the number of binomes where you have uh, a male is first position, but we do not get anything. So it's, it's really hard to get something that is really convincing. The only thing that we found, and it's what's written in the paper, is for this, um, this vote transfer towards uh, closer, uh, closer substitutes, so towards other right-wing candidates, but uh, we do not really have much to say uh, uh, about that. Uh, for, uh, for Eric, um, thank you also for all, all the comments that you, that you have. For the specification with fixed effects, yeah, we will, we will, uh, we will uh, run it and see whether it has, uh, it has an impact. Uh, but here also, like, we, we prefer to split our, our sample because we wanted to see, uh, to have a real clean uh, treatment and control group with uh, right-wing candidates in different precincts. So we can directly test this effect. When we try to, uh, to put everything all together, we don't really know what we identify here, so we prefer not to focus on this specification, but for sure we can put it in the, in the robustness checks. For the posters, the thing is, yeah, we tried to, uh, to gather this information, but in fact there was one limitation that was really hard to, uh, to, to overcome, was the fact that uh, there, wasn't, there, there is no uh, administrative data on posters. We've tried to check on Google, but uh, like we have 9,000 binomes of candidates, so it's really hard to get information for all of them. And also that the law didn't have a strict, uh, st 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 strict, strict legal things and uh, instructions regarding the, regarding the posters. So people could change it and uh, use it as, uh, as they wanted to use it. While for ballot, it was extremely clear that women had to be in first position. So I don't think that, yeah, we, we can try to, to, to get this data, but it's really hard to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to get them. For the names that are not gender specific, it's a really good comment. In fact, we, we tried it with uh, all the French uh, names, for instance, René and uh, all those names, but sadly, there are few and uh, we didn't get anything really, uh, really convincing. For the policy implications, uh, yeah, in fact, we, we had this discussion with my co-author. We, uh, we, uh, we haven't put anything here. Maybe the thing that we can say is that either that we need to harmonize the, the information that is available on the ballot, because clearly it plays a role. So uh, for sake of democracy, we need to have something that is homogeneous. But either we remove the information or we put the information, and if we put some information, it has to be really calibrated, and uh, we have to know exactly what we put in, the, in, the, in this ballot. But we can discuss that. On Nicolas' points on uh, local versus uh, uh, aggregate uh, role of uh, level and, and, and this evidence, I think one important question here is also the, the role models. That for instance, at the aggregate level, the example of Merkel and Thatcher tells you that you have evidence that it does work and that you can trust women in that situation. While for really local level, I think it's different. And there is no substitution <coughs> between aggregate and, uh, and, micro, and micro evidence. I mean, it's, as I see it, but, and the, the literature would suggest that it goes in that direction. Uh, and, uh, and Andrea and the margin uh, and the, the, the margin of victory. In fact, we do not find anything. We tried to, uh, to test that, and in a way, it's kind of reassuring, meaning that there wasn't any manipulation here by the by the party. So clearly, it's absolutely exogenous. Like my um, both my parents did politics, and I talked with them, and they both told me like no one expected to have an effect on that. Like even the candidates, they, they discovered the rules 
uh, a couple of weeks before the election. They didn't know that it would, uh, it would have an impact or that the, the, the role on the electoral ballot would be like that. So, um, so I think it's, it's a way that, yeah, it gives us power to say that it's absolutely exogenous. And for the other comments, um, for, yeah, Isabel, I totally agree with you, so we need to, uh, to work on this misunderstanding of the rule of the election, and uh, yeah, it's something that is, in a way, quite surprising that, but that we also, uh, I mean, can in, uh, intuitively feel that uh, there are some people that go voting, but some people that, they might go voting, but they are not really also interested by politics, just they, they're here the day of the election, so they, they decide to go, to go voting. And finally, on, um, on Geneva, so your point was on? Um, uh, the fact that women ah. are uh, less well known to yeah. voters? Yeah, so here, I mean, it, it goes back to the, to the discussion between uh, incumbent and uh, an incumbency status that, yeah, of course, familiar names, uh, we expected to see something here, because if you're incumbent, you're supposed to be, uh, to, to, to be better known by voters. But it turns out that incumbency doesn't play a role. So as we, uh, as we see it, it means that the incumbency status per se is not a signal that is powerful enough to, uh, to, go, to give you confidence. You need to have, on the day of the election, something that reminds you that this, uh, this girl or this man has been, uh, has been in power and is elected. So, yeah, so you reduce your discrimination. Okay. Okay. So congratulations for this uh, very nice paper. And uh, let's go on. Okay. Again. Thanks to all of you. Uh, David, this is, we, we are, a little in advance, but uh, this is fine, I think. So the floor is yours for 20 minutes. 25, 20, 25. Didn't the program say 25? It was a carefully calibrated talk. Plus the extra 10. 25. 25, right? You're right. I did Does everyone else need five minutes back? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad I have at least 25 minutes because I have a lot of slides. Um, so this is joint work with Ian, who's over here. and. Uh, Daniel Feruzzi and Daniel Ladd, who are uh, two current graduate students. Um, machine learning and perceived stereotypes in job ads. I wish I could see it here. Uh, evidence from an experiment. Um, so let me just quickly tell you the motivation and then jump into the paper. Um, uh, we've been interested for a long time in questions of age discrimination. Uh, we all know that the US, and even more so Europe, um, have rapidly aging populations, rising dependency ratios, i.e. the you know, ratio of non-workers to workers. Um, I think all, all of these countries are grappling one way or another with a policy imperative of trying uh, to get older people working longer. And we've done a lot of things on the supply side, various kinds of pensions, social security reforms, tax reforms, et cetera, um, which is fine, and they work to some extent. Um, but, but, um, but if there is age discrimination, and I'll show you why I'm convinced there is, in case you're not, but that's not what this paper is about, um, then you have an important demand side barrier, which may frustrate uh, these kind of efforts. And this paper focuses on hiring discrimination. You might think it's kind of weird to focus on hiring discrimination if you're talking about older workers. Isn't it just about them, you know, staying at the job they're at? Well, in fact, older workers make a lot of transitions to different kinds of jobs on the sort of the path to retirement, including something called unretirement, which is, is what it sounds like. Um, so there's actually, a, so extending work lives into older ages and even older ages than we do now. Um, is probably not simply a function of staying in your job longer, but older, but workers transitioning to different jobs and therefore hiring barriers are potentially quite important. Um, let me just uh, tell you, about, I mean, this paper is not about discrimination per se. It's not about the evidence on discrimination. It's about uh, worker responses to discrimination. But let me just back up for a minute um, and tell you there are uh, a number of field experiments or correspondence studies or resume correspondence studies, whatever you want to call them, of discrimination against older workers. I cite a bunch of them here. And then this is this graph from the bottom is, is from a paper Ian and I and Patrick Button did. Oh, there's a pointer. Um, this is just a descriptive evidence. We'd spend 20 pages on econometrics and you end up, as you often do, with the descriptive evidence. Um, um, and what you're seeing here, I realize these slides are hard to see, but um, this is... Uh, uh, these are all from young, like 30-ish to 50-ish to 65, so um, you can see the downward gradient. It's very pronounced for these two jobs, which are female 
These were female applicants to administrative and sales jobs. These were male applicants to sales, security, and janitor jobs. Not quite as monotonically declining, but in every age, clearly lower callback rates for older people than younger people, uh, and for women, uh, particularly pronounced. Um, so that's sort of one of the jumping off points. This is actually uh, the third, th the paper we'll talk about today is kind of the third paper, and I think what will be a four-part set of papers. So there's a lot of background. This is the first one. Um, OK. Um, what we explore in this paper is the potential worker responses to one potential manifestation of age discrimination or one mechanism for age discrimination in the labor market, in particular, um, the per workers' perceptions regarding job requirements that are posted, uh, well, in, in the real world in job ads, in our experiment, posted in the experiment. Um, um, so why is this important? Well, and, and, and we're not just sort of pulling this out of the air. I'll tell you why we think this is a real issue. But if there are ageist stereotypes in job ads, think about language, and I'll give you plenty of examples later. Um, uh, and if they discourage older workers from applying for jobs, that could have the exact same impact as discriminating against applicants, right? If you just, you know, it does make a difference, right? If older people looking for jobs, if they don't apply because they're discouraged by the ad or they do apply and they're not hired because of their age, it makes no difference. The, the net result is the same. Um, so let me give you an overview of the paper. Uh, we use machine learning methods that we develop in the second paper in the set, coming out in the Journal of Labor Economics. Um, to identify phrases in actual job ads. So we, we, in the first correspondent study I showed you the bar graph for, we applied to around 14,000 different jobs with triplets of job applicants, um, and we, we saved the text of those job ads. So we have 14,000 ads. Think of them as about 100 words per ad, roughly speaking, on average. Um, uh, we, we use these machine learning computational linguistics methods to identify the phrases in the job ads that are, that are what, what they call in this literature, semantically similar, which is exactly what it sounds like. They have similar meaning to the, the words used to describe age stereotypes in the industrial psychology literature. They're the people who, who study stereotypes. We take the phrases from actual ads um, to construct sort of you know, typical, we, we, we use those as examples and the ones that were highly stereotyped um, to construct job ad language that reflects specific age stereotypes we're interested in. I'll show you what we mean by that. Um, and then what the, the core of this paper is an MTurk experiment to see whether respondents perceive these phrases as ages. So in some sense, we do this machine learning thing which says, oh yeah, you know, this phrase is related to the stereotype, but you may say, well, oh, yeah, does it have anything to do with the real world or not? Um, and what we're doing in this paper is testing whether it does by basically running these phrases by people and asking them whether they perceive them. And it's an, a, you know, an, an incentivized sort of survey kind of thing. But um, you know, pretty clean evidence, we think, on whether they perceive certain phrases relative to other phrases that, that do not reflect age stereotypes as actually biased against older workers. So it's sort of a real world test, you might say, of this machine learning language. Um, um, and the finding is that the job ad language that the machine learning techniques classify as semantically related to age stereotypes is quite strongly perceived by biased, as biased, I should say, against older workers. Um, this is sort of a funny set of questions to ask, but I, I mean, I partly respond, you know, we've had two, ref, two rounds of referee reports and all that, but these are actually pretty good questions that have come up. But I want to say these at the, at the outset in case I run out of time, which I almost surely will. Um, what does the evidence mean? Is it surprising or interesting? You might say, well, okay, you take phrases. They sound biased. You ask people if they're biased. They say they're biased. Like, what, what's the surprise here? You know, what didn't you know before you started? I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. And then what are the policy implications? OK, so what does the evidence mean? Well, first of all, um, you know, it, it may be perfectly sensible for firms to put ageist language in job ads, right? Um, in the US, um, you know, what, one of the ways you get nailed for discriminating hiring is to hire disproportionately lower from whatever group we're talking about here, the old, um, out of your applicant pool. So if you can sort of shape the applicant pool to have fewer old people apply, then you don't have to hire disproportionately to hire fewer older workers. Um, uh, so, so that makes, makes a lot of sense. It may be because of just taste discrimination. You just don't want to hire them, right? But you're also aware of how the law and enforcement works. So you just say, I'm just going to discourage them from applying in the first place. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, there could be a more subtle mechanism going on. Job requirements may be real and may be correlated with age. I mean, some, some capacities obviously decline with age. They all do eventually when we die, but you know, some, some well before that. Um, so job ad language may reflect uh, real requirements, um, uh, but if employers act on them by assuming, you know, basically assuming that if, you, if you're older, 
you don't meet those requirements, that's illegal. That's statistical discrimination. That's illegal, too. Um, there's a more nuanced discussion of that in the paper, which I won't get into here, but we recognize that's a little trickier to think about. Um, uh, so I, I already described the correspondence. Where does it fit in? I already described the correspondence study we did. In this paper where we sort of first use these machine learning computational linguistics techniques, the interesting finding, which I think helps make this all interesting and real, is that so what, think what we have from the experiment, we have a measure of discrimination at the employer level because we sent them these triplets by age and we see which employers called back the young and not the old applicant. Turns out those are the same employers, for, especially for men, who wrote ads with stereotype language, with ageist stereotypes. So, so the discriminating employers you know, from an experimental measure actually do seem to write ads with ageist language. Um, uh, and then the next step, which we're, I'm not talking about today, except I'll give you some, a very hint of some results, is we, we actually have a field experiment where we, we're, we're, ac we're actually manipulating ads to see if we can actually shape the applicant pool. But this, is, this paper is a precursor to that um, about worker perceptions. Um, uh, I'm going to skip this slide and come back to those questions. Um, why are they surprising or interesting? Well, the language we use is not very blatant. right? If, if, obviously, if I write older workers need not apply, and I asked people if they perceive that as biased, you wouldn't be very surprised. Um, we actually have a benchmarking or sort of upper bound set of treatments for these sort of blatant stereotype phrases from AARP, which is the American Association of Retired Persons, which is no longer called AARP. It's just called ARP, which I don't understand, but that's what it's called. Um, you know, things like energetic person, digital native, those are, those are pretty blatant. Um, you know, there's this famous case re fairly recently where a company advertised uh, you know, basically no more than seven years of relevant experience. That sounds pretty blatant. Um, uh, our phrases are from real world job ads and they're much more subtle. Um, at least they, you know, they, they're not, they, they look subtle. Um, and it's these real world phrases that, that show up commonly um, that we're interested in asking whether uh, job, se job seekers perceive as biased. Potential policy implications? Well, first of all, if ageist language deters older applicants from, from hiring for jobs, um, uh, there's an important part of discrimination that our, our, our current laws and enforcement mechanisms really miss, right? Which is the discouragement from applying in the first place. Uh, um, and if, you know, what the paper ultimately shows is that these machine learning techniques can pick out stereotype phrases that are not immediately obvious, I don't think, um, then enforcement authorities could actually use these techniques, right, to monitor job ads. Um, and not as, a, not, not as decisive proof of discrimination, obviously, but as a flag. And, and a lot of what they do is look for flags. I mean, the EEOC, you know, looks for hint of that, you could describe their process, looking for hints of discrimination and then going and investigating. And a lot of companies, it turns out they weren't. But this could be a very useful and cheap and easy to use flag um, to kind of uh, find potential discriminators. And the EEOC does this with regard to more blatant language. Like they talk about, don't say criminal, you know, we do a criminal background check if it's not important for the job because that'll screen out minorities. Um, but they don't, they don't pay attention yet to, uh, to more subtle kinds of language. Okay, so, so I'm going to quickly take you through the steps here. Um, we have these, we did spend a lot of time learning the industrial psychology literature, identifying sort of uh, the key stereotypes. I won't walk through all the details, I'll just show what they are. These orange ones you probably can't read. There are, we basically group into three categories, stereotypes related to health, less attractive, hard of hearing, less physically able, personality stereotypes, uh, less adaptable. You'll see some I have in orange. You probably can't read those from where you're sitting. That one says careful, that one says dependable. Those are actually positive stereotypes about older workers, more careful, more dependable. And then some are mixed, these yellow ones, negative personality, warm personality, better communication skills, worse communication skills, um, uh, and then worse with technology. So the white ones are unambiguously negative about older workers, the other ones not as clearly. We're not going to do all 17 of these in this experiment. Um, we choose three. Uh, we choose, I, same at the bottom, communication skills, physical ability, and technological skills. Uh, really for a few reasons. First, they're pretty commonly expressed in one way or another in job ads. Um, you know, now remember, a job ad doesn't usually express things in the negative, right? It sort of expresses things in the positive. Um, but you might imagine, like, how, you know, how do you, how do you, would you, how, how would you express a hard of hearing stereotype? It must be able to hear well. It would seem like a very weird thing to write in a job ad, but must be able to lift, you know, heavy weights, must be, you know, conversant with various computer technology, whatever. Those are very common things in job ads. Communication skills, of course, probably perhaps the most common thing. Um, 
the next step is, is this machine learning computational linguistic stuff. And I could spend, this was great. We, you know, we, we learned this de novo. We don't know anything about it. Um, but here's the, here's the, I'm going to skip what the slide says here. Here's the very simple explanation to, in, in basically two sentences. One is most of the people who write papers in computational linguistics work for, work for Google. Um, and the second is you do computational linguistics many times a day. Some of you are probably even doing it while I'm talking. That's the people on their cell phones, um, but that's okay. Um, and that is you put in a phrase, a few word phrase, and Google returns a bunch of groups of words that you know, some of them will mimic it exactly, most won't, but they're semantically related. And if Google just returned random things unrelated to the words you put in, it would be useless, right? Um, so Google is actually doing this, essentially the same thing we do here, and we use the same methods they use, um, which is essentially to, you take sort of our, you, you, you train a model to say what words in all of the English language are semantically related to each other, which just means they show up near each other in Wikipedia or some other corpus. That's actually what that means. Um, so whales and dolphins are semantically similar because they're going to show up near each other in Wikipedia, and whales and barista are not because it's hard to imagine a sentence or a paragraph about whales and baristas. Um, uh, uh, so you train a model, then you look at the, the, all the phrases in the job ads on the one hand, the stereotypes on the other, and say which ones are semantically related. <coughs> it's measured on a score on a scale of minus one to one, only because it's normalized. Um, and just to give you, uh, uh, here's just an example of an ad before I show you. This is this is sort of a carefully curated ad. It has a lot of language, reliable, energetic, customers friendly, detail oriented, teamwork, excellent customer service, precision, communication organization skills, computer savvy, experience preferred, fun, probably not signaling they want an older applicant. I don't know for sure. Um, but you know, you have these ads and the question is, you know, I can sort of look at those ex post and say, oh, that sounds ageist. So in our work, we've been very careful to specify all the sort of semantic similarity measures before we ever go to the data to see how it's related to outcomes, just to make it sort of a, um, a kind of, um, you know, not a data mining exercise, you might say. Um, just to give you some idea, this is, this, what is this? this? This is a histogram, obviously. Well, I hope it's obvious. Um, we take all the three word phrases in all the ads, right? We compute the semantic similarity with this particular stereotype. And then here's what the plot looks like. Now notice they're shifted to the right of zero, right? That makes sense because these are job ads, right? They're going to they're going to tend to talk about communication skills, right? And you can see we just give examples. You know, way out at one it says excellent communication skills. Well, that's going to be very semantically related because it's actually the same phrase. Um, uh, you know, at about 0.5 interactions, excellent phone. That might be pretty related to community. You know, you can see why phone and communications, right, would be semantically related. Um, and then at the bottom, every Sunday PM, Christmas season near, nothing to do with, you know, with communication skills. Um, one more example, then I'll, I'll skip a few. You know, physically fit able, way at the top, makes sense because the word physical is there. Must open flexible. You know, that may not be a great example of what's really meant by physical ability, but you can see why they're semantically related. Abil you know, physical and flexible make, make, make sense. You know, lower down, take meeting minutes and include introduction letter unrelated. So that's kind of the game. You get these phrases from job ads, and you can say, <coughs> what is the value of this, what they call the cosine similarity score? I'll skip over. I don't know where I'm supposed to be pointing with this thing, but um, I'll skip over a couple. We do three occupations, retail sales, admin assistant, and security guards. We've left out janitor jobs um, just because the evidence was more ambiguous, and there weren't many ads uh, for them anyways. Um, so what we do then is we, for our experiment, we create phrases. Um, to use in, a, you know, essentially, you, that could be used in sentences in job ads um, that try to uh, be, we try to make them related to the stereotypes we're interested in, the three we're testing, um, and then control phrases that are supposed to describe something similar, right, but are not related to the age of stereotypes. Now, I'm going to show you some examples in a minute. And we iteratively, iteratively selected these and fine tuned them to make them very related to the, the one stereotype we were interested in and not related to other stereotypes. So this is going to be, a, I mean, in the, in the language of epidemiology, which we now all know, you want high sensitivity and high specificity. You want to pick up, pick up a stereotype phrase, but also the specific stereotype, just like you want, a, you want a, a test for a disease to pick up the right disease. Here's just some examples. I don't know if you can read those from where you are. So a control phrase for a security guard, you need to carry a flashlight, you must be able to lift 50 pounds. So they're similar about carrying, picking up, 
Um, one is more related to older people. And we show you right here the cosine similarity score. For you need to carry a flashlight, it's only 0.2. For you must be able to lift 50 pounds, uh, it's 0.41. It's more than twice as high. Technological skills control you must write patrol records in a journal notebook. That cosine similarity score is almost zero. The treatment phrase, you must type patrol entries into a journal application on a computer system, right? 0.24. Now, again, that's, I, I would argue that's not a blatantly ageist phrase, right? But, you know, but it's related to technological skills, which is an age-related stereotype. Okay. Uh, we create ad, uh, um, this, we, we, one thing we do is we ask whether our phrases actually, if you, if you put the phrase in an ad, not just the phrase in isolation, because ultimately we care about real job ads, um, do those ads get detected by the machine learning techniques as correlated with the stereotypes? So we create the ads, we embed our phrases in them. Here's an example of an administrative assistant ad we, we use, and we embed um, you know, one of these skills, communication technology requirement, a treatment, you know, a treatment or control, or we can do all three. Um, and then we have this, this graph, which is um, a little hard to understand, but let me just explain what's going on here. So for example, let's look at the upper right corner because it's easier. So we take all our, um, we take sort of our ads with our technology phrases, and the top bar here is for the treatment ads. So it's the ad in which we've embedded the stereotype phrase about technology. Here's the control ads, the, the middle bar there. I, I realize it's probably kind of light for you. Um, I couldn't read half the slides at this, at this conference. Um, um, and what we're doing here is showing the average of all the percentiles. And the bottom line is, for the treatment phrases, it always goes way out to the right. Um, and what that means is uh, these, these, these ads that have the technology phrase embedded in it, as opposed to the technology, uh, the, the related control phrase, are actually, um, the, the machine learning detects those ads and the language in those ads as more related to the stereotype. Um, the, the bottom lines, which you really can't see, are the actually collected ads. They're actually more stereotyped than the control ads, which makes sense because they're actual ads. They have, they have real language in them that employers use. But a bunch of versions of those, which I'll skip. Uh, okay. We have a secondary treatment, as I said, with these more, more sort of uh, uh, these less ambiguous phrases, cultural fit, energetic person, digital native, which we embed in these kind of sentences like you must be a digital native and have a background in social media, which sounds more, you know, age-related than, than sort of the, the more standard phrase. Um, we kind of do this to pin down an upper bound effect, or alternatively, we can't find anything for these. We're not going to find anything for our phrases. So we wanted to know what happened with those. Okay. And then the, the core of this paper, I mean, the first part is important, but the, the core of the paper is this MTurk experiment where we asked whether the treatment phrases are perceived as biased relative to the control phrases. Um, we ask about, we basically do a survey initially asking you about your own beliefs, and then we ask people what other people in that survey would have predicted, um, and we ask about a uh, bias against older workers, um, um, and then we, uh, uh, and, and then, um, uh, sorry, again, again, sorry, against workers over 50, um, uh, and we ask what, what they think everyone would have, would have said about the biases and what workers over 50 would have said. And the idea here is to avoid social desirability biases. We actually find evidence of this, right? The, the own reports are less biased, are less perceived as biased than the what you think other people, how you think other people are going to perceive them. And we incentivize that. So you made more money if you, if you correctly predicted what others would have said. Uh, okay. So I'm going to jump to, um, I'm going to skip these things. That's just the incentivization. I'll skip that. Not that important. Um, this is just a descriptive results. So if you look up here, um, uh, um, Oh, so let, let's look like it. Let's look at the bottom one here. It's easy to see. This is what you how how participants think people over fifty would have perceived it. Um, these are the controls back here for communications, physical, and technology. You can see which ones. Um, uh, then here are the treatments for the phrases we used, right? And you can see for communications we don't get much. The communications phrase is actually not perceived as that biased, which is not inconsistent with the fact that in the industrial psych literature, it wasn't clear which way that stereotype went actually, sort of, it was ambiguous. Um, but the technology and physical are way out here. The AARP ones are even further out here, um, which is not surprising because those are more blatantly ageist phrases. Um, when we run regression models, I'm going to, I'll just show you this one, others over 50, for example. Um, the treatment here is the three separate treatments for the machine learning generated phrases. And I don't know if you can read this, but for the physical ability stereotype, 
and for the technology skills stereotype, these are minus two lower and minus one lower on a Likert scale of one to five. So these are huge effects, right? Um, standardized are in these square brackets, and, and, they're, and they're pretty they're, um, they're pretty much a standard deviation or more. When we do the AARP treatments, they're somewhat even stronger, which um, is, is well, that's the incremental effect of the ARP treatment. Those are even stronger. I have just a couple more graphs, I think. Um, this, is a, an, a, this is sort of an interesting graph. So what we do here is we plot here the stereotype rating based on the machine learning measure, this co cosine similarity score, and here the belief about discrimination. Um, but we've put it, we sort of reverse the axis, so up is higher, because Likert scale is just whatever it's there. Um, and what's interesting here is, um, I think I have an arrow that's going to pop up. Right. So, um, so these are kind of the controls. The controls have low cosine similarity scores. They're not related to the phrases, to, to stereotypes. We saw that. And low perceived discrimination. Um, these are the, uh, the machine learning generated phrases. Um, and these here are the, there's only one in this case, the AARP phrase. And what's interesting is you can see that our phrases are actually more semantically related to the stereotypes because we constructed them that way. Um, but not quite as biased as the AARP phrases, which uh, perhaps is not surprising. Um, this just tells you how the, this, I just, I'll just look, I wish I had blown up to, oops. Wrong way. I wish I had blown up one of these. But this is, for example, for physical ability. This is like that graph I showed you before. That is the cosine similarity score for all the phrases and all the ads. So you can see the distribution. Um, this is essentially where the control phrase fits. This is where the treatment phrase fits, and that's how big the effect is. So you can see that we're at, when I said we're, we're sort of studying phrases that are not, they're not way out there in terms of crazily blatant ages phrases, they're kind of about the 75th percentile of the distribution. Um, but they have huge effects on perceived bias. And you see that for technology as well. And remember, communications, we didn't really find much. And that's why there's no, there's no vertical bar there. It is really raining now. Um, one minute? OK. So I just want to show you for the field experiment, basically, we, we, this is in the, data, in the field now. This is just a sort of early run of some of the data. So what we do is we, we, we go back to the real ads with these phrases. We randomly manipulate them. And we see if actual job applicants right, respond, not just perceived bias and enter. Um, this is the CDF. The light gray is the control. The dark black is the treated. Um, and you can see, for example, oops, that the implied effect on the proportion 40 plus it's actually pretty sizable, right? Um, it's, about, it's about sort of 0 .0, 0 0.07, 0 0.08 um, on, on, on a not very high base. So our preliminary read of the data, uh, and this is something that's not going to be finished for a long time because um, we're still collecting data and then we have to analyze it more, is that not only are these things perceived as bias, but real, uh, this is done on a job board, real job applicants respond. You actually discourage older workers from applying. So just conclusion summary, I'll, I'm just going jump, to jump to the, to the back here, the bottom here. Um, it's important um, because if you respond to these ageist stereotypes, and obviously the same could be applied to racist or sexist or gender normative or whatever you can reasonably put in a job ad, um, it's, it could be the same as hiring discrimination. Um, and then the policy, that's a policy sort of broad implication. The practical implication is you could use these computational linguistics techniques on actual job ads to flag potential discriminators. Um, and you can see that from here, and you can see that from our other paper where, where that, that the language and the bias in the language is actually rated to an, related to an experimental measure of age discrimination. Thanks. OK. Thank you very much, Timo. The floor is yours. Um, yeah, so thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper. Um, I'm not an ex expert in sort of discrimination, um, but I think it's a very interesting paper, also from the computational linguistic side. So I'll be sort of structuring my comments a little bit around this. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, to me, um, uh, like, let's just recap what, what the paper is about. The paper essentially tries to, I mean, relates to this sort of ongoing uh, concern that, you know, because of demographic transitions, the working lives will need to be expanded, and that means that, you know, older workers need to have access to the labor market, right? 
Um, and so there's concerns that specific type of language in job advertisements might actually discourage all the workers from applying. This could be explicitly sort of be designed by those who are advertising jobs to discourage this type of behavior, but it could also be unconscious sort of uh, biases, right? And so I think this is very interesting uh, um, um, to uh, you know, understand essentially whether this is happening. Now, what does this paper do? Well, this is one of the papers that actually, you know, you're sort of supposed to comment on one paper, but actually there's like three papers uh, in addition to, to be read. So um, I sort of skimmed them uh, um, and uh, probably won't know all the details. But in essence, this particular paper is a validation of um, the computational linguistic method that has been used to actually show that sentences that sort of uh, computational linguistic methods have identified as, uh, uh, as being ageist or related to ageist stereotypes uh, actually perceived by human subjects as ageist. So at some level to me, I would not necessarily call this an experiment per se, but I would call this a validation exercise that this is a measurement, uh, a measurement approach that actually can work. Um, and obviously this has implications because we could think of developing uh, uh, this set, set of tools further to uh, uh, you know, think about measure other types of discrimination, you know, gender, gender uh, or LGBTQ or other type of minority, right? Uh, um, so I think this is really interesting from that perspective. So it, it's this uh, validation uh, uh, approach. Now, uh, um, as I said, this method has the potential, you know, to actually be, you know, scaled, so to say. So at some level, there's a proof of concept here. Um, what I would like to uh, flag up here is again a little bit more about sort of the process, because obviously um, there would have been choices, there would have been potentially alternative choices on how to go on about actually flagging up what is ageist language. Um, the authors, I mean, drawing on their earlier work, essentially approached this in a three-step process. First of all, there was an extensive literature review um, that actually identified what is the population of stereotypes that have been discussed in the, in the literature. Now, obviously, this gives you a narrow set of words that are related to ageist stereotypes. But obviously, the way that you could uh, 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 sort of discriminate is, uh, you know, the English language or any language typically has lots and lots of synonyms that are actually conveying the same type of information. So in the second step, what they're doing is essentially, you know, blowing up the vocabulary uh, um, to actually cover and incorporate all those words that are semantically related to um, these terms that are captured by these 17 ages stereotypes. So it's some of it's like a, I mean, we would potentially call this a feature expansion, where you're saying, well, okay, uh, uh, you know, uh, lift is, you know, able, ability to, uh, uh, you know, uh, pick something up that might be heavy. Uh, uh, um, so the term heavy would be sort of a, another uh, type of uh, word that is related to that sort of concept that somebody needs to be physically able to lift something, right? Um, and then obviously in the last step, um, and this is uh, uh, what, what uh, is, is being done here, is we score the individual job ads based on this method using the cosine similarity, which is a measure of linear dependence uh, um, that essentially tells us how dependent is a, a, a sort of a specific job ad, which might be a natural piece of text that is found somewhere uh, uh, on a job listing website or so. Um, how is that sort of correlated with the set of features that have been expanded? Now, this is a type of document scaling, and in sort of in political science, this has been used, for example, to uh, um, to scale party, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of party manifestos, uh, um, um, or essentially classify in, in terms of a continuous uh, fashion. An alternative approach, and I mean, we spoke about this yesterday, so so I'm sort of uh, with your co-author, co David. Um, um, so an alternative approach could have been to just actually do the more conventional machine learning exercise, which is to get human coders to actually label um, and classify a set of job ads, rather than approaching it through um, the uh, kind of three-step process where you, where you uh, uh, go through this literature search and then scale up the literature search, right, to expand the feature set. Um, at some level, this has some desirable properties doing it sort of more conventionally, because obviously the word to VEC, you know, the neural network and all of this stuff behind is, is very much a black box. Um, and uh, to some extent, uh, it would be interesting to see whether a more conventional classifier that has been trained uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a sort of human label training data set 
could actually uh, you know, produce very similar results or, 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 or not, right? Um, so in that sense, like in terms of benchmark, it's sort of to make the black box less black boxy, I think that could be, uh, could have been a, an alternative approach, but I'm pretty sure there was good reasons why you choose uh, this approach as opposed to kind of, uh, you know, a more kind of uh, standard, uh, a supervised uh, uh, machine learning approach rather than this unsupervised uh, approach. Well, unsupervised insofar that the supervision part comes through the first step, which is the literature search. Um, so then there was this step about refining of the stereotypes. Now this is done specifically for the purpose of the experiment, uh, which as I said, I wouldn't necessarily call it an experiment, it's a validation exercise. And obviously here you're designing that validation exercise in a way that maximizes your chances to be able to validate that this uh, computational approach is picking up something through this three-step refinement that you discussed. First of all, the uh, exclusion of stereotypes that are not, not often included. And again, these are reasonable. Uh, this, is, this particular is reasonable. The second bit about focusing on stereotypes for which there is evidence of a correlation of discrimination, uh, which obviously means that obviously people who would be reading this sort of words you know, they might have prior beliefs about that being actually, uh, uh, there being sort of evidence of uh, stereotypes, uh, sorry, there being discrimination. So that's kind of designing the experiment or the setup in a way that will bias you towards finding results, which raises some concerns about whether in natural texts, you know, you know, this, people would perceive it as, as such, right? So I think this is an important qualifier here uh, 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 to just flag up. And obviously there's this third component that uh, older workers should be aware that employers hold this stereotype, which I think is important to some extent because some of your sample is skewed towards older respondents. And so you actually explicitly, like uh, we'll, we can look at the summary stats, but I think 50% are 50 plus, which means you're kind of mechanically working off a subpopulation that might be particularly aware of this. And again, this can, might, might lead to an upward bias uh, of, of any estimate if we think about comparing this with a true representative population sample. Uh, um, um, so, uh, so these are sort of some concerns that I have around the refinement of stereotypes. Um, I guess, I mean, uh, the focus on these uh, three ones, I mean, as I said, there's, uh, there's this, uh, uh, so this refinement sort of leads you to kind of focusing on three stereotypes, right? The communication, the technological skills, and the physical ability. Um, I would like to press, okay. So the treatment control phrases, I just wanted to kind of flag up, uh, 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 so I'll blow this up shortly. But uh, again, this, this CSS score, this is the, essentially the continuous score that, that, that sort of measures the degree of uh, a sort of linear dependence uh, with regard to that uh, ageist vocabulary that has been identified. So the, 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 the closer that number is to one, the more ageist is, is, is a specific sentence. So let's look at uh, uh, one uh, example, sorry. Ah, here we go. So in the experiment, we would then sort of get these uh, sort of job ads, right, which have essentially make salient. In this particular case for the retail sales, there's the physical requirement that would be sort of drawn from this set of phrases, the communication skill requirement that would be drawn from the set of phrases, and the technology requirement that would be drawn from the phrases. Um, and uh, uh, so I'm just summarizing uh, uh, what you've done here. Um, that there's a baseline survey of the own beliefs, and then you have the incentivize to kind of Take, take care of the uh, social desirabilities of these, these, these biases. Um, now, what I mentioned as one concern that is interacting, again, with the uh, point about how you filtered the stereotypes, uh, um, is that your MTurk sample is older than the population, right? So it's not a representative sample, which means that if we wanted to interpret these as sort of a population characteristic, right? Uh, it could be that there's an interaction between this third criterion for filtering and the fact that your sample is predominantly older that might induce you to find stronger effects vis-a-vis -vis what the true effects might be in a representative sample. So I think this is something that you should at least sort of uh, uh, comment, uh, uh, comment on. Um, in terms of the uh, specification of the exercise, 
Um, again, and, and uh, bearing in mind uh, the, the, the point about older people, I think it would be really interesting to see whether you can actually estimate a heterogeneous effects version where you interact the treatment with age, the age of the respondent. Again, if you see homogeneity of the treatment effect there, uh, you, you know, this would be strong indication that actually this issue about having a, a sample that's sort of skewed towards older people might not be an issue. Uh, so that's something I think that I would uh, uh, consider doing. Uh, here we go. Now, in terms of the presentation of the regression results, I would be, so to me, if I read this table, I would think it, it appears that the treatment effects are driven primarily relative to the overall average by the physical ability. So, uh, because obviously this coefficient here, this is fully interacted, right? So this here is just an average of, uh, it should be an average of these three coefficients, right? Um, so it suggests that actually the physical ability bit is what drives, or like has, has significant, seems to have a larger effect, but from this table I can't, uh, uh, sort of, uh, so I'm, I'm, I, I can't do the sort of statistical test on whether the difference is significant relative to the uh, overall average. So I would, my, I would have a personal preference to uh, have the overall average and then have have heterogeneity for two of the uh, categories to see whether this difference is this 1.6 is bigger than one, uh, the 0 0.8 in a statistically significant fashion. There's something potentially about inference because I think everybody's got asked every question, so you could also cluster standard errors potentially at the question level, not necessarily at the individual level, uh, um, as an alternative form of inference. Um, now, on the physical ability driving the results, and again, maybe you know I'm misreading this here, um, I did have a bit of a concern around uh, the fact that the machine learning treatment, and again, this shows up very ageist, and actually more ageist relative to the AARP, which is kind of what you described as sort of the most extreme kind of language, right? Actually is picking up potentially things about the job itself, not necessarily about uh, uh, what I would think ageist discrimination might be. You know, in certain jobs, you might simply have to carry stuff. Um, and even if you're old, you might be able to uh, carry certain stuff. So I'm, I'm a bit concerned here about the interpretation, uh, uh, especially if, you know, again, the control, you need to carry a flashlight, you need to lift 50 pounds, uh, um, uh, you need to be an energetic person. I mean, you know, energetic sounds less ageist here than, it would be scored as less ageist than the 50 pounds here. Actually, what's interesting, why is it 40 and 50 uh, for the security guard? But I, maybe that's just a typo. Um, exactly, so, pardon? Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. Um, so, um, in terms of the, uh, the other bit, and again, this is just blowing up on the phrases to give an example, um, I, I wanted to flag up some more concerns or queries about uh, uh, some of the, 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 the language here, for example, uh, um, obviously, there are certain terms, right, that are very specific here, like there's references to certain pieces of software that you need to be able to use. To me, again, it's not necessarily ageist, it's just a reflection of that a job, a certain job might require you to be able to work with a certain piece of software. Uh, and this is very specific software, it's accounting software. Um, that's being asked uh, here in the case of admin, uh, I think it's accounting software. It's being asked here in the, in the context of admin assistance. Uh, um, so I'm not sure, again, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, the, uh, uh, vis -vis the uh, whether it's picking up something about the job itself rather than uh, a, a, um, a task requirement associated with a job. I have a few smaller comments uh, uh, in terms of presentation. I think the style right now is focused exclusively on a US audience, so I think it would be great to kind of expand this a little bit, make it slightly more inclusive, because this is an issue across most of the Western, actually, not, not just the Western world, right? Um, it would be really interesting whether you can comment on the suitability of this kind of scaling method for non-English language. I've, I've done some papers working with non-English kind of computational linguistic sort of methods, so it's very, very interesting if you could comment on this. There's also a related recent literature, I mean, some of them are not necessarily circ circulating as working papers, that leverage this sort of burning glass uh, or indeed kind of job ads data. Um, and so uh, uh, um, 
I think in some instances here, you might even see people selecting into kind of following up on, an, on a job ad here. So we see whether people are actually applying or interacting with the ad in a meaningful way, which obviously would get us a bit closer to understanding the selection margin that, that, that this research is motivated by, right? Do people select out after up on seeing ages language from applying? Um, there's a bit of like, here and there about notation. I think there could be, this could be a bit cleaned up uh, to make it easier to read, but I understand that the paper itself is part of a research agenda. Uh, and I, as I said, I, I was reading one paper uh, uh, first uh, and, and, and looked at three uh, sort of more uh, indirectly. Um, Yeah, exactly. This was the point. We still w did, would not know whether people would apply for the job. So thinking about maybe working with this burning glass data could be could be quite nice. And I think they're quite uh, 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 open about sharing and making this available for uh, uh, researchers. I think I'll just leave it here. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper. And uh, yeah, great work. Thank you very much. So, Andrea, for the last discussion, the floor is yours. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to read this paper. Uh, so this is, as Timo was saying, part of a broader research agenda. Um, I very much liked uh, the paper, and I think it talks to an important issue, which I was personally kind of unaware of to some extent. So that's pretty distant from what I usually do, so some of my comments might, be, might sound very naive, but on the other hand, might look like from the point of view of, of an outsider. So the key research question in, in this paper is effectively whether workers do perceive that potentially discriminatory, discriminatory content in job ads is they do perceive this discrimination. So along the lines of ageist stereotypes. And so just to summarize what David and, and Timo, they both definitely summarize better than I could do. On the machine learning side, what the authors first do is to identify, based on the corpus of Wikipedia, uh, phrases that in job ads are linguistically related to ageist stereotypes as identified from the psychology literature, and the authors focus on three out of 15 or 17. And this is kind of key, and it's part of I guess my main comment. So they focus on communication skills, physical ability, and technological skills. So they, ide they identify what is an ageist stereotype in job ads in these dimensions, and then they identify these phrases and they create treatment and controls where the only difference is based on this single different phrase. For the rest, the, 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 the two ads are identical. And as a proof of concept that the machine learning is working, they go back and they show that machine learning is able to detect the ages, the stereotype, and importantly, they can tweak one stereotype at a time. So they can uh, just alter the communication skill in one ad, the technological skill in another, and the machine learning algorithm is able to pick up that that ad, the treatment ad, is discriminatory towards uh, older individuals. The second part of the paper, which I think is probably the, the most novel compared to the rest of the research agenda, is then go and experiment on a sample of M. Turkers whether they can perceive these stereotypes, these ageist stereotypes. So M. Turkers are asked whether the treatment add is discriminatory towards old individuals or the control uh, ad is. And there is a differential substantial effect and M. Turkers are able to perceive discrimination along ages lines. So altogether, I think this, I'm, as I said, I'm not familiar very much with the literature, but it sounds to me like it's, this paper is making a, a novel point in this growing literature that uses information on job ads to study the labor demand side of the market. And here, the distinctive feature is that it focuses on the perceptions of the workers. 
So the applicant perception and the language that may deter some applicants from applying in the first place. And this is very important because as David was saying, we are in an aging society and people keep working until older. And so if one way or another an ad discriminate on older individuals and they refrain from applying in the first place, then this is kind of a harder to detect form of discrimination. So from the point of view of an employer that wants to discriminate, then it might make sense to use these subtle ways to prevent people from applying in the first place rather than being led to court afterwards because they didn't interview uh, older individuals, uh, although there were as many applicants uh, that were old as many that there were young. Now, my first comment goes back to this, to this point about what, what are the, 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 the three categories that, that are selected. So the authors are, sorry, I'm going, the authors are careful now in, 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 in emphasizing that the focus here is really on the applicant's perception, that they cannot disentangle whether this reflects taste discrimination on the employer side or statistical discrimination. But my feeling as an outsider is that what if it, it reflects neither? neither taste nor statistical discrimination. So what if it's simply information that it's relevant for the job ad? I mean, you need to, to tell that a social media manager is IT proficient. He needs to know how to use the software. A security guard needs to be fit if there are many shoplifters around. I'm not discriminating on the old guys. I need you to know, I mean, if I'm a clerk, I need to know that I need to carry 50 kilos. Maybe, uh, so here all the onus, I think, from, the, from my reading, is on, is on the end of the, of the firm, not to be discriminatory. But I think there is a trade-off between equity and efficiency for the employer. So, of course, the signal-to-noise ratio decreases if the job ads doesn't provide uh, relevant information. So here the trade-off is really between discriminating some older guy who feels prevented from applying and having a bunch of applicants uh, and then I need to screen them one by one. And so that might not turn out to be well for improving, I guess. So my suggestion would have been to focus on a more intangible but equally stereotypically ageist dimensions. So on, on personality, there are plenty from the industrial psychology literature. They are not related to skills, knowing the software or this or that. So one that I think it's relevant and in your sample of real ads is actually much more prominent that both in the treatment and in the control that you create is the ability to learn fast. So apparently older individuals are thought not to be able to learn fast. That, I understand it's a little bit semantic, so maybe you still need to tell applicants that they need to learn fast, but at least it's more intangible. And so there are others. Creativity apparently is not associated to older individuals. Having a good memory, ambition, so I would have created treatments along those lines. And then, because at least you could claim that this is really trying to discourage older applicants and without relying so much on the, on the, on the, on the characteristics of the job that might simply correlate with age. Now, another bunch of, so that's my main comment. That's, that's the thing I was a little bit more concerned about in my, in my reading. Now, so I know nothing of machine learning. I'm not an experimentalist, so here I'm really throwing stuff. But to me, it sounds like, so the experiment is prompting the M. Turkers, the salience of the ageist issue. Is this ageist? Uh, is it discriminatory along ageist lines? I, I wonder whether it could be a little bit more disguised 
So what about asking general questions about the job ads in general? So is the ads well written? Some, some ads had typos, by the way. So it would be a legitimate question. And then you go, is it informative about the specified role? And then is it discriminatory? Against whom? So that to me would be kind of more informative of whether really there's discrimination perceived by, by the older guys rather than being prompted to say yes, no. Another thing that I really don't know how I, you could do it in an experiment, perhaps giving a, 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 I don't know, a limited set of applications you can apply to, but so is this perceived discrimination consequential? Does it deter some applications? So do people, once they perceive application, what do they do? If, if, applica if applying is, is costless, I mean, you can discriminate, I, I just apply, I don't care. But is it consequential? And then I would be interested in, in knowing, and I think it speaks back to kind of balancing the honors between applicants and, and the firms, is the effect symmetric? So as you said, there are some assumptions, there are some, some stereotypes that are favorable to older individuals. So would worker provide a fair assessment when they're favored? So now I do a treatment where it's uh, uh, reliable. That's positive for an old guy. Would an interker be able to recognize that this is a positive stereotype in his favor? Because if it's just one-sided and I'm only able to detect that I've been discriminated only when I'm negatively discriminated, then again, I think it kicks in this trade-off faced by the firm. And then finally, and maybe it's just me not accepting being going to the, to the older, uh, what about the younger workers? So that they are also, so millennials are lazy, I, I'm not a millennial, but, but, but they're lazy, they feel entitled, uh, they're less reliable, poor at timekeeping, coming from a, a country where, I mean, this ages thing doesn't seem really to be the thing in Italy. So they're very much entrenched. The problem is entry and discrimination for the youngsters. So what about the young guys? Do, do, do they perceive discrimination? So I don't know, broadening up a little bit, that's a cheap comment because this is a big issue on ageism and it's important. So, but the symmetry on positive negative stereotypes and thinking also along other uh, class dimension, uh, age dimensions, I think would be interesting. But all in all, very interesting, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to read it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Very complete discussion. So do, do you have any comments? Yes, Moritz. Um, yeah, I, I, I just want to follow up on more or less what, what Andrea just uh, brought up. So I, I would be curious about, so if, if I think about the, the labor market as a search market, then getting information about the job is something valuable. So in, now if I see, oh, they are looking for a worker with certain characteristics, although this might be discriminatory, if it were not discriminatory, I go there and then I, I know, I don't like the job, they tr don't treat me well and so on to make me maybe quit again. So the question is, if I ask these workers, okay, you say it's discriminatory, but if we took this information away from the um, from the ad, uh, would you would you prefer this? So because you could just say this is the occupation, full stop. That's the ad. And uh, would workers prefer a world like this, where you can be sure that there's no discrimination because you just give the the, the minimum information? So I think it's it's exactly this trade-off between like equity and efficiency. Um, so we could have a, like a a world where we can avoid discrimination, but then the matching would be probably much, much worse. So the question is, uh, how, how should I trade off these things? And do I maybe want to have some discrimination, um, like at least from the individual perspective, where I can say, I, I find a job that like somehow fits much better to me than other jobs that are around. Emeric? So it's going a bit in the same direction, and uh, maybe I'm a bit old school, but I feel a bit bad that using the same language, stereotype discrimination, for 
gender and race on the one side and age on the other. Uh, as sort of a, a long history of the, the use of these words for these two groups. And here we're talking about, in particular if I take stereotypes, the fact that the probability of hurting your back when you lift something goes up when you age, I can, I can testify. Uh, so it's, it's a fact, it's not a stereotype. So that's, uh, the use of the language with these two uh, bothers me a bit, but maybe I need to evolve, it's just me. Uh. Barbara, you are around, I think you have a question. So uh, we don't hear you, Baba. Can you hear me? Can you speak loudly? Yes. Yes, good. Okay, put the volume. Can you hear me better? Okay. So uh, th this is an important research question because if employer discrimination can effectively discourage minority applicants, this could be self-serving in two ways. First of all, by not hiring the minorities and by making discrimination almost undetectable because there wouldn't be minority candidates among the rejection. So the only way to make it detectable is really to think about how to analyze the text of the job advert. So there is a strong motivation behind this. Uh, other than this, I mean, this is a point that came up uh, in, the, in, in the discussions and in the comments. There is a very fine line between what is discriminatory language and what is a legitimate job description that states the task to be carried out in a job. So, I mean, on the on the normative side of things, if somebody needs to hire a social media manager, is there a way of advertising that that is not discriminatory? So, especially when one thinks about the technology, what is the right? What would it be the right way to advertise for this position without being discriminatory? And then. In particular, there is an issue of labeling here, perhaps. So if we think about technological skills, digital saviness, et cetera, I might label it as something that has to do with cohort effects as opposed to age effects, in the sense that those who are young today and are digital savvy, they will be probably still be digital savvy when they're older. So they wouldn't perceive an advert like one that requires, I don't know, uh, being uh, digital savvy as, as discriminatory. So some of, this, some of this is really a cohort effect rather than an age effect. So it might actually evolve and go away over time. Although, of course, one may argue that as technology also evolves, there would be other issues on which all generations that are young now would not be saved in the future. So there is a little bit of a sort of what is the normative side of thing and also the labeling of some of those uh, age discriminatory uh, languages. Okay, just a, 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 last, a last question, uh, if there is no other question. Okay, so, so you have many remarks about uh, how to really identify the job requirements and the discrimination, so which is particularly controversial for uh, senior older people. Uh, so for some minority, it would be perhaps less controversial for specific minority. Did you, did you try to look at whether you could get results looking at, I don't know, people from, from some minority in the, in the US for which you don't observe uh, productive differences. And so, yeah. Okay, I think we, c we can go to, if you want to answer. Perfect, well, thank you so much for everyone for all the comments. Um, I'll start with Timo's. I think it is fair to sort of describe this a bit more as a validation exercise, because I think it's really important when you have this black box of cosine similarity score, which is starting to crop up in various forms across the economics literature, that we're really able to say something meaningful about you know, what we're measuring there. So to, to form that link between a machine learning measure of something that's supposedly ageist and the perceptions of real people, I think that's, you know, I'm, I'm glad that that came across as our key contribution for that. Um, for why we didn't do supervised learning, um, we really tried hard, as David was saying, to avoid ex post rationalization. Um, we, we tried, going to your comment on benchmarking as well, a couple of different things at the beginning before we found our way. Um, like we, we tried lasso for a while, and lasso tends to get obsessed with like a couple of small phrases. So the one that sticks out in my memory is if we looked at older women over the age of 65 in administrative assistance, and the machine learning kept getting stuck as the only thing that ever predicts discrimination is please send in your resume. So that was the most predictive phrase you could find in like 7,000 ads for discrimination against older women. And so the, the, the ways of doing it um, 
when you do it, you, you sort of start seeing these phrases that matter, and then the ex post rationalization is quite prominent. So we really took a step back when we um, decided to do the semantic similarity to tie our hands and do it in an unsupervised way to avoid um, this rationalization. Um, and then there was conversation about why do we pick these, and I think uh, why these three stereotypes. Um, and it, this is very much proof of concept. Um, I think there's so much you can do with it that we really wanted to make sure that we were picking stereotypes that had clear evidence that they mattered in the literature um, and which were quite common. For some other ones that would be really interesting to look at, such as creativity, um, it actually doesn't show up that often in some of the job ads. So we, we, we tried to pick things where we would have, they're quite common for people to see them, um, as well as evidence from the previous literature that they matter for discrimination. Uh, in terms of homogeneous effects of our things across the different age groups, we looked at sort of education, race, and age, and interacted our treatment with that, and we found absolutely no difference. Um, people's perceptions of ageism were independent of their individual characteristics. Um, so it was really quite surprising to see that. We, we were expecting that older workers would view these as more ageist than younger workers, um, but everyone reacted fairly similar to their perception. Uh, and then the question about the weights that we picked for the physical ability ads, what we did was we looked at all, I think 5,000 um, job ads, uh, or sorry, 14,000 job ads, all of them that mentioned able lift pounds, um, and we selected the 75th percentile of the distribution of weights in that. So that's why it varies across occupations. So it's quite high, it's higher than average, but it's not the extreme ones that you were seeing. I think there were some admin jobs that were asking secretaries to lift like 80 pounds. Um, so we, we, we specifically picked the same point across all of the different distributions. Um, and then finally, in terms of expanding it to other settings, I definitely think that is a really promising area to go, and I hope other researchers start taking it there. Um, I, but we're going to beat you to it. Yeah. Well, at least in the English. We'll, we'll do the English, but if other people want to do other languages. Um, I think because we did the unsupervised way of doing it, uh, it is extremely flexible to these other settings, to these other languages. Um, and the process is quite well, easily to adapt to race, gender, sexual orientation, or any of these things. And that was something that we kept in mind when developing it. Um, no, you're done. Oh, no, it, okay, I was, just gonna, I was gonna just chime in on the job requirements thing. So, mm -hmm. I don't know if the discussants were the referees or not, but there, there's been a lot of back and forth about this, um, and the paper has a, a pretty complicated discussion, and it, it's very subtle. So, you know, we, Economists may think we should allow some statistical discrimination, right, for, for the efficiency equity reason you say. The, mat, the fact of the matter is the law doesn't, right? The U, U.S. law at least, and is, it, EU law is never quite as clear, but as far as I can tell also, but the U.S. law literally says, you know, you can't, you can't make decisions based on assumptions about a, about a group, and it, that's exactly what, you know, you might think you want, to, you want to rule out. So you may have a job, if all we had was this paper, and we said, okay, there's a job requirement, like must the 40 pounds, and older people perceive that as biased, you might say, well, we don't, we don't know what to make of that, right? But we know from the other paper we did that that actually predicts discrimination. So what that means is, presumably, employers are statistically discriminating. So it may be a real requirement, but they're actually not hiring, or not calling back, because that's what we measured in the experiment. They're actually calling back at a lower rate the older workers if they do apply. And that's despite, perhaps, you know, some selection out. So, um, so uh, you know, once you combine, and we, and we say that, hey, once you combine it with that evidence, um, it is discrimination, you know, as defined by economists, although maybe you think it should be allowed, or, and certainly as defined by the law. There is this vague, it's not vague, there's this, there's this complicated discussion in a U.S. discrimination law about what they call reasonable factors other than age. So when is it, when is it actually legitimate to make a, an assumption based on age, and sometimes it is. So there's this famous case, Greyhound bus case, where um, they would test drivers at 65, right? And they were sued under the ADEA, um, and th the company actually prevailed, because th the basic argument was, we know driving abilities decline with age eventually. It would be great if we could test people after we knew abilities were declining, but by that point, there might be 50 dead people, right? Because it's after the bus accident. So. You know, this was a case where the court said, 
I, I have the language here. It, say, it says, a reasonable factor of age is defined as, quote, a non-age factor that is objectively reasonable when viewed from the position, this is hard to parse, of a prudent employer mindful of its responsibilities under the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. So, so it's sort of, you recognize you can't discriminate on age, you've tried to come up with some other mechanism, like, okay, lift 40 pounds, come to the interview, can you lift 40 pounds without, you know, hurting your back, like you would do. Um, try yoga, it'll solve the problem. Um, uh, you know, so you can do it, but the, 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 the sort of, the rules are very strict. Um, so, uh, but we don't, we don't claim that we're sorting out statistical from taste discrimination um, by any means. And again, the other thing to keep in mind is, we're not saying that like a high cosine similarity score means you're discriminating, right? It's only a potential flag, something the EOC could look at. So if a company is actually putting this in its ads, right? But then the EOC gets the data and finds that even when older people apply, right, they're not hiring them, right? Well then presumably there's been selection, as our data would suggest, on which older people apply, but they're still assuming the older applicants can't do it, and that would be illegal under the law, even if it might be efficient. Yep. So then another, uh, Andrea's other comment was about why not younger people. Um, I think this is also relates to Barbara's comment about how age stereotypes are changing over time, and these cohort effects of how we think about things um, will adapt in the future. I think we, when reading the industrial psychology literature, we did notice that they do shift. Um, the literature goes back to the 1960s and 70s, um, and the stereotypes that people were talking about then are, are slightly different from what they're talking about in the 90s and the 2000s. Um, and so when we did it, what we said it, we only included papers in the literature review that referred to boomers. Um, or the greatest generation. So people who were old either in the 90s or 2000s, um, but still in their working ages, um, that was the group that we, we were excluding people from the silent generation um, who were born just after World War I. Uh, and so I think you're gonna have to update things because when you get to the millennials, there are these discussions about the stereotypes of millennials um, and how are these changing over time. Um, I think What's interesting is that in the industrial psychology literature, this idea of technology is actually still relevant in the papers that are being published in the, 20, in the teens because you know, the people that they're talking about have had computers for 20 years. Um, and so, as Barbara was saying, you know, just because technology is always changing, we're always gonna assume that older people are typically worse. And that's, that's what we found in the industrial psychology literature. Um, but I think you will need to be updating these over time. Um, I think it'll be really interesting to flip it and look at younger. Um, and typically though, in many, many countries, discrimination against younger people is allowed. Um, it's, they're not typically a protected characteristic. Most age discrimination laws set a specific age profile. Not, which, not in the EU. Not in the EU, not, not in the EU, but in the US it does. Um, and then millennials are now at least covered, um, for the, very, the oldest of the oldest millennials are now covered by age discrimination laws, so we will, need to start updating the literature in the next couple of years to include stereotypes of older millennials um, who, who are now reached uh, coverage age. Um, yeah, a lot of the discussions about uh, RFOAs, I'll, I'll just sort of echo David's point that I think the way we view the reasonable factors other than age is that this is a flagging exercise. As you can see from the figures, when you have these age of statements, they jump out in the machine learning um, measures. Um, and that's sort of a clue for in enforcement um, to go look at it. Um, like, th because RFOAs are so subtle, though, it does require judgment. You have, you can't just assume that because you have high cosine similarity score that, you know, you must be discriminating. It, it does mean th that you have to actually look at it and judge, is this reasonable? Is this actually a valid job requirement? Um, but when you're reading the job ads that people are posting, especially the ones that we were observing that you actually discriminate, you do see some of the job requirements that just aren't reasonable. Um, and so people will throw them in and they have no business being on there. Um, going back to the one about the um, typos and stuff, yeah, real job ads are awful. I mean, shockingly bad. So we, we kept the typos uh, that were real from the original job ads. So any typos that are in there were actually there when we saved the job ad after applying to it. Um, yeah, the language is bad, it, it's very vague. They're, they're not well written, because you know most people writing them are not necessarily highly educated. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so I think the RFOAs, though, are, are something that is very subtle that uh, really needs to be sort of 
discussed and, and massaged a lot more, especially with enforcement. But yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Any other remark, question? No, okay. So I think we are at the end, almost. So and, uh, <laughs> let, me, let me just uh, thank uh, the CPR team for your splendid work for the organization. Uh, Mariolina, Mandy, Alexander, Tessa, and uh, for the choice of the restaurant yesterday night, very good. <laughs> yeah. And uh, also Barbara for uh, putting together this piece of paper and the managing editors for the very nice selection of papers. And uh, also, uh, I wish you now a nice uh, walk in Paris with your umbrella. So let's uh, see us next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>